tip for making any kind of precise cuts or ripping of the siding. Super. But down on the ground, Bob, we have another tool that's even better than this one. Let's take a look. Okay. That's a pretty nifty looking setup. Yeah, it's a frame and trim saw. It comes on wheels, and what we do is we just roll it to where we want it and put these legs out as a bar as an extension to hold up your wood. Can you just do miter cuts any way you want? You can do anything you want. It's, it's light and it's very accurate and it takes about half the amount of work to set up as a radial arm saw does. So it's a dream for siding job. Right? You can see we get real accurate, nice square cuts out of it and it just speeds things up tremendously. Beautiful. Let's take a look inside. Okay. Okay, coming through the front door in the vestibule, we were in the dining room, which I see they haven't quite gotten around to plastering yet. But this is nice to have it all solid looking all down wooded. into the living room. That's right. How far along are they with the plaster work? Yeah, well, over in the kitchen here, the kitchen is just about, is done. It's just doing the back entrance to the kitchen is being completed right now. Nice. Just about finished out there. Hi, guys. Oh, it looks good. Well, Norm, you're ready to start installing kitchen cabinets. How are just we doing about. on that? Uh, they've been ordered, and we should see them in a couple of weeks. Great. And those can go right in. This looks good over here. Yeah, what do you think of the used brick wall now that it's completed? I think it's terrific. It gives us kind of a touch of old around here with so many new walls everywhere else. It's nice to have. That's right. It gives us some more thermal mass here also. How are they doing with the master, master bedroom? Master bedroom is coming along fine. Uh, I have a couple questions that we should talk about in Okay. There. Bob, up here in the master bedroom, we're also completely plastered. Looks great. What about this fireplace wall? Well, here we have the sample of the silver travertine. Yeah. Good-looking material, isn't it? It's beautiful. Okay. And so what's be the, the problem? Face. Well, the problem is that, as you can see, this fireplace unit isn't perfectly centered on this wall right here, and it also comes into a wide inside angle. It mm -hmm. makes it a little difficult to make that corner. Mm -hmm. We could probably bring the travertine all the way to the corner here, Yeah. but probably the corner should be rounded off and this wall would be plaster rather than running it all the way over to there. I agree, that's exactly what I'd do. You know, if you think it's difficult dealing with funny angles like this, what do you suppose it would be like in a house that's all hexagons and triangles, very few straight lines? That would be a little difficult. We took a look at one, a geodesic dome out in Southern California, and we were given the grand tour by Larry Clarence. Let's take a look. Okay, well, Larry, just where are we? We're about one hour from uh, downtown Los Angeles, Bob, in the uh, foothills of uh, San Bernardino, California. And, uh, boy, that's pretty impressive. Yeah, that's, thank you, Bob, it looks pretty good. Now, tell me again, who's building this? Bob, this is being built by a customer of ours named Gary Lumco. And he's a contractor or a builder? No, not at all. In fact, uh, Gary's a staff sergeant for the Air Force here in town. Is that right? Yeah. No previous experience building houses? No, he is, uh, this is his first house and uh, his first actual try at uh, doing something. Pretty brave man. Hey, there's something terrific about the site here with these hills. Yeah, you know, the uh, dome shape itself seems to lend itself to a site such as this. In fact, it almost complements it, I think. Yeah, well, the, the, the circles, the, the curved line, it blends in with the hills. Yeah, I've noticed that. Now, when you, when you buy one of these kits, uh -huh. exactly what do you get? Well, Bob, uh, with the kit delivered to your site, you get the uh, framing, the exterior grade plywood, and all the hardware that you need to put the thing together, including the plans, the assembly manual, and construction techniques. And it's all two by fours. Oh, yeah, right. Boy, this is super. Hey, Bob, take a look over here. I want to show you this. You see what we have in a geodesic dome? Our series of triangles. See, this is a triangle going up to a center point. Right. Here's a strut. Here's another triangle going up to a uh, center point. And another one. And three so, more on the top. That's right. So we've got six triangles coming together at a center holding point called the hub. So and that's got... the key, Bob. That's the key to our success right there. Step over here and let me show you about it. With every kit, comes the requisite number of hubs that are needed to uh, do the dome shell. This, okay. 
What's so special about these hubs? Well, it's a high-grade welded steel uh, member. And as you can see, each one is color-coded. And the reason for that is so that it can be easily matched with the strut. They slide together in the pre-drilled, pre-notched jig. Mm -hmm. And then they're bolted together with these cadmium-plated bolts. So it's virtually foolproof. That's right. OK. Let's take a, let's take a look over here. As you can see, Herb and his man are uh, finishing up the uh, details of putting in the studs in these triangles. They're filling in the spaces within the triangle. Right. And again, all the triangles are held together by the hub. Now, why couldn't all these filler pieces just be cut on the job? Well, it would be very, very difficult, Bob. Uh, let me show you. As you can see from this piece of wood, it's a really highly precise compound angle. Mm. And that's r done in our factory under exacting conditions. In fact, if you take a look over here, you can see that what we have is on this base plate is that the dome is actually going out. And again, that presents an angle here. So that all these pieces have to be angled just a little bit. Let me right. see how it would fit there. Right. And exactly right. Now, see, Bob, in this case... It'd you... be a nightmare to try to cut it. Oh, yeah. It would really be tough. Tell me, what about the sheathing for the dome? All right, let's take a look at this one over here that's already been sheathed. As you can see, we have a cluster of two domes here. Mm -hmm. And this one, we can see the sheathing detail and how fur much further it is advanced. Okay, what's this space going to be used for? This is going to be the living room on this side and the dining room uh, up above. Fantastic area. I'm glad you like it. Let's step out here and take a look at uh, what we're doing with the sheathing, Bob. Well, it's just half-inch plywood, isn't it? Yeah, it's half-inch uh, CCX exterior-grade plywood. And what are these little triangles up here all about? Well, the plywood comes in four-by-eight sheets, sure. of course. And so what we have here is a four-foot dimension. Oh, okay, so you're talking about minimizing weight. Right, and this is pre-cut in our factory, mm -hmm. and therefore we get a uh, optimum utilization of sheets. What about building inspectors? Don't you have a lot of problems getting approval for a, for a structure like this? No, not really. In fact, uh, we've never been denied a building permit uh, really? for the structural integrity of the dome. Okay. And what about wind loads? Aren't you afraid that this enormous dome is going to act like a sail and a real strong wind can just push it over the hill? <laughs> no. In fact, uh, we uh, provide uh, real good engineering to uh, prevent that from happening. Uh, besides the fact that the dome is uh, highly wind resistant, mm -hmm. and in fact, we recently designed a uh, dome to withstand 184 mile an hour wind conditions. But our engineering for each site mm -hmm. provides the structural hold down. And if we want to take a look down here, Bob, you can see how you anchor it, how we anchor it right down to the foundation. So and what we're doing is we're tying in here with these nuts and bolts and this heavy duty steel, the whole roof directly into the concrete foundation down below. Super. What's this opening for? What's going to happen here in, in this area that hasn't been closed in? Well, Bob, on a uh, geodesic dome, it just happens that there are five natural openings. Because of the way the shapes land. Right. And as you can see, what Gary is probably going to do here is take advantage of this beautiful natural opening for a window or uh, a or sliders. slider yeah. or something to uh, Yeah, to fill after in all, face. he's got a wraparound terrace on right. it. So the owner does whatever he wants on every one of these openings. You get a lot of options. Right. What about the foundation? Well, I'll tell you what we do. Why don't we take a look down here and uh, we'll see what he's done. The owner provides his own foundation. Mm -hmm. and, and is neat... it a very highly engineered foundation? That, uh... In this case, yes. But the neat thing about a geodesic dome is that you really can build them over any foundation whatsoever. Slabs. Or Slabs, whatever. basements, raised wood. And it works. Wow, he's got a whole other room down here, doesn't he? Yeah, it sure does. Well, because this is a sloped site, Right. He's taken advantage of that opportunity to build a concrete foundation down here underneath the living room. Mm -hmm. And this will be garage and, and shop. Right, space. and he'll have a garage here and a nice shop area, plus uh, plenty of room in behind there. Of course, this is not part of the kit, right? No, this is not part of the Monterey Dome kit itself. Larry, what do all the neighbors think about having a dome go up right next door? Well, I'll tell you what, this is an unusual structure. Mm -hmm. But I, let's go outside and ask the owner. Oh, great. Oh, Gary? I'd like to Hi. introduce you to Bob Vila. Hi. Hi. Quite a place you've got here. Thank you. Now, I understand you're in the Air Force. Yeah. Do you fly planes? Yeah, fly planes. 
Really? And you've never had any experience building a house before? No, I haven't. So has it been easy for you to put this dome frame together? Yeah, it goes together real, real easy. No serious problems, huh? No. What do your neighbors say about it? Are they happy? They love it. Uh, the looks of it and the background and everything. Nobody's, just... nobody's gotten upset about having this no kind of complaints. futuristic affair going up here, huh? No. What's the cost going to be? It's going to be about 80000 when I get done. And, uh, well, I've got a lot in the land, which is 27 and then... The land was 27 uh -huh. And improvements to the land? Right. So what, you're going to end up with about a forty-five dollars or $50,000 dome home? That's about right, yeah. That's a lot of house for forty-five dollars or $50,000. Well, good luck to you. You know, I would love, love to take a look at a finished dome home. Good. Well, let's jump in the car and we'll go across town and see one. Congratulations. Thank you. Hey, it's nice seeing you, Gary. Bye-bye. Wow. Well, here we are, Bob. These, this is the same dome that we saw earlier this morning. The same size dome. Same yeah. size. They're covered with wooden shake. Up there, those are flat solar hot water panel collectors. Those triangles up there. Yes, and to the right are skylights. Bob, did you know that when we first opened this model home up, we had, believe it or not, 185,000 people come through this place? In how, what period of time? About seven months. Really? Come on inside. The real impact is here. This is huge. Was this the big dome or the little dome? Bob, this is the little dome. It's the living room that we saw earlier. One it's of the amazing reasons, the, the sense of space in here. Yeah, one of the reasons is because of the white walls and the multifaceted triangles. Mm -hmm. And you can get tons of furniture in here. This is an enormous couch setup. Isn't it nice? You know, most people are concerned about how much furniture they can fit in the house and how well it will go. But as you can see, it works pretty well. Yeah, yeah. We have a, a custom-built fireplace here. Nice element separates the whole, the whole space. Uh -huh. And then up four steps. Right. And this makes a natural separation between the living room and the dining room. Mm -hmm. Nice dining area. It's cozy. Yeah. Earlier, we were talking about the openings, the five natural openings. Right. In this case, what we've done is used glazing yeah. with draperies on the outside, inside. Mm -hmm. And you can, uh, you can do anything with those, as we discussed earlier. That looks very nice. Thank you. Let's go into the kitchen. By the way, here's the... Uh, Wet bar. Ah, the important item, yes. Now, this is where the two domes connect at this point, right? That's correct, right. Oh, it's a beautiful kitchen. Ah, thank you. Interesting space. I mean, it's, it's a pie-shaped kind of, but yeah. it's so open onto the rest of the space. Yeah, and uh, the nice thing about it are all the cabinets and how they fit into the wall, mm -hmm. and it's a really a, uh, a dream home. Oh, plenty of light, nice view. Well, what else is on this level? Okay, the master bedroom is down right down here. Let's take a look. This is the angular but spacious master bedroom. Very unusual room. Yes. Once again, notice how the furniture is well accepted in a room like this. Uh -huh. Here's the fireplace. Do you need a fireplace in sunny California? Well, not very often. You know, what's really neat about the room is there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight different wall surfaces that you can put furniture against. And That's so right. Very unusual shape. Come on in here and I'll show you the master bathroom. I'm going to show you something I bet you haven't seen before. Look at this. We've got a triangular shower. No, I've never seen one before. I bet the tile setter just loved doing that one. Well, in a structure like this, you really get some strange angles sometimes. Yeah. Hey, come on. Let's go upstairs and I'll show you some more angles. I bet you've got a lot of other angles up there. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Here adjacent to the kitchen is a little sitting area. Family area, kind of. Right. Mm-hmm. This is the uh, larger of the two domes. And as a result, we have two floors. Nice staircase. Thank you. Bob, notice the uh, hexagonal skylights. Get a lot of sunlight through there. Look at all those plants growing up there. Right. Looks like a hanging garden. Kind of a nice atrium. Yeah. Well, what's up on this level? Well, let me show you. First, we have a bedroom here. It's a wedge-shaped bedroom. Not very big, but it sure feels big because of the height. Height. Yeah. Height. Terrific. And what's in here? A bathroom. This bathroom is shared with by... With an indoor swimming pool or one of the biggest whirlpools I've ever seen. <laughs> right. Shared by both bedrooms. Okay, so it's another similar sized bedroom. You right. know what's interesting is, I mean, I can see the trailer trucks 100 feet away on the freeway and you don't hear much noise in here. Right. Well, it's very tight structure mm -hmm. and we have a lot of good insulation. Mm -hmm. So what else is on this floor? We've done kind of a semicircle in this direction. That's right. 
Well, we have another uh, room over here called a den or to be used as another small bedroom. Very nice. Mm -hmm. Perfect size. Right. Could be the nursery, too. Lots of light coming in here through all this, this glass. Right. Answer something for me. What is the, the energy story with a house like this? Geodesic dome is a tremendously efficient structure. Why? What makes it so efficient? Primarily because of the shape and the fact that it's very tight and it's well insulated. Now, Larry, what does the shape have to do with it? It keeps the air flowing. And it's a circulation of this air in a natural way without tight corners trapping it. Okay. So how would a dome home compare with uh, a conventional home of similar square footage? Well, it should exceed and compare very favorably to the state-of-the-art energy-efficient home being built any place in the United States today. Really? Yeah. See that there's, there's a beautiful deck out there. Could we take a look at that? Sure. Let's go down and take a look. Enormous out here. Of course, it goes well with those enormous mountains in the background. Yeah, it looks pretty good. You know, Larry, the one thing that, that really impresses me about these dome homes is that you've got incredible versatility. You yep. can put walls up anywhere you want. I'm sure Gary will be doing things differently from what's been done here. That's right. Tell me one thing. Where are the majority of these homes being built? The Monterey Dome homes are being built pretty much along population trends. The Sun Belt, California, Texas, and Florida. Mm -hmm. But yet, in fact, uh, New York and New Jersey are very good for us. Really? Well, Larry, thanks a lot. It's been a very informative tour. Uh, thank you, Bob. You know, we could use some of that California sunshine here at our solar home right now. One thing I wanted to point out was that all the rooms, most of the areas throughout the house have been equipped with these wires which connect a series of sensors. They'll be able to monitor the heating picture inside the house at all times. And also here on this master bedroom wall where the bed probably will be located, we've got this unobtrusive gray wire, which has to do with a panic button. Earlier this week, I talked with Don Martini about the burglar alarm system for this old house. Let's take a look at that. Well, Don, how are you going to protect the all new this old house? Well, Bob, obviously, on television, I'm not going to tell you the specifics of what we're going to do here. Mm -hmm. But I can give you an idea of how a system is put together. OK, what are the essential parts? Basically, a system is put together as three elements. The first is the control panel, which is the brain of an alarm system. Mighty impressive. What is all that? Well, this is a microprocessor-based control panel. Mm -hmm. It powers and supervises different things we might do as part of an alarm system. OK. How is it powered? Normally, it's powered from your house current. Mm -hmm. And then it should have in it a backup power supply that's self-charging, so that if your electricity fails, the alarm system would continue to run. Why does it have to be in a steel box with a lock on it? Well, because it is the brain of the alarm system, Obviously, it's vulnerable, mm -hmm. so it's important to keep it secure, both in a firm box and with a key lock, so, so that no one can get into this it. This is the, probably the most vulnerable part of the, of the system. I would say so. And do you want to talk about where we're going to be putting ours, or...? Well, we don't want to, again, That's... we don't want to get into the specifics of where anything is here particularly, but an important consideration would be to keep it someplace that's relatively concealed. Mm -hmm. You only have to get to it occasionally. It's mm -hmm. not an immediate uh, user item. Mm -hmm. And we want to make sure that when we locate it in a position, it is protected by the alarm system so that you have to violate the alarm before you can get to the control. OK. Well, what are some of the other components? OK. The next element of the security system would be the means of detection. Uh -huh. How are we going to detect somebody coming in the house? Yeah. There are two basic methods that we can use to do that. First is to protect the perimeter of yeah. the house. Yeah, what are we going to do here? We've got so windows. many doors and sliding okay. doors and so forth. Well, typically, let's take a look at the sliding glass door. As this is a relatively easy method of entry, mm -hmm. okay, we would want to protect this from being opened. Yeah. Okay? This is an example of a magnetic contact switch. Okay, this goes in the casing of the door. Now, let's just open this Has door. Has this one been done already? There is one in here, if you notice it right there. Okay. Once that's painted over, you won't even see it. The theory behind this is, as the door is closed, the magnet makes contact with the switch. Mm -hmm. When someone pries open the door, contact breaks, the alarm sounds. Okay. okay. And what about the windows, Doc? Okay. Our, the windows we have here, the casement windows, are very difficult windows to get into by prying them. Let's take a look at this window. Yeah, they're pretty secure once they're you very put the lock secure. On. With the crank, you can't pry them very easily. If you try and pry it, you'll probably break it. Mm -hmm. Or a burglar who doesn't have much patience might throw a, a rock right through and break the glass out and just oh, step in. Then what do you do? Okay, we have another problem. Let's go back over to the table and I'll show you what we have to protect that kind of an opening. 
The no. screen? The screen. That will keep the flies out, right? Okay, well, it's going to keep the flies out, but we've done something to, to go one step further. You may notice the lead coming off the top. You've wired the screen. We've wired the screen. You plug that into a little plug that's part of the alarm circuit. Mm -hmm. If you notice real carefully, if you look here, you can see that every four inches, yeah. there is actually a lead that is part of the alarm circuit. Uh -huh. So now, if someone comes along and you've left the window open and they cut the screen, that will trip the alarm. Or if the window is closed and they throw a brick through it and break, push the screen in, that will trip the alarm. What about that really vicious burglar that's going to come with a chainsaw and just rip a hole in my wall or maybe okay. just throw a brick through the slider door? All right. Well, that's a problem that needs to be addressed as well. And that's the other part of protecting the internal part of the house mm -hmm. using some form of a trap or an internal detector. Now, this is a passive infrared detector. Wonderful. What does that do? This detects the change in temperature that occurs when you or an intruder steps into its field of view. Okay? So how do, you, how do you install something like that? All right, typically in a room like this, we might locate this detector over here, Bob. Up on the wall, it's a good position for this. Uh -huh. It allows it to see, if you will, the entire room. If someone breaks the sliding glass door and steps in, the detector can pick up that rapid change in energy when they stepped in front of it and cause the alarm to activate. So this is not like the old-fashioned motion detectors that if the curtains fluttered off, went the alarm. It really isn't, no. If the leaves fall off your plant, that won't bother it. The blowing air from your forced hot air system, that won't bother it, as previously it might have an ultrasonic alarm system. What if you, if you have a, a, a precocious poodle that jumps around the house all over the place when, when it's alone? Okay. Another nice part of this type of detector, because it can be controlled optically, is we could locate it at a height that we say, well, the dog's about two feet high, so we'll put this at about two and a half feet. Okay. We can adjust it and focus it so that it looks from two feet up. Okay. And so the, the dog trick can is, run around. The trick is that you can focus it. You can That's direct it. Right. What's the other aspect of the system? The last element of the system is what does it do once the alarm has activated? Somebody opens a door, what happens? Save me. Yeah. Okay. At the house, there's an indoor and an outdoor electronic siren. Mm -hmm. Okay, typically these make sounds similar to your police cars. All right, the oscillating noise. All right. Isn't that a problem in that everybody that has an alarm has heard the stories about, you know, false alarms half the time, and the neighbors get used to hearing the horns go off, and they say, just say, that's Mrs. Calabash's alarm down the street again. Okay. And another important element of that, what happens when the alarm goes off, would be to have a security system monitored by a private central station. Now, this is an organization that monitors alarm systems. So typically this might be set up so that if the alarm trips, mm -hmm. it sends a signal to this central station. At the central station, there's a computer that prints out. There's a problem at this Jones's house, XYZ Avenue, send the police. Of course, all of that occurs through the telephone lines. Right? All that occurs through the telephone line. And the central station operators are trained to respond to that by calling the police, by notifying you at work. It can also uh, send signals relative to fire and smoke detectors, mm -hmm. um, panic alarms, or even medical, medical emergencies. Exactly. Right? exactly. Yeah. Exactly. It's very flexible. Well, one last question. When I come in the door, or when I'm going out, how do I control all these wonderful devices? Okay. Good question. This device is what's commonly used with a security system to turn it on and off. Mm -hmm. This is the most commonly used piece of the security system that you would become involved with mm -hmm. as an end user or an owner. Mm -hmm. All right, typically, this might be placed near the door or doors okay. that you commonly use. Okay? So as we come in from the garage, this might be conveniently located in a proximity nearby. All yeah. right? The way it would work is, as you come in, because that door would be on a time delay, you open the door, the arming station would buzz to remind you that the alarm is set. Hey, come turn me on. That's right. So you put in your code and you turn it off. The code can be as complex or as simple as you like. Very commonly, it can go to as many as six digits. Mm -hmm. All right, that's about as many as somebody can remember to use effectively. Well done. What does a system like this cost? Well, Bob, a system like this, of course, is based on the quantity of equipment, the number of doors and windows that you have in a house how much protection is there. Mm -hmm. Typically, a moderate house might range between fifteen and eighteen hundred dollars. That's the average. For what we talked about. That's probably the average. You have to also remember that to have a central station monitor the alarm system, uh -huh. there's a monthly charge for that service. It may range between fifteen and twenty dollars a month. 
Okay. Well, thank you, Don. Well, once again, we're running short on time around here. I hope you'll be able to join us next week when we'll be taking you on a field trip to Honolulu, Hawaii to look at a beautiful penthouse and a beach cottage. Till then, I'm Bob Vila for the all-new This Old House. The all-new This Old House is made possible by a grant from Owens Corning Fiberglass Corporation. I'm Bob Vila. Welcome to the all-new This Old House. We've had a lot of progress here in the last week and a half, and not the least of it is our garage door. It's been installed, and this is not an ordinary garage door. Oh, you can get these anywhere in the country, but, I mean, it's a steel frame, and actually the, the, uh, the reinforcing is steel, and the frame is pine, and there's rigid insulation inside there. The inside, you see, is just plywood, quarter-inch plywood. But the unusual thing about this door is, let me bring it back down a little bit and stop it right here. There. We've got red cedar that matches the whole exterior of the house, tongued and grooved, and it's been applied to the outside in a vertical fashion to each section so that when the door is closed, it'll actually match up with the siding and almost disappear. It's a nice, clean look. It's also a very energy-efficient door. It's been gasketed on all three sides here, and it has a black rubber gasket at the bottom, so that we'll never have to worry much about drafts coming in. If you look over my head up here, the soffit detail has been completed. You're looking at a hole where there will be a recessed uh, lighting fixture installed. But rather than use three-quarter inch cedar up there, we used cedar plywood. We, I didn't know it was available up until we built this little detail. We also have the strip, the continuous ventilating strip that you see, uh, uh, the metal, it goes around the entire perimeter of the house. And of course, it's there not only to ventilate the attic so that it doesn't overheat in there, but also to allow any moisture that collects in there to escape from the attic. We've put in a secondary door into the garage so that if you have to go in there to get tools or something, you don't need to open the big door. And we settled on a steel door. The main reason for that being maintenance and durability. These doors are very, very good from the point of view of never having to to be repainted very often, of not being damaged by the weather. There's still some work going on in there. That was a saw you heard in the background. And of course, they also are gasketed on all three sides so that they're nice and tight. Take a look over here. This will be the, the main entry into the house. We have a similar door already in place here. And what I like about the detailing that Norm and the fellows have done is that it's very, very simple. We don't have any casings on doors or windows so that you just see kind of a punched out opening on occasional parts of the facade. This is, of course, the north side of the house. There's still some work to be done here. We've got, well, if the ground thaws out in the next few weeks, we'll be able to move in some topsoil and do some berming here, which actually will protect the lower section of this house from the cold winds and so forth. And the application is not just a normal one. Behind what you see here is, of course, the concrete foundation wall. But we have covered the foundation wall with two inches of rigid insulation. And then there's this diamond steel mesh that you see there. And it's here so that we can put a stucco coat over the entire section. Now, the reason we haven't been able to do it is that the weather's been below 25 degrees. And you never want to mix mortar and Portland cement to get a parge over this when the weather's that cold, because it'll fail on you. It'll just crack and fall off. Walking along here, you see that what I was saying about the little punch outs. This is a, one of the bathroom windows, actually. But again, it's not trimmed out. It's simply recessed in there, all you see is a stool and an expanse of cedar. And of course, it wraps right around in this direction. We're not going to be painting or staining this wood. We want it to just weather naturally, which means it'll turn into a very nice silvery gray. We might give it a hand by putting some bleaching oil, uh, bleaching stain on it at some point, again, if the weather improves. One of the last pieces of business to take care of out here has to do with the decking. Our steel is in place and has been for a couple of weeks. We've been working on other, other parts of the house, and we're waiting for the planking to arrive so that we can finish this up. Well, we've got lots, lots on tap for you today. We are planning to take you, at some point a little bit later in the show, to Hawaii, Honolulu, where we'll be visiting with an architect by the name of Norman Lacayo, who has done some fascinating things out there, and we wanted to show those to you. But right now, I thought we would try to find Norm, continue this tour with him, because he knows uh, quite a bit about some of the items that we haven't discussed yet. And also, we're planning to get together with Christy Stottlemeyer, who's our uh, tile expert. We're going to be talking with her about certain ceramic tile products that are being used in the house. Let's jump down towards the south side and find Norman. 
Well, this is the south side of the building, and there's Norm Abram. Hi, Norm. Hi, Bob. Cedar looks terrific. Oh, it's come a long way. It's a real nice yeah, siding. Yeah. It makes a big difference. It's nice to see the house this far along. What are you up to here? What's all this? Well, these are our units for the sun space, and up above we have three casement windows. Those are operable, then? Huh? That's right. And down here we have two, one that's open here, and a door to get out onto this level of the yard. Now, these look totally different from all the cedar that we put on the house. They are. They're all constructed out of redwood. Why redwood? Well, redwood because this is a greenhouse space, and it was felt by the architect that redwood would withstand the moisture better than a door that might be constructed out of pine. Mm -hmm. Are these stock items? Can, can, can anybody get these windows out of a catalog? Well, the unit itself is not a stock item, but the pieces, like the door and the window units, are part of a greenhouse system. Oh. Which, which the manufacturer uh, makes all different sizes, combinations of these units. I noticed that the glass looks like it's uh, thermal, is it? That's right. It has redwood. It's thermal insulated glass. So we've got the, the beauty of the redwood and we've mm -hmm. got the insulated glass. Well, but it'll look a lot different from the cedar. How are, how are we going to deal with that? Well, we're going to leave it. It has got some kind of sealing on it, sealant on it, but it'll turn very dark with age and it'll probably start to look like the rest of the sliding like the other doors. patio doors That's good right. what's going on over here all right this is another piece of construction out of redwood which will also t turn very dark mm. almost to this color with time what's and the what point it is, of that it's a trellis it has no real purpose in the winter time but in the summer when the sun is real high on this south side mm -hmm. it'll restrict some of the sunlight that goes into this room so that it We'll keep it a little bit cooler. So it'll act as a shading overhang That's there. That's right. Well, what's happening inside? There's a lot of things going on inside. Let's take a look. Wow, they finished up the tile floor over the weekend. That's huh? right. Worked all weekend on it. Looks fabulous. What are you going to do about these stairs here? I've got oak treads and rises ordered for this, and we'll start on this in another week or so. Oh, this is looking superb. They, they started hang, hanging the chandeliers. Right? We've got lighting fixtures and switches, switches in place and everything. So everything's coming along quite uh, quickly. Now tell me about this door here. All right, Bob, we have a wood door here with insulated glass, mm -hmm. which might seem a little strange for the interior, but that's our entry vestibule, and it's unheated. Hi, Sal. Hi, Bob. How are you doing? Fine, thank you. It's looking beautiful. Thank you. That's the vestibule, and we're almost finished in there, right? That's all we have to do is get it plastered and a few pieces of trim, and it's done. Fabulous. Well, what's going on in the kitchen? Uh, our cabinets have arrived and being installed. Well, the progress is coming along quite well in here. Oh, absolutely. And these are all box cabinets, by the way. They're nice. I like this detail here, these, these shelves with the rounded corners. They kind of remind me of the kitchen I grew up in back in the 50s. That's right. Very nice. And I see the, the brick wall has cured now. It's, it's got that real antique look to it. That's right. You've got the true color of the mortar starting to show. Yeah. So what's left to do here? Trim work? Just trim around the windows. As you know, we're, we're trying to make this simple. No window casings, mm -hmm. just a window sill. Mm -hmm. So we'll simply take a piece of oak fit it in here and around the right, corner about right. the same amount and that's beautiful it. you know speaking of oak and trim work you should have been with us in honolulu i wish i was well, yeah, well, it's quite a tour we got together with norman lacayo who's an architect out there and not only does he have some very unusual buildings but his use of oak in detail work is fantastic we started out looking at a little beach cottage he designed right on diamond head overlooking the south pacific let's take a look Bob, where we are is on the slopes of world-famous Diamond Head. What we did here is we had a challenge of designing a pool area along with a, a rec facility mm -hmm. or a guest house for a couple that lives out of state. We're pretty high up. Oh, yeah, the view from here is spectacular. Wait till you see it. Boy, the wind's really coming up around here. Oh, it sure is. Now, what's the story with this, this bungalow here? Okay, this bungalow was built about, oh, 30 years ago by a retired colonel. But we had nothing to do with it. The part that we This is where your work begins. ...was the pool area and the guest cottage. I love it. I don't oh. see the guest cottage, but tell me about this pool. Okay, uh, you know, we're on the slopes of Diamond Head, and what we try to do is respect the site as much as possible. Mm -hmm. So we terraced only what we had to. Mm -hmm. So that's why the site keeps dropping away, and it becomes very dramatic, especially from this edge over here. It's not a very large pool, but it is sure dramatic it, it's well, well it's, what it's we've a done black is, pool isn't what it? we've done is we've tried to capitalize and, and here again to create something that is inviting by the black pool has a very cooling effect mm -hmm. and if you notice during the daytime that the water creates an effect of, of dancing yeah. because of the way the sun hits it super 
I love the terracotta uh, on all the decks, too. This is all shipped in from Mexico. Hey, but this is the money view. Unbelievable. Well, this is the million-dollar view. This is why people come to Diamond Head. There's nothing between mainland China and us right now, That's is right. There? That's right. Wonderful. So where's the cottage? Well, the cottage is hidden away over there in the, in the landscaping. We, what we did is we tried to have it so it's as tucked away as possible so it adds to the sense of mystery. Yes, you don't see it at all from the pool no. or from the bungalow over And not until you get to this point that all of a sudden you notice that there's a structure here. And even here the path has been taken and instead of a direct shot into the front door, we twist it around so again you come out and you hit the ocean view one more time before going in through the door. Bam, it's fabulous. Mm -hmm. What are we, about 60 feet above the, yeah, the road yeah, down there? Yeah, it's about there? 60 feet above. Here again, you know, it's, uh, it gives you an, another shot of unobstructed view. Mm -hmm. It's here, wonderful. Look. It's like being in treetops. It right. really is. Now, this is the entrance to the house. And what we've done here is we've played it down by creating a very low-key type of door. Entry. Where is the door? I don't well, see it. Well, the, the door is, is right over here. We don't have any hardware on it. But here, let me take you through. Wow, it's a barrel vault. It sure is. What used to be here before was an old lath house. Lath houses were you grow orchids. Right. That type of thing. And so what we did is we, as it's sort of reminiscent and a, a, to carry the theme through, mm -hmm. we, we created this vault and we have these slats on top. It's a fabulous detail, but of course the space itself is really neat. I mean, this is a kind of living room, that's, dining room, kitchen, right. all in one Everything small has area. The, that's right. It I has a built-in look. I love it. And of course, You've got these views. Huh. Yeah, let me show Everywhere. you over here. You know, we have crosswinds here that keep everything cool, but then there are some times when it's, it's, it's very, very windy. So what we have here are these sliding doors. You can slide these all the way back to one side, and when you look out, you have the feeling of being up on the trees like a treehouse. It's like a, yeah, exactly, like a treehouse. Yeah, Where's right. the bedroom? Okay, it's over this way. Let me show you. There's not really a wall dividing no. it. It's just what these it is, wonderful... we have these louvered doors. These shutters. Again, the louvered doors let the wind go through. You open this thing up and you have this dynamite view from the bed. You wake up looking out at the Pacific. That's I, right. Huh, not bad. I love your use of oak and, and shelving and built-in everywhere. Well, one of the things that we guard very jealously are interiors. So what we do is we try to build everything in we can mm -hmm. on every job. So that you basically don't let the client have much choice in terms of how to furnish well, it. The, uh, the, the client has a certain amount of choice and that we try and design exactly for his needs. Mm -hmm. What's over here? Oh, this is the bathroom. Let me show you. I love all these rounded corners everywhere. Neat. Okay, this is a very earthy tub here. You know, you we, bet. We've yeah. used a Mexican tile, mm -hmm. which has a nice handmade quality. And then right here, we have our yard. You're outdoors, yeah. That's right. So yeah. you have this outdoor-indoor relationship. Yeah. What's that over your head there? That's a shower. This is the old type uh, shower that you used to see in the old gyms. And then we have an old valve that we've had de-chromed. And uh, it's all solid brass underneath. Uh, Norm, is this the type of toilet everybody uses out here in Hawaii? Well, no. This is a very unusual toilet, and it's Italian. And it's uh, become a very, very strong conversation piece. I bet. I've never seen one like it. So where's the outdoor space? Let me take you over to the deck, and I'll okay. show you. Here in Hawaii, we call it a lanai. You probably call it a deck. I like the word this, lanai. This is lovely back here. This was a super opportunity in that it, it becomes a very sort of hidden away type lanai with the hillside on one side, which protects you for your privacy. On the other side, you have the ocean view. And of course, it looks like you're sitting on top of the trees. Yeah, it's wonderful. I love it. How about showing us something of a different nature that you've designed? OK, come on, let's go. Sure. Bob, this area is called Nuwana. It's about, oh, five minutes north of Honolulu. And the project I'm going to show you is called Craigside. There's quite a change from the beach house at uh, Diamond Head, isn't oh, it? Oh, we're going from the smallest thing I've done to one of the larger things I've done. Well, how large is this? How many, how many stories? It's 27 stories high. Well, the first thing I notice is that it's not a square or a rectangle. It's a very interesting shaped building. Well, the reason for it is that we've used a system in here that we've helped develop. It's called slip form construction. Slip form construction. What does that mean, Norm? Well, slip form construction is, is uh, something like taking, and when you squeeze your toothpaste out of a tube, you have it, it comes out extruded. So what we're doing essentially is extruding the building. Only what we do is we carve out a shape of the floor plan. Mm -hmm. Like a giant cookie cutter. Like a giant cookie cutter. 
In this case, it's, it, you can see it's the entire floor. And what happens is this mat is about four foot deep. Mm -hmm. This mat goes up on a jack. And you and, raise it. And you raise it, and you pour concrete on the top, and on the bottom comes out the extruded concrete, mm -hmm. and it hardens. What are the advantages to, to this system? Well, the advantages are that if you look around, you see nothing but square buildings. Here, it enables me to design. The way I design, I design a floor plan first, and then the outside afterwards. So it gives me the freedom of coming up with very interesting and complicated shapes if uh -huh. I want to. Uh -huh. And then that's why you get this nicely faceted building which you normally wouldn't get in a steel building. It's really interesting. So you're starting from the floor plan first. That's right. Well, we're going to go look at the penthouse, right? Yes, right right up on the top floor. Great, I can't wait. I want you to notice the way we've sunk in the lobby down in order to create a nice sense of mystery to the entry of the building. It's very subtle. Yes. Boy, I love the use of terracotta again. It's Mexican here. tile. Mm -hmm. Now, I want you to notice the character in the design of the lobby because it reflects the design that you'll see all the way through the building, the round shapes, the round columns. Curves and columns, yes, it's neat. Who uses this lobby? It's primarily used by the, the guests of all the, the residents of the building. And here we'll take the elevator to the penthouse. Now, will this take us straight up to the penthouse? Yes, directly into the penthouse. Norm, since the elevator opens directly into the apartment, how do you keep out unwanted guests? You can't get in unless you have a key. Oh, and how many units are in the building? There are 52 units plus a penthouse. Okay. Here we are. Here's where the drama begins, Bob. The ceiling was designed in the entry very low. Yeah. And it does to dramatize the difference between wow. that space and this space right here. This is lovely. Now, you'll notice how sculptural everything is mm -hmm. and how it ties in. The columns. And everything there. works off of this main space. Mm -hmm. You have the dining room over here, for instance. It's raised up on the same level that we were when we walked in. Mm -hmm. And the reason it's raised up is so when you're sitting down, you can look over anybody that might be sitting down here or the furniture. Yeah. And you always have an unobstructed view, except I, for this wall here. I really love this curved band here that dies into this wall. What's behind yeah. all this? Okay, this wall conceals the bar. And wine storage. And the wine storage, right. It also gives the dining room a little bit of separation. Here I'm starting to see again the details we were just looking at, the rounded corners and the, you that's, know. That's a typical trademark of my design. Mm -hmm. Everything's soft, very, very tactile. It's a feeling. No hard edges anywhere, even on correct. the, on the uh, soffits overhead correct, and so forth. Correct, correct. It, it looks soft and it is soft. The views are unbelievable up here. I'll walk over here and you'll see. What are we looking at there? You're looking at downtown Honolulu. Boy, from the 27th floor, did we say? Yes, approximately. Yeah. Right. You're in, totally encased in glass here, though, and you're in a real hot climate. Don't you have problems with keeping the apartment cool? No, we don't. We have several things that are going for us. One, of course, we have the trade winds, and the trade winds are, are always there, and they, they keep the apartment cool. So you do get cross-ventilation. So we have cross-ventilation. It was designed to have cross-ventilation. We have the shades, which will keep the sun out. We have the drapes, and the shades do a, a very effective job. Tell me about the architecture here. Describe your thoughts here. Well, this was designed like, like carving out a space out of a big piece of chalk. Everything kind of works together, very mm -hmm. monolithic. Mm -hmm. They're strong those, horizontals, though. They're yeah, very strong horizontals, and you have the, the verticals of the structure, like the columns. Mm -hmm. Most of the walls of the building are not in place here. They've been taken out. But you'll notice how, how some of the features, like the horizontal band that wraps all the way around. Continues floor, along here. Continues on, and it and becomes a floating heart. Yeah. With the light underneath. Yeah. And then you've got this real strong element here. That's right. Now here, this is the one element that ties in the upstairs and the downstairs together. So you have the mantelpiece that wraps around, becomes mm -hmm. a stairway, and then becomes the mezzanine up above. Fabulous. Come on, I'll show you the rest of the house. Let's go up here a couple of steps. And we'll hit the master bedroom right now. These are clowns that the uh, owner collects. Neat. Nice, nice little collection. Now, you'll notice here on the right-hand side, there's a nice touch. There's a spiral staircase that takes you up to the little study up above. And a garden area. Yeah, and then the tiled area is, uh, is a lanai. Actually, another lanai here, right? right? And another open terrace. Fabulous. Yeah, sensational view, isn't it? Right in your bedroom. Right. And then another bay window over there. Yeah, which gives you a, a cross shot up the valley 
and that's the Pali. A Pali is the name of the hill for you? That's the, uh, what they call the Pali. The okay. detailing continues throughout That's here. That's right. I mean, that grabs my eye, but this whole built-in wall here really grabs my eye. Yeah, this is a built-in dresser, and it's, it's part of the overall dressing room. I love area. all the horizontal lines of the graining That's of the oak right. and so forth. What's and, up here? And up above, you have the electronic equipment. Ah. The doors are louvered, so the, uh, you get the ventilation necessary in there. Fabulous. Everything's been thought of. Where's the master bathroom? The master bath is over this way. Watch your step again. Sure. We have a lot of levels, as you can see. Mm -hmm. Here on the right and left hand side, you have dressing areas. Closets and shelves. Closets and buildings. shelves. You step down into the master bath. Hey, I love these details you put in, these thick, chunky walls and these openings, these niches. Yeah, it adds interest to the, that's, uh, that's nice. to the area. Oh, this is fabulous. Now here we've used the round uh, tile. Again. More more circular forms. More, more circular curves. forms. And you'll see how the circular forms compounded with the round shapes of the, of the design are very intricate. And the curves and everything. Very good workmanship. Well good workmanship. Yeah. Very good. Where next? Let's go upstairs. This gives you a different perspective as you climb up the stairs and you see how the mezzanine wraps around the you big bet. space down in the living room. Then you have the atrium on the other side. Wow. With a skylight up above. On the 27th floor, you got all these plants up here. Yeah, something that you wouldn't expect to have way up here. It's terrific. The way we've designed it, it's protected from the wind, so all the plants do real well. Mm, and a pool table, of course. What's right. going on up here? How did you get, what did you do to the ceiling? Well, what we did is we dropped the ceiling around the pool table to conceal all the equipment that's up there, ducts and plumbing. Mm-hmm. And it also affords you to have a better sense of height when right. you're playing pool. Right, right. What's over here? Well, let me show you. This is the audio-visual room. Terrific, what every grown-up needs. Oh, yeah, now, from here, they can control all of the entertainment throughout the whole house. Uh -huh. They have their TV here, they have all the controls behind me, and they have a, a 10 meter dish. dish. Yeah. <laughs> and from that, they can pick up live TV. And they right can off the satellite. And they can transmit throughout the whole house. What, where can they pick up a snack if they get the munchies? They're where, pretty far yeah. away from the kitchen. Here, let me show you. Oh, there's a, a, a bar or something. Right. Now here again, here's a, another bar same type of detailing that we have downstairs. It has a refrigerator, ice maker. But what about real wine. food, Norman, if you're really hungry up here? What we have here is a dumbwaiter. Now this dumbwaiter starts in the floor below next to the kitchen, and then it comes up here, or it goes up to the floor above where there's another recreation center. You mean there's more up there? That's right. Can we take a look? Yes, let's go upstairs. Which way? Through here? Right there. So there's another outdoor space here right, right off Here's the another field. atrium. And then, oh, this leads up, yeah, to, the, up to the, the next level. Here. This is heaven. Looks like we had a little rain. Does this happen often in Hawaii? Oh, and here in Nepal, it probably rains like this once in a while. It's yeah. very unpredictable. Mm -hmm. It's beautiful, though. Okay, I want you to notice that we have this nice lattice work here. And what it does is it, it shades the bottom atrium. It also protects you from falling over because we have a low ledge. The bougainvillea is gorgeous, too. We have the planter with the bougainvillea. Yeah. We also have a, a hot tub here. We have a kitchen that'll just about do anything for you. A kitchenette, really. Right. We have a sauna. We have a steam room. Oh, on the other side of the on wall? On the other side of the wall. And then we have the, the dumbwaiter. Terrific. Saw down below. And then you've got all this open sunbathing space over here. Tell me something. D don't you usually have to have a bunch of equipment on top of a Well, what we did in order to like retrieve this? this space, we took all the equipment that normally would be sitting on top of this roof, and we bunched it over and put it behind that wall. That's that way, excellent. Uh, we were able to use this whole deck. Wonderful. Well, I think you've done a remarkable job here. I've never seen a building quite like it, or a place quite like Hawaii. Thanks a lot for giving us the tour. Thank you very much for the chance to show it to you. Well, it was 85 degrees in that sun shower, and now we're back to the reality of a snowstorm in uh, New England. But we've got Christy Stottlemyer with us, and we're going to be talking about ceramic tiles. Christy, why should we bother with ceramic tiles in an area like this, in this corner of the kitchen? Well, Bob, when you've got a transition from outdoors in to indoors, tile is a perfect surface to use. When you've got muddy, dirty feet coming in, there's just nothing that's easier to clean and take care of than tile. Mm -hmm. What kind of tile have you recommended here? Well, here we've got a red body tile with a glazed surface. What does a red body tile mean? Is that like a quarry tile? Basically, yeah. It's just nice to be able to have a nice light surface that matches our kitchen cabinets that we've got in here. But how is this going to wear? Very, very well. It's a very, very hard glaze. 
so that there's no danger of uh, traffic kind of wearing through the glaze? No, there shouldn't. It shouldn't wear and stand up to all that, or else I wouldn't have recommended it to you. What about a grout for this particular tile? Again, I kind of like things that are easy to maintain, so I would pick a dark grout in here because that's going to be the easiest to take care of. Mm -hmm. Good idea. What about our, our vestibule over here and, and the, the pantry area? Have you decided what to put down there, and should we consider that? Well, you know, I kind of like the idea of just using the same thing that we've used out here in this pantry area. It's a nice nice big space and it's got to be clean looking for food where you store your food and your veggies and things like that so I, I think th that's a good point in an area that you're going to have a food storage uh it would be nice to have you a just clean want it to look like fresh that. terrific all right we'll go with that what have you got planned for us for the master bathroom bob i've got a really exciting new idea let's go take a look at it sure Bob, in this area, which is basically the dressing area, we're going to do carpet. Mm -hmm. Then in the bathroom and in the uh, bathing area with the shower and the uh, whirlpool, we're going to do these white tiles on the floor. The two-inch squares. Right. Now, out here, to go with this uh, silver whirlpool, we've got some wonderful tiles. As a matter of fact, these are so new, all I have is the paper samples, but we're going to do white in the shower and then do a little design, which you can do all kinds of great things with this as a pattern inside the shower area. Is this the exact same silver gray as we have in the fixture? Yes, it's made to go with, with the silver of the fixture. Neat. I've never seen anything like that. That'll be beautiful. You know what is really great is the, the living room floor that they've already laid down. Wonderful. Let's go take a look at you it. Ceramic tile is the perfect surface to use in a room in a solar house like this. Yes, it gathers the solar warmth during the day and then gives it off at night. I like the effect of this design here. It's a really interesting pattern. What we've tried to do is kind of simulate a parquet floor. We've picked two colors of tile, which are subtle in color. and a three and different, red, yeah. Yeah, in three different shapes to create this pattern. We've got... In the corners here, we've got a pinwheel with two different sizes, which radiates into um, the striped effect, which mm -hmm. this striped effect then turns around and frames our field of 8 by 8 tile. So it's a really interesting... It's a nice contrast, too, between floor. the tan and the red. What about care? I'm watching you scrubbing the grout off there. What about care for this floor? When Once you get the grout off, all you do is just wash it with an oil-based soap, periodically and this floor should be good for centuries mm -hmm. well I don't know about centuries but I knew I know it's a good-looking floor and I thank you for your consulting services here we're running out of time I hope you can join us next week when we'll be going to Seattle Washington we're gonna be joining the editor of Metropolitan Home magazine and we're gonna be looking at their contest winner they have an annual contest for one of the best remodeling jobs in the country and this year the winner is essentially an old bank building turned into a resident join us till then I'm Bob Vila for the all-new this old house the all-new This Old House is made possible by a grant from Owens. Watch weekday mornings at 11.30. 56 WTVS, Detroit. Local broadcasts of the all-new This Old House are brought to you by Kmart Corporation, whose more than 2,000 stores supply materials for home improvements. The all-new This Old House is made possible by a grant from Owens Corning Fiberglass Corporation, manufacturers of residential building products. Hi, I'm Bob Vila. Welcome to the final episode of the all-new This Old House. It looks great in there. We're going to take you on a tour of all the completed interiors, but Tom Worth, my favorite landscape architect, come here a minute. How come we don't even have a rose bush out here? Bob, it's been a gruesome winter, as yeah. you know. Uh, spring is very late in coming. It's only the 26th of March here. We probably have another month before the ground thaws before we can do much more. So any good news? But the good news is that we're putting in the ornamental pool around back today. Terrific. Why don't you go take a look at that? I'll go find Norm Abram and see how the deck construction is coming Great. along. You really do have to use your imagination to see this, what this uh, will ultimately be over here. We're coming down the steps by the herb gardens. From the upper deck, there'll be a set of steps that come down this direction. Then there's also a set of steps that go down here to the lower terrace level. 
And this is all prelude to our major feature at this upper level. There's an ornamental pool going in over here. Rod Andrews is putting it in. Tell me, Rod, what are you doing over here? Good morning, Tom. Good to see you. We're getting ready uh, on the uh, uppermost part of the ornamental pool, which is a small self-contained swimming pool in itself. What we've done is we've taken the plans, we've put up our perimeter forms. This is just the uh, pine, uh, pine boards that that's you've exactly uh, pine into boards. the ground. Uh -huh. Then we back it up with rock glass, so this gives us a material to shoot against, which we can strip uh, off afterward. We've then lined the uh, pool with the uh, steel reinforcing rods. It's all, it's all tied, tied together, together, and it's up off the ground. And then there, we block it up off the ground. Uh huh. Now tell me, how about these uh, these fixtures that are coming up over here? What is this? This will be the uh, water inlet for the sculpture. We'll slip the sculpture down over the top of this, and we'll have water coming we'll in here. We'll have water coming in there. And okay. then we have two fixtures here, which are going to be for underwater lights to give us some illumination uh -huh. at night. And then the dish. We have a supplementary water source coming in out of the ground here, which you can't see just yet, but that'll come into the That's pool. That's right. Over all, here somewhere. All but this uh, water will be collected in the bottom pool, and then we, uh, we will filter it, and uh, we'll push it up here. And uh, we need a little more water than we can successfully get through here. So we'll put a secondary line in here. That'll give us enough water so that we get a good flow of water over there. So we're going to have a waterfall then on that little corner that'll go into another basin down below. Exactly right. So in essence, this is, this is a miniature swimming pool. It's a miniature Similar swimming pool. Similar to those pool. that you normally build. Exactly right. Very good. Now and tell me something about gunite itself. What we're going to do is we're going to uh, send the material down through this hole under pressure. It's, a, it's, a very, it's very dry. How did, how did gunite dry. originate? What is its uh, story? Well, gunite originated, it's a very interesting story, it originated in Chicago at the Chicago Exposition back at the turn of the century. Uh, they wanted to build a, a display of prehistoric animals and they didn't quite know how to put it together, so they put a wire cage together and developed a gun that shot actually plaster and they successfully built the animals. They took the basic design of that gun and uh, began to run cement through it. They found out that they could get a very strong concrete because you're using a very low water, amount of water. Uh -huh. ratio. So That's it's been almost 100 years concrete. now that this has been It's uh, been over been 100 done. years, and surprisingly, not many people know uh, about it even today. But uh, it's probably gained its greatest popularity uh, in the Gunite swimming pool because it is an extremely strong structure. Well, I think the other nice thing about it, too, is that it gives us a lot more flexibility than pouring something in place. It gives you really flexibility. We've built swimming pools and people's initials. We, we can really? build or shape anything, <laughs> anything. that you want. Uh, because even of something as crazy as this. Something as crazy as this. I'll tell you what, let's, uh, let's follow the hose up the hill and see how you mix it. Fine. It's kind let's, of fascinating up there. Let's do that. Well, Rod, uh, tell me, why is the mix coming down here dry? Well, this is the true gunner application, what we call the dry mix. We don't induce the water until we reach the nozzle. That way we can put the material through the holes over great distances. And how long can you can you go from here? This particular uh, setup is going to be about 150 feet, but we can go up to over 300 feet. How about that? That's incredible. We'll take now, a look uh, at the mix here. Yeah. Now, um, what do you put in the mix? What this is, is this is a very coarse concrete sand. And this is mixed with the Portland cement. And it's not, we do not induce any water until, until we actually reach the nozzle. And this way we keep the material very dry. It gives it a very low water to cement ratio, and it's an extremely strong and flexible concrete. So the man at the end is the fellow that regulates He the controls the uh, amount of water in the nozzle, and uh, we can actually be walking on the floor of this pool within five minutes after we shoot it. That's great. Now, tell me something about how the apparatus here puts it together. All right, this is a standard gunite rig. It's a high production gunite rig. We put the material in the back mixer. It gets its first mix. Materials transfer it to the top. Mm -hmm. That's your second mixer, a holding chamber. Right up, right up in here. Right. Okay. Here we induce pressure into the rig. This is your uh, uh, top chamber, your bottom chamber. It goes through a series of five mixes. We have a 750 cubic foot per minute compressor. Well, that's an incredible machine. Look at the size of that. Yep. Okay. And yep. all that air comes in through this hose and exactly then into these right. chambers here. Is that right? So you've got about 120 pounds pressure in this rig. And then the, uh, you've got about 100 pounds of pressure up right at the nozzle. Tremendous. Let's start it up and see how it works. Okay.
Well, I really see the advantage of the uh, dry mix here. Well, you can see, Tom, that we can hang these walls without any interior support to them so that we can actually, in a swimming pool, uh, bring this up to at least eight feet uh, in height. And uh, what they're doing now is they're finishing off the uh, uh, gun. You can actually sculpture it. And that's the advantage, of course, of the dry mix. Now, what, do you, what is the final step now after this is all, uh, all done, this, the sculpting and the finishing, the troweling is finished? Well, our final step will be to put an interior coat on this pool because uh, gunite or any concrete acts like a sponge. It'll absorb a lot of water. So we'll waterproof this, and this will be done in a couple of weeks' time. You'll do that with a, with a plaster. We'll we're going to use the dark a, plaster here. We're going to use the black plaster so it mm -hmm. makes it very natural looking. Very good. Okay, well, we look forward to seeing this finish. One thing you know that we're going to do here is the crowning glory is to take our uh, granite water sculpture here, which will be a, uh, a uh, waterfall. The water will come up and fall over the edges, and then uh, when it's not in, in operation, it'll make a wonderful bird bath, don't you think? It's going to make a nice finishing touch. Thanks for coming, Rod. Thank you, Tom. How's it going to fit? Huh? Oh, I think it'll fit pretty good. You know, Norm, you guys did such a terrific job of getting all this construction done on time. How come the decks and balconies were not completed? Well, Bob, you know, the weather's been a little bit against us. But other than that, these decks were designed to carry heavy traffic because it'll be open to the public. So mm -hmm. they have steel as the superstructure. Mm -hmm. And the other reason for the steel was that there was the, we didn't want any columns going down yeah, to they're the just grade level. So they're all cantilevered. And what that does is you've got a system of a wooden finish deck and a steel superstructure, so you have all kinds of problems trying to make the two connections. They're two difficult materials to use together. That's right. So what we've had to do is find a way to, to fasten these timbers to the steel using lag bolts and through bolts and a lot of drilling and bolting together. Mm -hmm. What about this area over here, which and is literally the roof over our great room downstairs? That's right. This is over the lower level. and. You know, we didn't want to put the wood right onto the rubber membrane roof because that might wear it away. Mm -hmm. So what we've done is cemented some smaller strips of rubber to the bottom of these uh, tapered sleepers, and they'll just basically sit on here and be held down by gravity and the weight of the deck. Mm -hmm. So there's problems all the way around. Yeah. The actual surface of all this will be the same pressure-treated wood, be right? Two by six pressure-treated. Well, in a few weeks, I suppose it'll look beautiful. You sure. know, one thing, we finally got the sunshine. The spring is finally up here. And if you look up on our roof, one thing that's very reassuring is that all those PV collectors are actually generating a little electricity for us. Earlier this week, I talked with Mr. Weekman, who gave us a tour of his plant not too long ago. But he came back here to look at how the PV system was working. Bob, it looks like we're producing about uh, 1,600 watts of power right now, which isn't bad for a late afternoon in March. That's terrific. Hey, before we talk about this, give us a rundown about the gadgetry here on the, on the garage wall. Okay. This is an inverter, which we take the power off the array, which is DC power, direct current, and convert it to alternating current, or AC. Mm -hmm. And that's needed to run the appliances in the house. Right. And then what's this over here? This is just a junction box in which we bring down the power from the array so we can get access to it for our test equipment right You've here. You've tapped it. And what, just what is this blue box well, down here? This is called a curve tracer. It enables us to measure the performance of the array. And then we can take that, that data and store it and plot it here on this small portable computer we brought along with us. So you can show us how we were doing at high noon today. Yeah, Paul can bring up what the performance was today when it, when it was really 90% of what we'd expect. We're plotting here, uh, Bob, the same kind of graph we showed you earlier back at the company of amps versus volts. And this enables us to see what the actual power was. We can see here we're producing about 3,800 watts today at high noon. Which means that we were actually using less than that. Yeah, I'd say with all of your TV equipment and all the power in the house, we were, we were actually being able to sell a fair amount of that power to Boston Edison today. Fantastic. Let's talk for a minute about the, the lifetime uh, of this equipment that we've got on our roof. Well, Bob, we really don't know how long it'll last because we've only had experience now on homes for about three years. But mm -hmm. on, the, on the homes we've done, we've measured no loss of performance. So we think it, it's a good chance these panels could last as long as this house lasts. Fantastic. Well, thank you, Ray. Well, Faith, let's see what you've done to decorate the brand new, this old house. What about the vestibule here? The vestibule, Bob, we kept very simple and understated. It's a place to receive guests. We provided a steel set tee to place a bag or a book desk. Mm -hmm. uh, and the warm cushion, the color of it, and the painting just bring in life. The real emphasis, Bob, from this low-key space is to walk into the drama of the 
main entrance. So this is intentionally understated. Yes, it is. And this is intentionally dramatic. Yeah. <laughs> of course, you started out with some dramatic architecture. We have a here. lot of uh, architecture, the stair rail, the wall, the high ceiling. Um, but we wanted to soften it, so we brought in country French furniture. Nice curved chairs, mm -hmm. yeah. A uh, glass and brass dining table, very contemporary. Uh, Flemish chandelier, but big in scale. Very big in scale. Now, what's the idea of mixing the different size pieces here? Well, here we wanted to carry your eye upward. It's a big space. Mm -hmm. and behind you, Bob, we have a large buffet decor for serving. Yeah, that's about eight feet tall. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then up here, floor to ceiling, Verisol blinds. Verisol. These blinds are new on the market. They keep the heat in and Winter, winter and out in the summer. Mm -hmm. Oh, I see John Moriarty finished this detail. We put in a railing here, but we put in safety glass so that you can still see through, mm -hmm. but still not fall down into, like the, into the lower area. Tell me about the rug that you've chosen for the dining area. This is a Chinese friendship rug. The medallion pattern, which you see in the center and around the border. These circular decorative the, affairs, yeah. Yes, it's all wool and handmade in, in China. Beautiful. The art is very, very... Oh, Eye-catching. How do you go about choosing art? Well, here we went to the Boston Fine Arts Gallery and chose a diptych, which is two pieces, but it's one painting to be it's hung It's one work of art. One work of art. Well, it really draws you right over to the railing it carries here. you and so that you can look right down in, with the uh, overhang here into our living room. Mm -hmm. The living room is almost part of the dining area up here, even though okay. it's at two different levels. The scale of it from up here is really interesting, though. Let's go it down there. It looks small, but when you see it, it'll be very warm. Let's go down there. This is nice, too. Mm -hmm. Serving piece. We roll this anywhere you want. Right, roll it right into the kitchen. And none of these things are antiques, like this, this piece over here. No, all reproductions, lacquered box, could be a great place to store the mail. It's a wooden box with lacquer uh, lacquer painted. Lacquer finish, yeah. yes. Very nice. Another marble server could be mm -hmm. used for entertaining. Mm -hmm. Let's go downstairs. When you dealt with our great room, as we were calling it down here, the living room, what were the problems you encountered in terms of figuring out how to furnish it? Well, our first problem were the elements. We have a tile floor, and a lot, lot of it, uh, large plaster walls, big walls, space, big window space. Lots of, this? lots of glass. Yeah. Lots of glass. Can you imagine this at night? Yes, a lot of black reflection and so Exactly. Forth. So we warmed it up with our vertical blinds, wide vane, wooden shutters. You can adjust the shutter for any kind of light that you'd want. Mm -hmm. You can open the doors. Uh, completely if you'd like. Yeah. But it's a nice, warm element and very architectural statement. Mm -hmm. What about the choice of furnishings? For example, this is a very interesting grouping here. We chose a mixture of contemporary and traditional furniture. This is a glass game table. All, All glass. Glass, huh? glass base, glass top. We blended it with a warm country French chair, wood carving on the back of the chair. Mm -hmm. People identify with the warmth of old uh, style pieces. But they're not antiques. Let's, nope. let's talk about these here, furnishings over here. We've provided a, a c contemporary sectional. Ah, uh, oh, extremely comfortable. <laughs> yeah. And again, glass, another, another glass table. Glass dining table because we have a beautiful French um, Baccara, machine made French area rug underneath, and we want to be able to see right through to it. So this is not an expensive oriental rug. No, it's, it's not. Machine very made. reasonable. Very, very nice. Tell me about things like these little tables. I mean, this, this looks like a, an antique empire style. No, it is a reproduction. Mm -hmm. Notice the, the ball feet. Beautiful. <laughs> and what about the, the bureau that was back there? Uh, Another reproduction really? uh, with the marble top. Piece. Real marble. Real marble. Beautiful. It's, again, empire style, isn't yes, it? Yes, it is. Oh, you've, done, you've set yes. up the bar for we've us, set up too. the bar for some glassware. Uh, we provided a, a tray here with some color, but also a tray for serving. Ha, huh, terrific. Now, Faye, what have you done in my favorite little room, the library? The library. Here? This is <clears throat> the private, secluded little ah. warm... Private space versus the public space, which we have in the living room. So here the, you start with different givens. Over there you've got huge scale and you've got lots of white walls and hard yes. surfaces. Here you've got A warm. lot of intimacy in this mm -hmm. room mm -hmm. for collections and the bookcases, books, reading, a place where someone can retreat mm -hmm. and really feel very private. Trophies and so forth. <laughs> yes. Yes. Small scale furniture. Small scale, but neutral in color. Uh -huh. <laughs> well, the red kind of brings everything to life mm -hmm. down here. Another important mm -hmm. And then and into the sun space. 
a nice little bistro table and chairs to enjoy a drink, relax, and enjoy the sunshine. Beautiful. It's terrific. You know, i got to tell you about the, the, the paneling in mm -hmm. this library. This is not something that you just go out and buy. Actually, this is all this all came in as raw lumber. And my friend John Moriarty, a master craftsman, and a couple of other gentlemen worked on this for about two weeks to get it looking the way it's looking right now. Why don't we take a look at a visit I paid him last week? John, how do you get started on a complicated job like this? Well, it starts, uh, if you remember, with a, a little discussion about what you're going to want to see here, mm -hmm. type of wood and various things. Yeah, like we decided sort of on oak and we decided on recessed panels exactly and the right. book wall behind you and so forth. And it's, it starts when we come in, we do a layout on a mm -hmm. stick and take it back to the shop where we start some work ahead of time, mm -hmm. working on uh, milling up various pieces of wood mm -hmm. and doing uh, case work and whatnot. At the same time that's going on, we come into the room and of course there's a lot of block in this house. When we got here, we saw a block like this. Concrete block walls. Exactly. Yeah. And we wanted to uh, get it ready for the wood, uh, woodwork to go on. We can't uh, deal right with this. So we put strapping on here, which you see here, it's a heavy uh, strapping for mm -hmm. a good nail base. We got it all nice and plumb. And after that was up, we put some plywood, four by eight sheets of uh, heavy nailing base plywood. Mm -hmm. Half inch? Uh, half inch, exactly. Yeah. All the way around wherever there was concrete block. All the walls. Right. With this in place, we started with a finish. And the first thing we did was to take a quarter inch veneer ply of a high grade red oak and uh, place that over the base plywood. And that essentially is the field that we work on. That's right. That's Why didn't you just use three quarter inch oak plywood? Well, we found we could save a little money, uh -huh. basically, by doing it this way. The three-quarter inch oak plywood was uh, about a dollar a foot more. Okay. Saved a little well, let's, let's look at the walls over here and talk about how you, how you build the system. Well, first thing is to put up, as I say, the plywood over any area that's going to have this panel treatment mm -hmm. on it. And how is it attached? It's attached by nails, which are go around the field, and nails in the middle, which are in any area that is going to be covered later. And then, uh, in addition to the nails, we put a uh, panel, adhesive, panel adhesive, which gives it a good uh -huh. solid feeling. Okay, so it won't buckle or anything. Then what? Well, it's a step-by-step -step process. It's rather uh, complicated, but uh, uh, to break it down to the beginning, we'd start with this piece here called the bottom rail. Mm -hmm. and that's put on. It's made level. And uh, following that piece, we have these called styles, which are pre-cut uh -huh. for the given length that we need. And they're assembled wherever they're going to go according to our layout, including over all these joints. Here, for example, is a style which we see with pre-drilled holes in it. Uh, and uh, this goes up on this uh, joint like this. And hides it right exactly. there. Exactly. Okay. There's also a top rail, which you can see up here, which comes down on top of these joints. And then the final part of this work consists of these mid rails which are shown right here, mm -hmm. and divide up the field into two different panels. So all the horizontal pieces are called rails and the vertical pieces are called styles. That's right. And then what's the next step? Uh, the next step is to go around each one of these openings or these panels with a molding. Mm -hmm. uh, this is an example of it right here. It's a rabbited panel molding, and this is the rabbit the right rabbit. here. Yeah. That's a groove which is made to the same uh, thickness of this wood. Now, this is not an item that you could go out and buy. You no, had, this has to be made. You made this it's up a, in your shop. Exactly. Don't you go crazy cutting all the miters for all these corners? There's a lot of work involved in that, but it can be simplified a little bit by jigs, which we bring onto the job. Say, for example, this one right here. Show us. This is uh, called a miter board, and it, all it does is it cuts 45 and 90 degree cuts, but it does a real good job, in it, and it's fast. Mm -hmm. It's also easy to see. There's a cut, and they fit together like that. Of course, sometimes they have to be adjusted a little bit. A little that's bit, the, but... Uh, that's the idea. Wonderful. And there's an example of the finished product. Yes, you've got one recessed panel already in place. Exactly. Here. Beautiful. The molding around it. Now, tell me, what's the transition between the, the walls and the ceiling out there? Well, at the top of the uh, room, typically, there's a cornice, and what we have here is a built-up cornice made up of about uh, four or five different pieces. And here are the How do they fit moldings. together? Well, here are the different moldings and, and uh, pieces that go on. And Why don't you up. show me up there which ones go sure. on first? This, this piece here is the first one to go on. It's called the soffit. And uh, it goes onto the blocking system, which is put around the room. Mm -hmm. And over the soffit goes this little piece here called a fascia with a groove. 
fits right in there like that. And then finally, in your hand here, you have the last piece, which is an OG or a crown, and that goes up like that, and they all get nailed up. And the last thing is a piece that goes under like that, called a freeze. A freeze board, yeah. That's right. And right over there behind you is a section that we started on and assembled, and you can get an idea of the proportions of the, the whole system. Now, what about these cabinets at the other end, though? You didn't make these up on site. No, they were made in the shop. They're and beautiful. Thank you. So you've got basically a drawer and door unit. That's right, drawer and door. And you even put, this is called beading. That's called beadwork, and that's broken around every uh, opening, including the doors mm -hmm. and the drawers both. Mm -hmm. These are sort of a raised panel drawer and then a recessed panel with a mold on it for the door. Wonderful. And then, of course, the top of the unit will have shelves, shelves for books and for so books, forth. Right. What's the finish that we're going to put on the oak? Well, in this entire room, it does require a good finish because it is a good quality uh, wood and it needs protection. Mm -hmm. And what we're probably going to do here first is to come by and give it a stain. We'll mix up a stain mm -hmm. that will uh, maybe just give it a bit of a red color to complement the uh, color in the oak itself. And also provide uniformity. That's right. Yeah. And then after filling the holes and the imperfections, we'll give it probably several coats of a hand rubbed finish like a tongue oil. Tongue oil. Yeah. From the tongue tree. That's right. Right. That'd be beautiful. Let's talk a minute about cost. We're looking at a very complicated and elaborate paneling job. It is relatively costly. Mm -hmm. uh, the stock, mainly which was plywood and solid quartered oak in this room, mm -hmm. came about $1,800 for a room that's about 12 by 16. And how much labor is it going to take? Well, it took about two weeks, two and a half weeks to prepare things in the shop, which included these bookcases, mm -hmm. and then the work here, the moldings and whatnot. And then it's going to take maybe another uh, two weeks to put it in. That's for two men. All that's four. for two men. Right. So there's about four to five weeks for two men, including the finish. So it would be more like this. 10 weeks if one man, one master craftsman were doing That's it all right. by himself. So 10 weeks times four or $500 a week, we're at looking least, at four yeah. or $5,000 for labor. It is expensive, yes. Yeah, still not as expensive as the factory-made cabinets that are That's going right. into the kitchen. And a large part of it can be done right here on the job yeah. also. Beautiful. I'll let you get back to work. Thank Thanks you. a lot, John. Bye. Bob, the workmanship in the library is wonderful. Wait till you see the workmanship in here in the master bedroom. Look at the travertine we put on this fireplace wall. The travertine is lovely. This is where we took our inspiration for the master bedroom. All the colors are monochromatic, coming off of the marble. Mm -hmm. The carpet, the wall color. We've introduced a mauve chair and ottoman for mm -hmm. relaxation. Still very subtle. Tell me about mm -hmm. the bed over here. The bed is a French import, a sleigh bed, mm -hmm. placed on the angles to, for advantage of watching the fireplace and also the outdoors. Mm -hmm. And what about the, the patio doors, the window treatments over here? What did you do? Here we've introduced window quilts. Over two sliding glass doors, very mm -hmm. simple. Mm -hmm. Uh, the main thing is that they save on energy costs because exactly. they'll keep the heat loss at a minimum. Exactly. And you don't really need draw drapes because no. they give you privacy. No, you don't. What have you done in the dressing area? There really wasn't too much to do in the master dressing area except give a sense of a few accessories someone might be using here. Mm -hmm. Add a plant, a flowering plant because of the skylight, yeah. and dress up the whirlpool. Looks very nice in there with all the uh, seashells and the plants. Yeah. Let's go see what you did in the kitchen. Okay, wonderful. Terrific. Looks like somebody's already living in here. That's right, Bob. This is the kitchen family room, the heart of the home. We've accessorized it typically uh, for a lived-in look. Mm -hmm. over but over here, here hmm. Over here, we've taken up on the natural materials. Mm -hmm. Rattan furniture, dining chairs. Bamboo under the table. Bamboo. Uh, wicker sectional with Haitian cotton, mm -hmm. keeping everything light and lively and cheerful. Mm -hmm. This is a wall unit, entertainment wall unit to house a television, a stereo, your books, anything. Everything you want. So you exactly. can actually sit in that sectional, enjoy TV or the view out the window, or just talk with everybody in the room. Great. Faye, you've done a marvelous job for us. I really want to thank you. We could have never done this to the, to thank the house you. without your help. We enjoyed it. I have to thank also my associate, Tony Lucchino, uh, who's worked exceptionally hard to achieve all this in a few days. Well, you've done a terrific job. If all of you are wondering what's going to happen to the all new this old house in the next few months, Take a look at this. Carl Gustin is going to tell us all about it. Well, Bob, we've built this house as both a demonstration project of energy systems that are available to us today, as well as a laboratory so that we can look to the future and test some of these systems like photovoltaics, understand how they work and uh, how they might fit into our system. Mm -hmm. Our plans now are to uh, open this house uh, this June, 1984, uh, for as long as people are interested in coming to view it. Mm -hmm. 
and give them the opportunity to come through, see the conservation systems, the super insulation, the sun space, the windows that you've shown on the show over these recent months, uh, and to look at things like the photovoltaics. These are important because they help uh, or can potentially help reduce our dependence on other sources such as foreign oil. So there are a lot of things in this house uh, that are important to us, that can be important to our customers, and can be important to future energy users. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you, Carl. It's been terrific working with you. It's been a pleasure working with you, Bob. 26 weeks are coming to an end. I want to take this opportunity to thank also all the people who have made the construction of this house possible. All the carpenters, all the tradespeople, the man behind the lens, Dick Holden, our producer, Russ Marash, all the PBS stations around the country who show the program, and very special thanks to Owens Corning Fiberglass. I hope you'll be tuning in to PBS stations during the next few months because there's a very good chance that we'll bump into you again. Till we do, I'm Bob Vila for This Old House. The all-new This Old House is made possible by a grant from... ...about it. The balance of the facade is very nice. The three windows on the top, the two windows on the first floor flanking our entry door, and the entry door itself, which is wonderful, with octagonal panels in bad disrepair, but fan lights on other, either side of the entrance and a transom light over it, and these heavy moldings around the entire opening, and these wonderful granite steps, solid chunks of granite that were probably quarried right here in Massachusetts 150 years ago when the place was new. It kind of saddens you to see many of the things that have happened. Why, for, God, for instance, did they put in this brick path which they didn't bother to set down in the grade and now it comes just almost to the top of this second step so that somebody could trip there and why did they put this screen storm door on this beautiful greek entryway which has this rather ugly detail and why did they put plexiglass which has faded and darkened over the last few years on top of our side lights and on and on, there's lots of little things that we can take care of, and we will take care of them. For instance, really, uh, an imitation colonial lantern doesn't go very well with the style of a Greek revival house. We'll get into that. There's lots to show you, and there's more to look at on this side facade. Come over this way. Getting through here is kind of like a trip through the forest, but this is kind of nice. This is the north side of the property, I guess, yeah. And we, this could make a beautiful little side garden because it's big enough and there's, there's still kind of the remnants of a flower garden here and old stone wall around here, lots of space. I think we could really do something from the point of view of landscaping. When you look at this north facade of the house, it's kind of surprising that it's in such good shape. The paint even is in good condition. Of course, we've got these wonderful windows, the same as the ones on the front, that just don't look like they're 130 years old. The original molding's in good shape. Look at the thickness of this windowsill, or stool. It's probably made out of oak. It's been some paint that's obviously peeling and it needs some repair. I like these little details. It's an unusual detail, the little bracket under each windowsill. And then, of course, with a house that's built like this, and you've got a good granite foundation that's kept this board, which is called the water table, well away from the dirt. You don't have to worry about rot. Of course, you do usually worry about it with old cellar windows like these, and they're always a pain in the neck to have to repair. That'll be a problem. Well, let's walk around this corner and see what we've got. This would be the back side of the house. And this, I know, is not a back door. It's an entry to a staircase that leads to upstairs rooms, which were converted a while back into an income-producing apartment. And boy, that's a real good thing to have when you're talking about living in a big old house like this that costs a lot to heat, etc. This is the wing, or the L, that probably was added when the house was already 30 or 40 years old. And it would worry me a little bit. It's a different style of construction, kind of. It sits closer to the ground. The siding, in general, doesn't look to be in such great shape, even though it's not as old as the siding on the front of the house. These clabbers look to have a few cracks. And this is the kind of thing that would worry me, where the building was put down so close to the ground, the old water table right here is practically in the dirt. And, well, it's kind of a candidate for a lot of rot and bugs to be living there. We'll talk with Norman about this whole problem a little bit later on. Now, back here, we've got a garden approach to the back street, because this lot goes all the way from the busy street all the way back here. 
Now, up here is a different matter altogether. This is really a quiet residential street. It was probably at one time orchards back here behind the farmhouse. But now, no traffic. What a contrast to that busy street where we started. And of course, it gives you the chance to park your cars back here, and not have to worry about all the traffic over there, and to enter the house from this corner of the lot. Also to enter the apartment at that back door over there. And I bet you landscaping could be very, very exciting here around this shade tree. I think it's an ash. The more I look at this L, the more I worry about it, because I, I just don't like any building that sits that low to the ground. This garage was probably built 30, 40 years ago. It's good and solid. It's even got kind of the same style as the house plastered on the inside, but I just wonder about it. It seems a little bit too small for a, a normal sized car. Most people have two cars nowadays anyway. Now this would be the other corner of the lot, and there's really a lot of vegetation that's overgrown here, but we continue to find stone walls everywhere we look at. And of course, I'm on driveway now, and if you look down in that direction, we've got about 100 feet of blacktop that comes all the way to this corner curves around to get into that garage. I'm not too sure about how well that works. It doesn't seem like a very good plan. The garage itself has a very interesting slate roof on it. They've scalloped all the corners of it, and it looks to be really in good condition. Not sure I can say the same thing for the, uh, the slate roof that's on the L. It seems to be cracked and broken in many, many different places. This, this whole area is kind of exciting. There's, there's uh, all sorts of different traffic patterns that probably happen here because you'd want you'd, the bulkhead entrance to the cellar is here, then windows to the L, a door into the kitchen part of the L over there. I think there's, there's uh, the possibility of making a lot of improvements here, although one of them would probably be to get rid of the, the uh, sunroof that's been put up here, especially since the wood seems to be rotten there. Now we're looking at the south side of the main house here. And one thing that I do want to point out is these oversized eaves or overhangs, which are really great to have. You practically don't need any gutters, and they do protect the house itself from rain and snow. Although, I can see just looking up at the planchard boards, the bottom of the eave on this section, that they're going to require a good deal of repair. Not so this main facade here. It's in pretty good shape. The windows are solid as can be all around this house. Probably a hundred years ago, they planted a little bush here, and it's become a giant uh, hemlock, so we're probably going to have to do something about removing it. Anyway, let's go inside and take a look at our main rooms. I like old houses. Look at the detail all around this entry door. The, the glass on the transom light is probably original to 1850. It's what's called acid etched glass, where they had a, an acid process as a finish on the glass, and you end up with these little stars that are clear, the rest of it is opaque. I'm not sure what happened on the side lights. I imagine enough of them broke during the decades that they were all replaced at one point with this fuzzy glass that doesn't really look right. But here you've got a main hall that was, you know, the, the farmer who lived here wanted to impress everybody, and look at the sweep of staircase he put in. Kind of a free-flowing, flying staircase with this lovely walnut, I'd say, handrail, ending up in this curl, which is really called a volute. And it repeats itself again on the first tread back here. It's a super staircase, and it just floats free all the way up to the second landing. You can walk right in underneath it, and there's no walls or anything. And plaster cornice work, they spend a few bucks on that. Not only that, but they didn't end it up there. They carry it all the way under the staircase, so that when you walked in the front door, you wouldn't, uh, you wouldn't see an end to it. You'd just see it flow right into it. This would have been a front parlor in here, and I, I love the sense of space in it. It's not a huge room, but for one thing, these windows, these tall, well, it's missing here, but these tall windows really give you a sense of being in a much larger room than, than you're in. Here's the one that goes there. I guess we'll have to do a little fixing up. I don't know what happened on this wall. Well, a closet's been added. 
And this at one time was one door. It got cut down the middle and turned into two doors. I'm not sure how good it is to have a little closet there. Fake. Cardboard. Yeah, it's interesting. Not only is it fake, but it got painted white. And then, of course, there's got to be a real chimney in behind it because this wood-burning stove, which is kind of interesting, was hooked up there. I'd say it's a replica. And I'd say somebody could get in a lot of trouble by just setting it down on a piece of particle board like that. That's a problem. This must have always been the dining room in here. Similar size, similar sense of space. Again, just two windows, but same height. Let's, let's make a note here that so far, all the windows we've seen have a similar trim detail. Just one piece of mill bought uh, molding attached at the header. And that's all the decoration they received. The ceiling in here does not inspire much confidence. It looks like someone added these false beams at some point. The plaster itself doesn't look too great. Let's go back through the main hall towards the rear of the house. What we're going to do here is enter the L. At this point, we're walking into the L. And immediately, you sense a different proportion, a different space. The ceiling's lower. But it's obviously been lived in until recently. The gas stove is relatively new. The cabinets, I'm not too sure about. They're knotty pine doors, plastic, and then some store-bought that really doesn't match anything else. It's kind of unusual. And I'm not sure what's happened here. An archaeologist would have a little bit of fun. It looks like the original lath and plaster is back here. And then they filled it in with some boards and some two-by-threes and added this knotty pine, which is not, not exactly very structurally sound. Neither is the ceiling. Oops. But anyway, let's see what we've got back in here. A pantry, that's good. This was always probably the kitchen. Here's the tip-off. This old brick hearth has probably been here since they first built the L. But then, in more recent days, somebody has come along and built themselves a raised hearth and actually installed one of these glass screens or attempted to install it. I'm not sure what this is doing here, a 4x4. Four four. And when it sounds like that, it usually has, has some weight on top of it. So I think we better consult with Norm before we do anything serious there. The floors in the kitchen are two or three different varieties. This is the entryway, the back entry. And you got to watch your step here. For some reason, there's a little four-inch step there. Boy, I'll tell you. That could be very dangerous. This room probably was used as a den until just very recently, or a little home office. C closet in here with no door on it, and maybe another closet, or a water closet. Half bathroom in there. Kind of a mean space, no windows in there. Tight in here. Let's go to the last room we haven't looked at on the ground floor. That's a surprise. OK, going back into the main part of the house, what a difference in feeling. I could either go into this room through the front or through this little opening here. And wow, a ballroom practically. Not what you would expect to find in a farmhouse. It's, it feels bigger than it actually is. I think it's probably about 24 by maybe 13 or 14. But the ceiling height and the proportions, and again, the windows. This is an 1850 room that is really well, well spaced, well designed, well thought out. The only thing that's confusing to me is that this wall seems to be too close to this window in the corner. That would be uh, illogical in their thinking. But and I already know that there's a door behind me here that I was showing you outside, which is the staircase leading up to the apartment. So I bet at some point this wall was moved in. Another tip off that there's been renovations. This door, I bet, was never here originally because this clearly indicates there was a fireplace here. I can even see the outline of the moldings. And of course, the dead giveaway is the tile on the floor. They would have never put a door and a casing right next to a firebox. Anyway, we'll study this room in depth at some other point. Let's go upstairs now. Although the staircase gives you the impression of being luxuriously wide, it's not. Probably less than 30 inches here. And that's one of the reasons they built in this niche, which is actually a coffin corner. They would have funerals right in the house in the 1850s. And they'd have to bring the coffin right up and right back down through this narrow staircase, and they could fit the corner of it into there and get it out. 
but let's talk about the house and not funerals. This is a key hall right on the second floor. And I imagine this has been used as a master bedroom until recently. And they've actually installed a little lavatory here. I'm not sure what the logic is of having it open right onto the room. It's a good amount of closet space, but it, it's lacking in doors. I would think that'd be a problem. Let's see what's down towards the end of the hall. This, this is a neat little detail, this door. Uh, with panes of glass at the top, that was meant to allow light from the front hall to get right into this back hall. And that's the original class, I'm sure. This is a pleasant room, about the same size. Two windows, it's in a corner location of the house. This would be southeast. So it's a, it's a nice location for a bedroom. I'm not sure what to say about the ceiling that we find up here. It's a cardboard ceiling that doesn't really look terrific in a, in a renovated house. It does have some pretty good closet space, about four bedrooms. Anyway, let's keep, go keep going down the dark hallway over here and see what we find. This would be entering the L. And all of a sudden, the space gets kind of tight and cramped. And, you know, you can bump your head really easily. Either somebody did that, or more likely, we've had water coming through here recently. Just, uh, gosh, better leave it alone. Um, it's a very confusing space, the way it's been chopped up into pieces. I imagine this at the rear end is meant to be a bed bedroom. They had some knotty pine left over from the kitchen, I bet. And they've done a really terrible job of putting up homosote panels, cardboard panels, badly installed. Then in through here seems to be an attempt at, at a closet with a sink next to it. And you go through another set of doorways, kind of, and all you have here is a toilet. We still haven't found an adequate bathroom, but it better be around here. This space probably had a laundry installed in it not too long ago. There's hot and cold piping there. And yeah, this is a full bathroom. The floor squeaks a little bit. The walls don't look terribly good. And of course, there's not much space. In the hole, I'd say it was maybe four and a half feet wide or thereabouts. And you don't really have any headroom. Bump your head anywhere you go. But it is the only full bathroom up here. Well, we've seen what there is, except for the apartment. So let's go back towards the front and take a look at that. Now, this entry over here is one of two separate entries into the apartment. Formerly, this was one of the bedrooms. Now, it's the living space, the living room. And it's already been kind of replastered and painted white and cleaned up. The ceiling's in good shape. The window trim is nice. The windows themselves are tight. They just need to be washed, I suppose. I think the only thing that I would consider doing in, in this space is something about this funny arch that's a little bit too wide and a little bit, well, it's cardboard, I think. Anyhow, in this part of the apartment, we have a full staircase that comes up. And of course, it leads to the door that we were showing you on the back part of the house earlier. So that whoever lives in the apartment never has to disturb the people living in the main part of the house. They come right into a dining, eat-in kitchen, I suppose you'd call it probably remodeled about 20 years ago. The ceramic tile on the counter is still in good shape, but this looks like it could use some work. And of course, one thing that I really never like to do is to put a sink up against a window that keeps on going down behind the cabinet, because that's just one natural place to collect uh, water and dust and so forth. And the other thing that I kind of feel badly about is this vinyl asbestos tile that's been laid down right over the old floorboards. And I'm not sure what you could do about that now, because they've been glued down. Anyway, it works fine as a, as a small kitchen for a small apartment. As I understand it, there's a couple of bedrooms upstairs. Let's, let's see what we've got up there. I would think, yeah, I would think this third floor was always a finished third floor and not an attic. Imagine even back in the 1800s they were living up here. But it looks like recently somebody's been doing some work. I can see there's new wallboard that's been put up here. And this is a brand new skylight that's already been installed. So we're way ahead of the game up here with the rental apartment. Let's take a look in here in the bedroom. Well, this is one of two bedrooms that certainly would not be my favorite, because guess what's under here? A chimney right smack in the middle of the room. It's not the end of the world. I mean, you could use this as a kid's room, and you could maybe put a skylight in it, or you could use it as a den combination study and guest room. 
And for an apartment this size, this is a huge bathroom. And again, new ceramic tile on the floor, on the walls, and new bathroom fixtures. So we won't have to do too much up here. Maybe just replaster and repaint. It looks like it has a few cracks here and there. It's a spacious landing up here. And this is a super room. Lots of light. It looks to be about 18 by 12, I would say. And I would certainly choose this one for the master bedroom if I were to live here. The ceilings are not that high. But I'll tell you one thing, I bet there's a lot of insulation that's already been put up because it is in the 80s outside today and it feels nice and cool here. And the windows, are, again, have been uh, redone, so it's in, not in bad shape. One point I wanted to make before we left this apartment is that nowadays with the cost of paying mortgages on a property like this, not to mention uh, heating fuel, oil or gas or whatever, it really helps to have an apartment that will bring in several hundred dollars a month in rent to offset all those costs. But I'm anxious to go outside because I'm looking out the window and Norm is down there by the addition, busy as can be digging a hole trying to check what our sills look like. Let's go out. Let's go down and look. Hi, Norm. Hey, Bob. What do you think of this old place? Oh, Bob, the, uh, it's great. The main house is probably one of the best ones I've seen in a long time structurally. Good and sturdy, isn't it? But this L uh, has me a little bit worried. You too? Well, yeah. I was hoping you'd do more than worry and tell me what to do. Well, you know that in the kitchen area that's here, there's a full foundation that comes to about here. We've got a full cellar up to there. And it looks real good inside and out. But from here to there, the last 10 feet, has me a little bit worried. And some of the things that bothered me was, first of all, they put this concrete curb here around this piece of wood, which was added on. And the bad thing about that is that now all the water goes down in here and just causes it to rot out, as you can see. Is that just rot or have the ants it's been It's rot and, and insect damage. Yeah, yeah. Now the sill is huge, larger than you would see on most houses this size, and it seems to be pretty good. But I still wanted to explore further, and that was to see what kind of foundation it has in it. And let me show you what I found around the corner. Okay. The typical thing for this age is the old rubble stone foundation. No and mortar or anything? As usual, no, no mortar and a lot of loose stones and not a very good foundation. It doesn't go very deep, you mean? No, we don't think it goes very deep at all. Now, that shows some of the story out here, but to really see what the situation is, I went inside and cut a hole through the floor to see what was underneath there. Gee, I thought you'd only been here five minutes. You must have been here the last hour. In a little while. Let's take, Let's a, take look. a look. Well, Norm, if the building has such a bad foundation here on the L, how come there's no sag? I mean, this has been here for probably 100 years. That's well, probably the size of those sills, Bob. They're huge for this size of a building. They probably acted just like a beam. They didn't need that much support. Mm, gotcha. Why do you suppose we've got a three-inch step up into this little office space at the end of the L here. Well, there's a couple of reasons for that. One is they probably use that extra space to do the plumbing for that little half bath. Mm. And the other is pretty obvious here by this floor. They had put down a three-quarter inch plywood floor on some two-by-threes, and in between they had this, this insulation. So apparently this room was fairly drafty and, and cool, so they wanted to um, make it a little bit warmer, and I know it doesn't look like much, but that was probably all that was available at that time. Hmm. But the real story lies below here, and this is where we can see the total problem. As you can see, the soil here is right up against the bottom of the joist, and it's fairly damp because this space has no cross ventilation. Well, we could drill holes and ventilate the whole area. Well, that's true, but I think it'll still present a problem. And also, the joists have already undergone a lot of damage by dry rot, and there's evidence of insect damage here and there. So mm -hmm. the structure doesn't look too good. I can see it now. Blow the whole thing apart, huh? I don't even want to think about that. It's too early in the game. Listen, let's go outside and get a little fresh air. All right. I was hoping next week that I'd be able to talk a bit about the architectural plans. Jock Gifford's going to be joining me. And to tell you the truth, I thought that shortly after that we'd be able to get you and the fellows out here and get some of the work started. Well, I'd be glad to do that for you, Bob, but there's one problem. Why? I can't pull the, bu pull the building permit for this job. Well, why not? Well, in this town, I don't have a license. But you've got a license in the next town over. That's right, but it's not on it in this town. 
You even got a state's license. That's right, and that's no good either. Well, Norm, why don't you just take the test for this town and have another license? Well, that would be fine if you want to wait about six weeks. Why? Well, they only give the test once a month, and they, and they don't give it during the vacation months. They don't give it during the summer months? That's right. But that's the building season. I know. I'm starting to see a dead end here. How are we going to get around all of this? Well, one of the ways is to go down and they have a list of the licensed contractors, and we might be able to get one of them to do the structural work for us. This has got to be one of the world's greatest frog stranglers. What are we going to do? Listen, we're running out of time for today, folks. Tune in again next week for another exciting episode of This Old House. What do you mean you can't get a license in this town? This Old House is made possible by a grant from Owens Corning Fiberglass Corporation. Manufacturer. Beautiful. You've really got a great site here. It's got uh, lots of uh, problems, for sure, but it's got some good opportunities, too. And I must admit, I appreciate you calling me in now. Most clients kind of wait a little too late before they call Landscape me. Architect. Well, this is certainly the beginning. You we know, one really of the work with you to... One of the main problems I've got is this driveway, which empties out onto a busy street. And I was trying to make a left-hand turn here the other day. And there's a traffic light that gives you a breather, but normally you've got a steady stream of traffic yeah, coming through really here. Yeah, it's really treacherous. It really is. Yeah. We ought to do something about that if we can. It's I was thinking uh, if the neighbor ever lets this hedge grow out, we'd be trapped in here forever. Well, that's true, and the steepness of this driveway is also bad. In the wintertime, you could slide right out into the traffic. Yeah. Uh, one, uh, one asset, again, though, that we have that helps uh, probably cut a bit of the noise down here and some of the feeling of this busy street some of these trees. This is a silver maple here, which is a bit of a weedy tree. They grow quickly and they don't live too long. Uh -huh. But as far as I'm concerned, anything green that you can put next to the street is, is helpful. Will help to kill the noise from the traffic, And a fence, too. I mean, if we, I think it's a good idea to have a fence along here. That will also take Well, that was started by whoever was here before well, we, we got here. We might keep it there. We might move it a bit. But I think it'd be a good idea to think about a fence in mm -hmm. this area, along the, the property line here on the front. I think the property line's right around here somewhere. Now, here's the corner, yeah. I think it's pretty much in line with the telephone pole. Well, uh, you know, what I've already learned is that this neat little cottage is sitting squarely on what used to be part of our front lawn here. Yeah, it seems that way, and it's, uh, you can see it's really fairly close to the property line now. It's only 10 feet away or so. Yeah, the, so that's, their uh, garage is about 10 feet from our line. One thing that uh, I think we could possibly do, even though we have a telephone pole right here, is maybe bring that driveway entrance over to here, Bob. I think it'd make uh, a lot of sense to give you an extra couple seconds to get out before those cars come around. So it's something we ought to think about. That's think? something to consider. Now, if we walk in here, I, I wanted to show you there are a couple trees that really caught my eye. They're just gorgeous. Well, we, have, we have some lily of the valley here on the ground, too, that we could maybe dig up and say it's a dollar a clump at a nursery today. Really, all this stuff? Yeah. So and it, you can transplant it, huh? It. And then over here is a mountain ash, which, uh, which is a very pretty plant. This, this one is, uh, is doing quite well. It's got full of fruit up there, so we ought to do all we can to save that. Fortunately, it's on the corner, on the side of the property, so we could probably find a good way to save that one. Well, if we drove in with our cars over at this end, though, what's going to happen well, in the middle of Well, I pray that, this, you know, that, that we, might, uh, we might have to sacrifice uh, a tree or two in here. Now, this is a saucer magnolia, which is, again, a very pretty tree. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a little thin, though, because it has so much shade here, so it's a bit of a well, problem. Well, it's got all these bigger trees right over it. Then over here, we have probably the densest shade on the whole site. This is a Norway maple, Bob, and traditionally, you can't grow anything under a Norway maple. It's just so dense. They're so... And the roots are right up on the surface. Really? But uh, here again, I think we have an, a green asset. You know, it, it separates us from the street. Now, in the wintertime, the leaves will go away, but uh, you spend most of your time outside in the summertime, mm -hmm. so we ought to do all we can to save this one. Now, I did want to show you that... Oh, by the way, look at this dogwood. This is... Uh, I hadn't seen this before, but this is gorgeous. Look at the fruits on that. That must really be very floriferous in the floriferous in the spring. You so, mean it'll have a lot of flowers on it? Yeah, you got it. But Bob, I want you to take a look at the, the, the view we get from the house of the house, right from this location. I imagine so, at some point this was the main approach to the house, Tom, because after all, they put the front door there. 
I suppose so. Of course, we've got quite a the difference of uh, drop here. It must be eight or nine feet from the front door to where we're standing. So that would have been a lot of climbing, yeah. So it makes it a little difficult to, to make it a front. But I think it's something we certainly ought to consider in, mm -hmm. in terms of uh, bringing it back to, to the way it, it might have been. Yeah. I did want to show you the, this, uh, the way the property kind of jogs over here, Bob. It's this, uh, this It's, a, it's uh, an unusual lot, lot. yeah. yeah. So this is the uh, backyard of the cottage we were just looking at. Right, and the way it's, it's kind of cut right down into the, into the slope there, you can see, it's, it makes it a kind of awkward situation for us. It mm -hmm. cuts off kind of a left-hand side of the house. Yeah. I did want to show you the way that looks on this uh, plat plan, which shows the house Where are we the garage. Standing? We're standing right here. The green is the property line. That's our house. And we're looking back here right now. We just looked into this neighbor's uh, yeah. yard. So yeah. you can see that, it, 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 that our, the front of our house is kind of cut off as it's, a result of this little piece. It's a piece. very strange and un unfortunate yeah, situation, yeah. but that's what we've got to work with. But uh, in a couple of weeks, we're going to have a topographic plan of this, which will show us all of the topography and some of the other uh, mm -hmm. things like these old steps, which... Yeah. Uh, I they mean, don't go anywhere they anymore. Just, yeah, I know. It's, it's ridiculous. And I don't think they're original with all these curves and the red paint on them. Very strange. Now, if we walk up the front slope here, well, I noticed you know, that... One of the, Tom, one of the problems in my mind is that if you're coming out of the front of this house, you're going to be coming down here, you're going to be looking directly at a backyard. Yeah, by all, that's, that's one of the problems. I think that's something we certainly have to address. Mm -hmm. But uh, let's go and look at the way they used to come to the front door here in, in recent times. There was a brick walk that came right up from the driveway here, which... Uh, yeah, I imagine everything here was aimed at the driveway. Now, this is in pretty decent shape, and, you know, I think it's something we ought to consider saving, uh, maybe reusing the brick somewhere. Really? Um, is, okay, but do you think brick is in keeping with the, the character well, of the facade it's, uh, up here? Well, it's, it's possibly in that, in that period, yeah. I think brick was used in the 1830s and 40s. Now, what do you think wanna, about everything that's growing here? Well, it, it's kind of a shame. I mean, this is a classically beautiful facade. And yet we have all this shrubbery in front. It's a typical foundation problem. Yeah. Uh, or planting. This is a, these are Japanese yew and this big hemlock. As far as I'm concerned, they all should come out and let the house come down cleanly to the ground, let all this beautiful granite. There's no reason to hide it. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, no, and a house in 1850 wouldn't have had all these bushes planted up against it. That's right. It. Yeah. And so we ought to definitely bring that back to the way it was. Oh, I agree. It makes it easier to get to uh, some of the repairs you're going to have to do here as well. It take a lot of work to bring down those, uh, those hemlocks. Yeah, not too much trouble. Just, uh, but I did want to show you this little uh, corner around here. It's, again, we're back here in the corner of this property. It's very, very awkward. You can see we drop down here. Yeah, you can make no sense abruptly. of it, really. And uh, what do you do with a little corner know, of land Bob, like that? I think we'll, uh, that's something we're really going to have to look at. But let me go show you the rest of this uh, side yard. Tom, this is the north side of the house. Yeah, it's very shady on this side of the house, Bob, for sure, except a little bit of sun that we get here in the morning mm -hmm. coming right over on this, uh, this corner. And of course, the the views out from the house, since we're so close to the property line, are pretty obvious into the neighbor's two neighboring backyards. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. But uh, I did want to ask you what you're planning to do here, and this this is the tenant's uh, side of the house. Is that right? Well, this door leads up to a little apartment on the second and third floor. So mm -hmm. yeah, this is the approach and entrance to that apartment. Well, it seems to me that you have a very good opportunity here, especially since the, the house kind of turns in this corner to make a a little private space, a private entry, maybe a little private garden. So they could have their own yard yeah, here. Yeah, and yeah. there's a pleasant, a pleasant wall on this side to kind of end that space. And then, in fact, this is all kind of uh, converging here to a, a kind of narrow spot here. It's only about 15 feet wide to make a perfect gateway. Uh, so we could fence it right space. here and have a, a, have a gate. gate. Yeah. You yeah. know, the land continues to slope upwards yeah, all, we must have another, all the way. Another eight, seven, eight foot climb right here, Bob. Well, and we've got another street back here. Yeah. Come on up. Now, this is really a, a completely different feeling back yeah. here. It's a very quiet kind of residential it's, street. It's just the neighborhood the street. Just of, of the opposite, the just other end of the absolutely, property. Absolutely, yeah. So this is the eastern property line. What is all this stuff that's overgrown well, here? Well, there's uh, some forsythia here that's doing remarkably well under the, the shade. But uh, as we come down here further, it seems that you hardly know that this drops off as much as it does. Yeah. Uh, and here's... Here's this wisteria is coming out. Well, I was Ready to attack you. Yeah, I know. It's, it's but, quite uh, overgrown. Here's a very good perspective of the, the view down the old driveway here, Bob. And I don't much like the idea of having so much blacktop all the way from one end to the other of the lot. I blame you, especially on the south side, mm -hmm. where there's a nice, uh, nice sunlight and good garden area. Mm -hmm. But what are you going to do about parking? That's just the question, because the, the town prohibits overnight parking. Uh -huh. So that not only do I have to worry about parking for the house itself, but also for whoever lives in the apartment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, then, uh, I think one of the solutions that I've seen along here, almost everyone has a way of pulling off at nighttime. And you're the only person that doesn't. Yeah. So I, 
I think this is one very obvious way of handling it is to put a little parking tray kind of in just off the street like yeah, this they, to they accommodate can get, a car too. They can get two cars in here and it's attractive because it's been landscaped around it. I'm not sure. It would seem like a very expensive proposition. Well, it, it also takes up a lot of space. Yeah, let's, let's take, take a look, a look at the backyard. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, this sure is an awkward step coming down here. <laughs> say that again. But uh, this ash tree is really a beautiful tree. Uh, Bob, it creates an awful lot of nice shade back here. It's an ash. It's an ash tree. A lot of people feel this is sort of a weedy tree like the silver maple out front. But uh, I think this particular tree seems to be good and healthy. It's uh, got good branching. I think it's something we ought to consider saving it's going to live here a long time. Mm -hmm. Make a very nice shade garden back on this, this end of the, the yard. Don't sure you think? would. Yeah, yeah. Now, uh, one thing that kind of catches my eye here is being a little awkward. Is what? this uh, is this garage? Oh way gosh. Kind of just we don't know. On right we here. don't know what we're going to do with the garage because it's small. It's just piled on top of the house, and and it'd be really difficult to drive up and around. Yeah, it's very awkward to so get I, into it. Yeah. Well, why can, can we move it? Can we just take it and take it and move it over somewhere somehow? Where would you move it to? Well, we've got plenty of room over here. I think a lot of it depends on on just what we can do with this space. You know, we talked about the possibility of a parking tray here. So that would give us a little restriction. But uh, I think it's something we really ought to study. It's worth looking into. Well, you know, if we moved it, which I think is a neat idea, we could use it as a, as a garden shed or as a, an auxiliary, auxiliary building rather well, this, than a garage. Yeah, this is the south side of the, uh, the south exposure of the property. Yeah, and, this is uh, where we're going to do the best growing, that's for yeah, sure. Yeah, look at this mint. It's just going crazy. Mm -hmm. So if we can grow things here as well as this is growing, we'd be in good shape. But I did want to show you this uh, kind of back entry here. I think this is really going to be a key a key side of the, the south property, the way we get around the edge here and the way we transition between that space and this one. Okay. Well, Tom, what do we do next? Well, I'm waiting for the uh, ter uh, topographic survey to come back, Bob. Uh, that'll show me the differences in elevation and the house as it's positioned on the lot and all those things. And I can also begin to study the different alternatives we've talked about for parking, ways of getting to the front door, uh, and where we can put these garden spaces. Bob. A lot of homework. Okay, we'll weeks. come back we'll and back. see us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, I can hardly wait to see what Tom's plans look like. He did a terrific job with our other old houses. Now let's turn our attention inside, where earlier this week, Jock Gifford from our architectural firm surveyed the property from top to bottom. Okay, Jock, you've had the real quick tour. Now let's go slowly so we can talk about some of the things I want to do in this place. What do you think of this front hall? Oh, this uh, seems very nice. Seems very good. No problems here. Do you uh, plan to make any changes? No, no changes. The size of it is perfect. It does need quite a bit of, you know, just uh, work yeah. done in it, but other than that, that the, the, the main rooms I want to deal with are, for example, this little front parlor. It's not that huge, and what I'd like to do in here is have tons of bookshelves, so that the, it's really the feeling of a library, comfortable Good. place to sit and read, and maybe Good. a place for a desk where you can write letters and pay bills and so forth. That'd be great. Maybe we should just put the bookshelves only at about four and a half feet or so. You wouldn't want to go too high to interfere with the, the moldings that you've got here. Okay, so that we don't... Clash with the, with the window moldings. Right. All right. right. I but I that. think you could take it all the way around. It would be very nice. But what about this wall? The, you've got a closet here and a, and a chimney appears. I'd like right. to have a, a whole book wall here. Can we take the closet right out? Yeah. I don't, we don't, I, need the I don't think we need the closet. Okay. How would well, you go take, around? Take it, take it right back to the, the real wall. Just and get the, rid of the doors and everything, right? Right. Now, what, how do you feel about it? The chimney, the fireplace. Well, that, we've already got a wood-burning stove here. Right. I don't feel I can really justify taking up as much room as I would have to to put a proper hearth in here. This thing doesn't meet code right. Right. in such mm -hmm. a small room. And I don't want to go to the expense of building a fireplace. I just don't think it's justified. I don't want one. So we'll just have a room without a, a fireplace or a wood stove. And lots of books. That'll be fine. All right, That'll let's take a look nice. in here where the, where, the, where the dining room is, which is another room just about the same size. Okay. And again, it needs cosmetic repairs and so forth. The ceilings need to be fixed up because somebody's put in a lot of wood up there. But here's what I've got in mind. I, I want to build a greenhouse in, right outside there. All right. That would be connected to the kitchen space. And I was wondering how best to connect that greenhouse space with the dining room. Oh, gee, I think some nice French doors here would be wonderful. You Where'd wouldn't have doors. You wouldn't have just an opening? No, I think I'd put a door on it. All right. French doors sound like a good idea. And it wouldn't be a big big job we just cut out the bottom right. okay let's let's look in the uh the living room now this parlor jock is obviously the biggest room in the house and it's very formal with with the moldings and the kind of the symmetry around it i don't want to use it just as a, as a formal living room i want it also to be a family media center 
a place mm -hmm. to have a projection television, uh, big, really fancy stereo equipment with huge speakers, mm -hmm. and maybe electronic games and stuff like that. So I need to think about how to store things like that, and how to use, where to position them in the room, how to light the room okay. best, okay. how to keep the light out of the room when I want to use a projection TV and so forth. So what do you think? Oh, it's uh, listen, this is a great room for that. Plenty big enough. Yeah. Uh, nice, nice proportion. Uh, I guess there's a couple of things that bother me about it, though. The first one is this wall. I think this wall has been, is not original, it's been, it's been, been built in. in. What was the tip-off to you? Well, I think that uh, what makes it look funny is that we've got about two feet between the wall and the window here. Yeah. And down here, at the other end of the room, we have a lot more than that. It seems it's own, well, it's probably about, well, six feet, I should think. Yeah. At least six feet there. And it makes it, uh, the windows seem pushed down to one end. And right. I think it's, uh, if we could uh, get some symmetry here by maybe taking that wall out. A room like this would have been rigidly symmetrical. Yeah, Everything would have been so. opposite each, yeah. Now the other problem here, we got a problem with this, I think this doorway has clearly been just cut into the room. If you look at the, uh, the detailing on the molding, it's, it's not at all like the rest of the house. Right. It's, uh, this, is, this door has been added on. And I think the other thing is this is a, a bit of a mystery here, this, what appears to have been a fireplace. This is a real not. mystery, because all we've got is the outline of a, of a hearth, and uh, of a fireplace, and the hearth with the tiles on it. But if you go down to the bottom, there's no evidence of there ever having been a chimney stack built there. Mm -hmm. If you go on the other side of this wall, you find the staircase that we just came down. And that's original. And if you go through the roof, you'll find a wooden chimney up, up there that looks like it's been there for, for a long, long time. But I guess it was purely decorative. Yeah, well, I think that that's probably the answer, the fact that this was just a decorative mantle. That I'm, they trying, added. I'm trying to research that, because I'd never heard of decorative mantelpieces in the 1840s. Okay, well, it would sure be nice to have a fireplace in this room. I was going to ask you what you thought about that. Well, it, it, is, it is possible. There's two things against it. One is that it, it would be very expensive. It's, uh, the roof is a long way from here. Yeah. Uh, and the other thing is, that probably worse, is that it's going to really stick into the room. It would really we have no room from back. It would have, to, would have to be in the room. I think we're going to be forced to, to live without a fireplace, but I'd like to consider putting in a decorative one. Be, if that's, that's what they had there point. originally. Okay, well the other thing we should look at, really maybe take a closer look at, is this possibility of getting rid of this wall. Can we see what's on the I'll other side of it? I'll show you if you don't mind jumping out the window with me. Okay. Jock, that wall's right around here, so here's about the four feet that we'd gain if we, if we tore the that'd wall be down. Good. That'd be good, but what's in here? Well, this is the entry hall to our apartment up there. And the uh -huh. staircase, as you see, just winds and goes straight up. Okay. So, but the only real problem with taking that wall out then would be relocating the stairway somewhere. I guess, but where do we relocate it? Well, let me think about that. I can, we could put a stairway up on the outside or maybe put one inside there. Let, let me think about that. Okay. Why don't we just go up these steps and I'll show you the master bedroom again. Okay, good. Jock, the staircase comes right into the eat-in kitchen. And then up on the third floor, we've got two bedrooms and a bath. It would be nice if we could have the whole apartment contained on the third floor, but it's just not big enough up there. So we've had to, we, they've had to have two rooms from the second floor together with it. And it doesn't really bother me much because one way to be able to restore an old house is to have it, part of it out rented, producing some income for you to help pay the bills. And another part of the logic is that today's families, lots of them are smaller and you just don't need a four or five bedroom house. So our Thoughts are not to disturb this apartment, kind of just to leave it as is and maybe clean it up and paint it a bit. Okay, well that makes perfect sense. I think the only, the only change I see is maybe uh, if we have to move the stairway, that there'll be some minor, you know, some minor adjustments around here. Okay, you'll have but, to do but, a few uh, drawings on that. Right, but other okay. than that, I think it uh, seems very, very good the way it is. If we walk through here, this is currently the living room for the apartment, and it leads right onto the keyhole, the top of our comfortable little staircase. And the scale of it is really nice, nice up very here. Nice. So again, very nice. this is all part of the main hall. All we will do is a lot of uh, plaster finishes, uh, re restoration up. kind of thing. This bedroom has been used as a master bedroom in the past. I want you to figure out how we can have a big master bedroom with its own bathroom, because the nearest bathroom right now is about 40 feet down the hall, hmm. and with a nice dressing area and plenty of, plenty of storage space. What do you think of this room? Well, this is uh, it's a... Beautiful room. I think that the, it's not adequate for a master bedroom yet. <laughs> who wants a, 
who wants a, uh, a sink in a closet? Yeah. And the closet isn't very big. Yeah. Uh, there's, there's not really a good wall to put the bed on. No, um, the only place you could put a bed up against is where you are. Yeah. We're going to have to add a, add a bathroom, add a dressing room, add a closet. Mm -hmm. uh, what's on the other side of this wall here? No, you can't go through there. Follow me and I'll show you. Okay. It's, it's another room, basically just about the same size, Jock. Okay. And well, listen, this is, uh, this is terrific. There's, a, there's, a, there's plenty of room in this room to add a, you know, a nice walk-in closet, nice, nice bathroom. And we can connect it up uh, to, the, uh, to the master bedroom itself. Mm -hmm. there was a, in fact, uh, there was an old door here that you can, you can kind of see. But I, mean, I think we'll have to you know, work around on the plans on paper for a while. I do remember that there's a chimney here from downstairs. That's a, right, we just so can't take out this whole wall. Right, where we were looking at the library, right. right. Just but I think there. this would be terrific. Okay, so you don't think it'd be a mistake to combine the two rooms into one master no, suite? No. You do lose a bedroom now. How, how do you feel about that? Well, the, the situation is that we've got so much more space in the L back here that I think it's worth combining these two rooms into one comfortable suite. Huh, okay. Come on back here. Jock, this whole L is like a rabbit warren back here. There's a bathroom there, a half bathroom over here. They yeah. had a... Yeah. Um, Washer dryer, dryer in there, and then this little area back here passes for a bedroom. It's not too small. But I just want to knock everything out, open up the whole space. And what I want to do up here is have both a bedroom area, but more importantly, I want to have a home spa. Hmm. I want to have a sauna, a steam room, uh, you know, bathroom facilities, but areas to do exercises in, maybe weightlifting, jumping rope, all sorts of things like that. Great. That sounds like fun. That would be a... I don't know. I wish I had one. <laughs> well, there's plenty of space here. Yeah. Well, actually, I think you have a problem. There isn't plenty of space uh, because of the headroom problem. If uh, if the roof were two or three feet higher, I think it'd be great. Mm -hmm. But I see that as a I see the head height problem as a, a main one, and I think probably you end up having a uh, structural problem. Feel I can, that? I can feel the spring. Yeah. yeah. There's too much but, bounce in the floor. But that's something think. that's something that we can handle. Uh, yeah. Beef that up. Well, how would we uh, how would we deal with the, with the with the roof problem? The fact that there's not enough headroom. Well, probably just the traditional dormers wouldn't be enough. I think you'd have to go to either a shed dormer or raise the whole roof. What would but you need more head head height here. What would a shed dormer look like on this? Well, let me uh, let me draw this. Uh, if this is the existing building. And the floor is at that level. That's right. That's that being the floor. A shed dormer comes out. It's at a flatter pitch than the existing roof on either side. Now you do get head height all the way along, but I think it's probably not really in keeping with this. Uh, with I don't this, think it would this look kind very of good. building. I don't happen to like those very much, although they are effective. Uh, the other way to do it would be to take the uh, take your existing room and just really just raise the roof up to the. Uh, the, the plate height that height. you, yeah, the necessary height, the height that you need. And just get rid of the existing and roof. And take out the existing roof. And I think that would be great. You'd have the room that you wanted to do, you know, it'd be wonderful. pretty complicated and pretty labor intensive and pretty expensive. Well, and just money, Bob. Well, but every, but that, I think that's the, uh, yeah. That's the no, I'm, I'm having a lot of troubles with this, L every time. I mean, the, the other day, Norman and I were looking at the foundation and we weren't very happy with that. Why don't we go downstairs and look at the kitchen, kitchen. end of things? Okay. You know, Bob, it occurs to me that the personality of this front main house is quite different than the personality of that back L. Oh, you can say that again. It's yeah. almost as if that back L was a, an afterthought. It's been added onto a couple of times, and it's... It's not only a, a different personality in terms of style, it's in, in terms of the structure, it's a real problem. Because once you walk into the L, you know, it's the whole thing little... bounces. And I've got a lot of problems in here. I mean, it's basically something that has to be gutted, this kitchen space. The ceiling's no good, the walls are you know, one layer of, of knotty pine over the old walls, and then this window, which closes down, way down behind the sink, and the sill is already rotted, and the cabinets aren't very attractive, the floor is a disaster. Mm -hmm. There's a post in the middle of the room here holding up a bathtub that was installed up there at some point, and that's how they took the load of it. Okay, uh, well, Bob, tell me what you want to do with this space. Tell me what, what you want it to be like after, after we've worked on it. The, I want to double the size of it by knocking out this whole southerly wall here and installing uh, not really a working greenhouse, but I guess you'd call it a conservatory or something like that. I want to glaze it in all the way out about 10 feet, and I want to have an area where you can have plants as well as people, a 
circular table, let's say, in the middle for mm -hmm. a kitchen table and so forth. And open, open to the kitchen here. Yeah, wide open, so that the space would be almost doubled. Mm -hmm. That'd be great. That'll be really nice. Listen, how would you feel about maybe taking some space off from this side? What for? Just about like three feet. What for? Well, it occurs to me that we have this problem getting to the second floor apartment space. Oh, you're still thinking which about is, that. Yeah, which is right out here. And if we put the door where this window is, we could, they could come in right here and go right on upstairs. And we could build a new wall right here. That would be super. That uh, yeah. looks right out onto that sun space. That's that probably a right. real simple solution to that well, problem. Well, it would really, yeah, it would really, really solve that problem, which is a problem. We be, we better sketch that out for me. Okay, now how about the fireplace? You want to keep that? I don't like it. It's it's not in the right location. The material doesn't doesn't have the right feeling for me. I mean, th th I want this to be kind of a country space, but this kind of was just put up here in the last ten years, maybe. And okay, well, we, we could gain a lot of space by taking that out. More than what you just see here, because there's actually an office back there that is like a home office, oh, yeah. but I think it's much bigger than it needs to be. I was mm -hmm. thinking all we need is a, a nook in a corner where, oh. What's uh, this about? <laughs> well, Norm was here the other day and, and he was digging around and basically what he discovered is that this whole section of the L doesn't have a foundation or a basement. It's oh, just sitting on one right. big wooden sill on top of the soil. So he was telling me we've got some problems with that. Okay. Well, listen, what, what else do we need in this kitchen? Well, we, need, we, need, a, a, we need a back entrance. Okay. And we need a small kind of corner for a telephone and cookbooks, etc. Right. And I don't know, I guess we probably should plan on... If we, a half if bath? We, yeah, I was wondering if we could fit in a half bath in a small closet. Great, sure. Listen, I got one thing that I really want you to think about. I think it's a big, big decision to make, and, uh, but, but it needs addressing. And that is the fact that we're doing so much to this back L. We're, we're taking one wall out to front of the greenhouse. We're cutting in a new stairway to the second floor. The existing second floor structure is, is no good. Mm -hmm. We need a new roof to raise the roof or build those shed dormers. Uh, the foundation and the, the sill support around this end of the building is terrible. Mm -hmm. Taking out that chimney. I think that you'd do a lot better financially to take this whole L down and build, build right up from new. Remodeling by tearing down the whole thing and just building it L. over again? Just the L. Just the L. Yeah. The main house is terrific. We're not going to do a lot with that. That's in real good shape. Just take down the L. It's, it's, not, it's not a great... Uh, no, it's a real interesting observation. I think the only way to figure it out is actually add up some numbers. And mm -hmm. I'll talk with Norm about that. Listen, before we finish up, there's one more area that I want you to look at with me. And that's down in the basement. I want to put a wine cellar in this house. Wonderful. You know, Jock, I was poking around in here the other day, and I was looking at this area, and I was looking at the thickness of these walls. And it occurred to me that this could probably be a great location for a wine cellar. We're right under the kitchen. What do you think? You've got all the, all the raw materials to have a great wine cellar here, Bob. The space is about the right size, the mm -hmm. thick masonry, cement keep, floor. Keep be it terrific. cool. Yeah, it'd be terrific. Uh, but what kind of wine cellar do you want? Well, how many kinds are there? Well, I don't know, but it, store it wine. seems like that you could have just, just store the cases of wine in the space the way it is right now. Yeah. Or you could dress it up, you know, build racks for the walls, put the bottles in it, uh, maybe dress up the stairway down from the, the main floor. You know, what kind of room that you would bring people to. That's, than more, the, that's more the idea, yeah. Not just a, a place to throw the cases in, but something right. kind of a little bit more elaborate. Yeah. Be nice, make it a nice room. Can you work on that as well as everything sure. else that you've got to do? Sure will. Listen, thanks for coming on and spending the time with us. We're mm. running out of time for today. Tune in again next week and find out how much of this old house is still left. Until then, I'm Bob Vila. This old house is made possible by a grant from Owens Corning Fiberglass Corporation, manufacturers of residential building products. Fiberglass Corporation manufacturers of residential building products. Hi, I'm Bob Vila. Welcome to this old house. We're in the third week of work around here and it's still pretty much in the planning stages and I wanted to talk with you a little bit about that today. We've built ourselves a cardboard model of the whole house and this will give you an idea of what we're thinking of doing right now. Of course, we're making no, no changes at all in terms of plan to the Greek Revival portion of the house, this front side that we're standing in front of right now. But all along, we've been talking about making some changes 
in the accessory L, the service L, or whatever you want to call it, that was tacked on to the house probably in the 1890s or thereabouts. And this is the first thing that we're going to do. This garage sits right on top of it. We want to move it away from that L so that we can gain lots of sunlight in this area so that we can have a big garden on the south side of the property. Then inside the L itself, I had been talking about clearing up this whole area up here, knocking out all these little partitions and so forth, and ending up with one large room that would be an exercise room with a steam bath and a sauna and a weightlifting area and exercise area and so forth. And what has been pointed out to us is that we have no headroom in here, either on this side or this side, so that in order to do all those things in this limited space, we would have to literally raise the roof up to about here so that we would be able to stand all the way next to the outside walls. So that's a pretty complicated proposition. Well, then down on the first floor of the L, the idea was to clear out all this little rabbit warren of pantries and closets and half bathrooms and so forth so that we would have one very large space for a kitchen. And of course, on the south side of the kitchen, I wanted to open up this wall, tear it out completely, and build a lean-to glass house, greenhouse, that would be accessible both from the kitchen and from the dining room so that you'd have a real enlarged kind of eating area in here. And the other idea that came along was to build a staircase inside this kitchen, in other words, taking over a four-foot wide strip of the inside space of the kitchen and putting in a door over here so that we could cancel the existing entrance into our second floor apartment, which right now goes in this direction. That would allow us to restore the original proportions of our living room over here. So that's three major changes that we've been talking about. And then, of course, Norm was digging some holes out around here last week and informed me that this whole back half of the L is sitting on a large 12 by 12 wooden sill right on the ground. There's no foundation and there's no cellar in that area of it. So that his suggestion is that we do something serious about that. Well. After a good deal of agonizing, you might say, we more or less ran some figures on what it would cost to make all these structural changes, not to mention all the cosmetic changes that would have to be done since the building itself is in pretty bad shape. The clabbers aren't very good and so forth. And we compared what our estimated cost would be to do all that repair work and alteration versus what it would cost, and get ready, to tear this whole thing down and start over start over with a brand new building to house all the things that we want to put back here. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. Because with me now is going to be Sam Brooks, our demolition contractor, who's out here with some heavy equipment. And a lot of exciting stuff is about to happen. OK, so this is the part that's going, and this is the part that's staying. That's right. And what have we got here? Well, you know, it almost thinks, it looks like all this heavy equipment is practically overkill just to take down a small wing like this. Well, Bob, you know, considering the fact that it would take us about three or four days with a hand crew to take this down, and that this few pieces of heavy equipment will do it in probably four or five hours, I think we're way ahead of the game. You know, the one question that comes to mind is the amount of debris that's going to be produced here. Where's it all going to go? It's all going to go to a sanitary landfill probably 50, 60 miles from here. Mm -hmm. And that is the most costly aspect of our demolition work, getting rid of this debris. Demolition really? debris. Yep. It's more expensive than, than, than the payroll for all the men out here. Absolutely. Here. Absolutely. That is our biggest expense. You know, my main concern in having a crane chop that up is the fact that my garage building and my beautiful slate roof, I don't want disturbed. Are you sure that nothing's going to happen to it? Well, we've made every preparation we can to protect that slate roof. And when we go up there with the crane bucket, that roof is protected. So we should be OK, Bob. How about when the crane operator is actually trying to work behind the garage and he can't see what he's doing? Well, when he's doing that, we've got a man that's up on the roof there now. That's Bob. And he will give signals, crane signals, to the crane operator. And that will enable the crane operator to know exactly what to do and what, what's going on at all times. OK. What are some of the hand signals he uses? Do you know any of them? Yes, I do, Bob. The uh, signal for opening the bucket is simply opening the hand, mm -hmm. closing the hand, closes the bucket, turning the finger this way, pointing upward means raise the bucket, turning the finger downward means lower the bucket. All right, so at least I'll know what he's doing when I'm That's watching, right. when I'm watching that up there. you'll recognize some of those signals. Right. Will he need any help getting all that stuff right into the truck here? 
uh, he'll be able to see, as you can see here, we've got the back of the truck wide open. Wide open, so yeah. he'll be clamming that down into the truck, and he'll be able to see what he's loading into the truck until the truck gets fairly well loaded, and then we'll close the back door. Hey, is he ready to get started? I think he is, Bob. Well, while Sam and the boys are finishing up the L, I thought we'd take a couple of minutes to talk about restoring the original portion of our house. And with us now is Steve Vega, who's in the surface refinishing business, right, Steve? Yes, we can prepare the surfaces of buildings uh, that are painted this way. So what does that, that basically be, mean, though? We sandblast them okay. and take the paint right off, and they can be restained afterwards. Now, we've got a lot of paint on this place. What about this front door? Can you do anything with it? I think this front door is just about had it as far as uh, being sandblasted. It would take it down and probably remove all the wood from it. The joints are coming apart. Yeah, it's, so it's, uh, yeah. Yeah, it's just We're going to have to talk about maybe replicating that. But what about the sidewall on this house, the well, clapboards? The boards on the house can be done with no problem at all. Uh, there's quite a bit of paint on here, but we can take it right down to the bare wood on the surface. Uh -huh. There would be some paint remaining like between the cracks and under the bottom of the boards. Okay. I've never personally had this done to a house that I was redoing, and I really would be leery of doing it until I'd seen a finished product. You know, one of the neighbors down the street are having it done right now. We could probably go down there and take a look. You think they'd mind if we can? Um, I don't think so. Let's go. Yeah. Wow, Steve. This is really impressive. It looks like you've been working at it for at least a week. No, we had a two-man crew come in this morning and start this job, and, uh... Just two fellas? Just two, yeah. They're moving right along. How old a house is this? This is an 1864 house. It's just about as old as the one you're working on. Just a few years newer than ours, yeah. yeah. And how many coats of paint do you suppose were on here? I'd say about, uh, 12 to 15. And... That's a lot. Yeah. And, yeah, of course, lead paints back in the old days used to hold on. Yeah, they held on quite a bit A lot tighter, tighter than so more, uh, recent paints. Difficult in some points to get it off. What about all the precautions that have to be taken before you can do this? Well, we'll cover over all the work area and the general area with these tops that are down here underneath the sand. So if this were a house that had a landscape yard right up to it, we wouldn't have to worry about it being ruined. Right. We could cover over any shrubs or anything that's in there. And why do you have to cover up the windows like that? We don't want to have them get pitted or frosted or broken. The sand from, would ruin the glass. The sand, right. Gotcha. 
the moldings look good. I, I didn't express, I expect the uh, the crispness of the moldings to remain after a, a sandblasting. How does that? Uh... Well, these were in real good condition to begin with. But, yeah. Uh, they're. Uh, it was easy to get the paint off of these. Is there the any direct... special technique that you have to use to get the moldings? They can only be hit from a, a direct angle, like straight on. Straight on to that. Like... Right. And like in here, you can see where there's some paint remains. Now, in, in order to get that paint off, we'd have to take away a lot of the detail on here. So we just. I see. Hit it you straight mean, on if, and if leave you some aimed, paint. aimed the gun at it from this angle, then you'd ruin the, the right. line of the molding there. Right. Are they still working on the place on the, around the corner or something? Yeah, Jerry's just about to start the other Let's side. Let's go now. see what he's yeah. doing. Now, what are all these hoses down here, Steve? Well, this is the equipment that's going to be used when the sandblasting happens. This hose here is the actual gun where the abrasive comes out of. Okay. And How fast uh, does it shoot it out? What's the pressure? It's about 60 to 80 PSI. Okay. 80, 90 around. Pounds per square inch. Yeah. This is the helmet, his jerry. He's going to be putting that on now. That'll protect him from many of the uh, sand when it's Everything bounces off, right back off. off the wall. Uh huh. And um, the holes running off the back is an airline that's hooked up to a compressor on the truck. Yes. And I notice he's got a, a different breathe. power line here, too. Yeah, this What's... power line hooks onto a little switch that he has, yeah. and he, that allows him to switch back and forth from a coarse abrasive to a fine abrasive. So he can shoot two different types of sand right. at it. And, right. Uh, he'll initially remove the paint with the coarse and then kind of smooth the surface off with the fine. And uh, it comes out quite nice. And right? that's his switch. Should we be this close? No, we shouldn't. We should move <laughs> away before he gets started with All right. <clears throat> Steve, I'm amazed at how quickly it all comes off. The, the only thing I'm concerned about is what the finished product looks like after you stain it or paint it. Well, we've done one just down the street. It's about 10 minutes from here. We can go take a look Let's at it. Let's go look at it, yeah. Now, Steve, this really looks terrific. It does. When, when you look at it from across the street, it just looks like any old clabbered house that's been freshly painted. But when you get close up, I, I I do like the fact that the grain all stands out kind mm -hmm. of subtly. Yeah, the texture uh, is good to absorb the stain that's been put on there. Sure. Too. So it, it looks like a paint job, though. It, it, it is a stain. It's a, it's a solid stain. It, 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 it's probably two coats of solid tell stain. Me, what, tell me the story behind this place. Why did the owner decide to do it? Well, the owner was having a problem with the paint that he had put on every three to four years, and that uh, he'd go scrape it and then power brush or... You mean he had paint failure every three or four years? Every three or four years, he'd be out here putting some more on and taking the peeling paint off. Mm -hmm. And we came in and sandblasted it, uh, and then he applied the solid stain. Mm -hmm. And since then, it's been, it's been great. I had no problem. Tell me one thing. What about the cost on a house like this? How do you figure it? Well, it's figured by the square footage as a base, but we have to figure other things into it, like the um, what has to be covered. Like, do the shrubs have to... Be covered over so that how many protected. windows are in the place and windows so forth. have to be protected uh, swimming pools sometimes a, a neighbor will have some property that needs protection a so swimming pool would be a problem with a lot of sand in it wouldn't it yeah it really hey would listen be. before we decide what we're going to do with our old house i think we need two or three weeks to really button down everything that we're doing there mm -hmm. so we'll be back in touch with you and thanks very much for the tour today my pleasure while I'm getting back to check on the demolition over there, how about if we take a look at Mike Mullane, the roofing contractor, who was with me a few days ago looking at our slate roof and figuring out how to repair it.
a lot of people with uh, old slate roofs on their house very, very often replace it with other types of roofing material. And I've always wondered how they come to that decision. Now, you've looked at our roof here, which is well over 100 years old, and you've suggested that we just replace uh, a few of the slates and repair it, but keep it. On what do you, how do you make that decision? Well, you come up and you take a look at the roof and you determine what kind of slate it is. Yeah. Uh, this slate is definitely from Monson, Maine. Uh, it's a quarry in central Maine that uh, has the best quality slate that's that's quarried in the United States. So the main the main factor is what kind, no pun intended, what kind of slates are on your roof, whether they're real high quality ones or, or not. Yeah, yeah, there's uh, a lot of quarries around the eastern part of the country where uh, there's different mineral content in the stone itself. What's so good about the Munson, Maine quarries? Uh, what happens if there's trace minerals like uh, iron oxides? Yeah. Uh, you know, iron will rust yeah. and the slate will delaminate yeah. when exposed to the weather over the years. Mm -hmm. Some of the quarries, like in uh, Pennsylvania, will be uh, have a different mineral content, more chemicals in the slate, and when exposed to the weather, mm -hmm. they'll delaminate over the years, maybe 60, 80 years down the road. Okay. Monson slate, uh, in theory, if it's nailed properly and maintained, it can last indefinitely, hundreds of years. This is an example of it. Now, let's talk specifically i'm looking at a couple right around me here there's one here that's got a corner cracked off and would you replace that or would you just leave it go well that particular broken corner would not cause the water to come in it's not okay. going to be a leak so only if you were looking at it from a dormer window or if you were really finicky about it would you bother replacing it huh? that's right it's more aesthetics than uh what about oh well this one's the glaring example right here what, what about this one yeah well that was damaged somehow down the road probably by ice or maybe somebody coming up on the roof mm -hmm. uh but that the butt is broken high enough above the water line of the slate down here the head lap is not sufficient so that would leak now that's going to be See, a problem so you mean this slate the top of it is here and in between these two you don't have it covered so the water can get right in between there and run in that's right where the okay. one over there the broken corner isn't over the crack no the the other slate goes right under it and way up that's right So that's yeah. not a problem okay could we actually see a little demonstration of how it's done sure how I you think... replace a broken slate right john's working over there patching some slate what's that tool he's using uh that's just a slate ripper it's got a hooked in at the top so that you can slide it under a slate, and uh, it hooks on the nails of the slate. Each slate is held by two nails. So he'll hook on a, a nail, left, left side first there, and pull it right out, and grab the other one. And then you try to get up there and clean out all the little pieces that might be uh, broken up underneath there. Yeah. yeah, he got it. Yeah. So then... After it's all cleaned out, you take another piece of slate, and what we're doing is taking slate from the rear rail, whose roof is not too good, right. but there's a few salvageable slate, and we're going to use that to repair this roof here. Uh -huh. So he'll take the slate and just slide it into place of the original slate. Well, how are you going to nail it? Well, you nail it between the... Uh, between the butts? Between the butts of the two slate above. That way there, you don't have to pull all the slates up all the way at the roof. Well, so, wouldn't that cause water to get in through that point eventually? Well, if uh, you'll see John, he can, uh, when he gets the slate punched, he'll uh, slide it up there and we'll show you a little trick how we keep this waterproof and back to original condition. You can never see the patch. Mm -hmm. It's important to use the same kind of slate, otherwise the repair slate will, you know, be a glaring. Uh, sure, it'll uh, stand out a mile away. Yeah. So he's got the slate up in place, and uh, take a clap of nail and drive it through. Knock it down. But the important thing on repairing a slate roof is not to drive that nail down too far. See, if you drive it down too far, you'll break the slate. It'll go right through, and that slate will fall out again. Uh -huh. So you just snug it down so the slate is just hanging free. Well, now what's he doing with the copper? What's that for? That's called a babby flashing. Babby uh, flashing. Babby. Yeah. I don't know where the name ever came from, but 
Joe will make a couple little snips in the side to kind of give it little tongs to grab onto the slate so it won't slide out. Yeah. And then he uh, slides it up over the nail. And uh, that's pretty much it. That slate should uh, outlast the rest of the roof. That's all there is to it. That's it. Takes the shingle ripper, slate ripper, and just nudges it up so it's not visible. And it's important to know, Bob, that uh, you know sometimes you use zinc or aluminum for the babby flashing, mm -hmm. and that will disintegrate with the you know acid rain we're having and pollution in the city. So we use copper because it copper will it, last longer. You know, of course, it's almost indestructible. Hey, the last question I've got about the slate roof has to do with cost, and I know that's a little bit difficult for you to answer. Yeah. But generally speaking, when you're looking at a repair job like this, how do you price it? Well, this roof isn't that bad. I've seen a lot worse, but it's probably been neglected for quite a few years. Mm -hmm. You can see there's a lot of rot around the edges. But uh, to bring this roof up to first-class quality, mm -hmm. you could probably spend... Uh, Twelve hundred, fifteen hundred dollars. Really? To repair it. Now you said it's been neglected. Does that imply that a slate roof should be maintained every year? Well, especially around here, if we have many winters like we had last winter, would uh, well, slate roofers will all be rich? Yeah. Because <laughs> uh, it's the ice working on the slate. Mm -hmm. You get big ice slides, and it'll pull out some of the loose slates. Yeah. So it's important every couple of years to to check it over. If you see a slate in the ground, then patch it in before you get any further damage. Okay. Hey, now besides roofing up here, we wanted you to take a good look at our fascias and planchers, basically our overhangs of our roof, and determine whether we had any serious rot up here, what kind of problems we had. This is the first time I've looked at it quite this close up, and I'm not terribly inspired. Uh, have you started to loosen this up or what? Yeah, we loosen up the nails for uh get this off pretty easy so we could probably just uh, you want me to help you yeah this we'll is about a 16 foot off. length of uh, fascia board yeah hey John can you give a hand with this sure. watch out for that spike I got it I got it thank you hey this is leftover knotty pine siding from yeah. when they did over the kitchen. <laughs> That's unbelievable. Yeah, they patched this up. All right, uh, Mike. <laughs> Just give me a description of what's here. Well, it's hard to describe. Uh, these are called scabs. Usually when you take off an old fascia board like this, these raster ends will have a lot of rot through mm -hmm. the nails rusting out, moisture getting in. Mm -hmm. So then we put in these scabs. Uh, see, some of them are one by. Yeah, so just one by pine. And normally, it should have been a full two, two by piece of stock, right? Yeah. Two yeah, by six or a two by eight. We put a two by six in here uh, as a sister to the main roof rafter here. Mm -hmm. It should be pretty good, but I think if we want to put new gutters on here, you better put on some two by sixes to... We'd never be able to hang a gutter off of something that was only three quarters of an inch thick. <laughs> That's right. Wouldn't, that wouldn't hold the weight. Right. I imagine, although this is a repair that probably is 15 years old or thereabouts, we're going to have to uh, forget about it. What about that end over there? Well, further down here, they put a sheet metal patch on this soffit under here cover up well, was a pretty nasty situation. I don't want to pull it off now, but this is rotted and they just covered it with a piece of sheet metal here. So I think that'd have to be replaced all the way back to the house. I think sheet metal would generally be called inappropriate to this kind of an application. Uh, you do repair work of this nature regularly, don't you? Yeah. Yeah, quite How a do you quote a price? Is it by the running foot, depending on the, the size of the overhang, or what? Well, it's hard to, to give any kind of uh, uh, unit price mm -hmm. on it, because each job is different. Mm -hmm. So on this job here, I guess we figured that all the fascia board would be replaced, and mm -hmm. probably 50% of the soffit. And then you're going to have to work on the rafter ends before you even... Before you put new stock back up. Before anything goes back, right. So am I looking at, say, if I had to repair just a section from here to the corner, which is about 18 feet, 
and do all of that work. Replace the rafter ends and put in new plancher boards and a new fascia. A few hundred dollars? A few hundred dollars, yeah. Like five or six? Well, on this particular one, it'd probably be a little less than that, but yeah. uh, some of them are more rotted. See, half yeah. of this soffit is, is all still right. okay. All right, I won't pin you down. <laughs> one last question. What do you think about gutters on this? Uh, well, it looks like when we took this off that there might have been some old metal gutters on there, but it doesn't seem like the metal gutters are really original to this house. That's what I would have thought. Yeah. Yeah. You did find some traces of metal gutter. Like, well, yeah, I'm looking at it right here, I think. Yeah, that's the old copper strip from the back of a copper gutter. And you figure that's a gutter that was just added on here at some other point? Yeah, yeah, it didn't go under the slate sufficiently. Usually they're supposed to go a minimum of six inches under mm -hmm. the slate, the apron, but it didn't seem to go too far under. Okay, well, I think we're going to hold off on making a decision on just what kind of a gutter to put back there. I don't think it'll be copper because I don't think that would be authentic but we'll mm. let you know before too long. Thanks a lot for your time, Mike. Well, folks, there you have it. In about three or four hours, men and machinery have brought down this little old wing that was here. And next week, we'll be getting started on rebuilding it with new materials. We'll also be moving our garage building off to the side and away from the south yard. We'll be revealing our architectural plans for the inside of the main house here, as well as talking about the landscape plans. That's next week on This Old House. Till then, I'm Bob Vila. This old house is made possible by a grant from Owens Corning Fire. Hi, I'm Bob Vila. Welcome to this old house. I don't really have a drinking problem. I just thought the bottle might help set the mood a little bit because I'm standing in this old cellar here, which eventually is going to be our wine cellar. And it'll, it might make it a little bit easier to picture the custom-made wine racks and the tasting bench in the middle and the paneling and all the good things we have in mind for this area. But right now, it doesn't look like much, because if you were with us last week, you probably saw our 60-foot crane in the dump, the dump truck taking away what looked like a reasonably solid building that was standing here. But I'll tell you more about that in a minute. Let me point out to the perfect piece of evidence right over here as to the problems we've had. We're on the back side of the house, which faces the east. And of course, the whole load of the roof sits on this whole wall behind me. Over the years, water has collected here incessantly. And this whole area from here, and especially over here, has gotten its sills rotted out. It's one of the problems with wooden houses. Sometimes, if water isn't diverted away from the building properly, it accumulates right at the bottom. And the sill, the big timbers that carry the whole weight of the sidewall and the roof of the house, rot away. So before too long, we'll be propping up this whole wall. Hopefully Norman will be doing it. And we'll be replacing that timber with a new one. Other things that we have to do are in this area over here, because the theory we've got right now is that the building we had here started out in life as a kitchen built right over this hole that I was just in, over that full cellar, and that they had a kitchen porch off the back of it. And eventually, as the family needed more space, they closed in the porch, and they added the second floor to it and connected the gabled roof to the rest of it, and they had a bigger L. Unfortunately, they didn't dig out. They didn't do anything about what was holding up the porch except to add on. And what happened here is the same old story. Rotten wood. Because this building actually sat right on the soil, and the wood didn't have a chance. What we're going to be doing here, and pretty soon, and within a week or so, We'll be digging out this whole perimeter, the, the same perimeter that the building originally stood on, and putting in a new foundation, a new footing, and a new foundation wall to hold the new building that we're putting in its place. Another important thing that we'll be doing is we'll be make, bringing a small excavator, a small tractor in here, to slice out all this soil and bring the grade down by about a foot. That's going to improve life around here immensely, because we'll always have water running away from the new building, and we won't have to worry about rot, the nemesis of wood buildings. This little wood building, our garage, has already gone up on, on blocks, as it were, and that's one of the things we're going to be showing you today. We're going to be taking it and moving it right out of our way temporarily before we put it in its new location. So that should be an exciting thing to look at today because there's uh, quite a few colorful characters that actually just roll it out of the way. We're also going to be visiting with Jock Gifford, our designer, who's going to help us look at the plans we've made for the addition here on the back, the L, 
and for the rest of the house. And one of the things that we really want to get into is how we're going to have a little bit of a solar greenhouse on this south side of the house. And lastly, we'll be talking with an energy expert about what to do with our windows and our doors, whether to save them, repair them, or whether to bring in more efficient ones. Let's get started by looking for Jock. Hi, Jock. Hi there, Bob. What have you got for us today? Well, I've been working on this model to make some of the changes that, uh, that we want to make to your building here. Well, I'm glad to see there's no changes being made on the front facade. No, this, listen, this is a, this is a great example of uh, 19th century architecture, mm -hmm. uh, and it's in very good shape. We'll just leave it alone. I think one interesting point is if you uh, take a look at the chimneys up there, you'll see that they're, they're unalike, dissimilar. Uh, the one on the left is a wooden dummy chimney. We've been unable to find any any evidence that it was ever used even with a metal flue pipe in it. Uh -huh. uh, but we're still looking at that. The one on the right is the masonry chimney that goes all the way to the basement. It currently has the furnace on it. Yeah. And is, uh, is, in, is in pretty good shape. I would kind of assume they put that dummy up there just for to have some symmetry on the roof line. I think you're probably right. Uh, yeah. I think probably what we want to do maybe is just to take this brick chimney, stucco it and paint it white to match and make it look like the rest of the house, the same color, the same treatment. All right. But the front should end up looking just the way it did in 1850. Right. What's going on on the side here? Well, the side is it's the same as pretty much as it, as it is. It's the it's the back, this back L, Bob. That's where all the action is. Uh, we're going to want to rebuild on the same footprint, the same shape, the same size. Which means it's the same size, yeah. yeah. And all we're going to do is raise it up. It's going to come up higher. So we got this, the, uh, the, uh, the headroom that we need on the second floor. Mm -hmm. I think that you should note that the fact that we do have the only addition to the house is this little sunroom, and but we'll talk about that later. Uh, the impact of going up so high this is that the new ridge on the L will hit the the main roof uh, intersect in the existing slate roof. Yeah, the way it was built, it came in right under the eave. That's right. Have you thought about what material you're going to specify for the new roof there? Well, Bob, I'd love to see slate go back on it. Of Forget course. Forget it. That but. I think would be a little bit beyond our means. Yeah, I think that's probably right. I think we're probably going to have to use a, a, a fiberglass or an asphalt shingle, yeah. something like that. And do you see any problem with the, the transition from, from a, a shingle to the slate? No, I think we, you know, if you build that valley properly, we won't have a, a we won't have a problem on that score. And you know, you really can't see this this roof from anywhere. It's, no, it's so directly on the back side of the house. That's right. Well, let's look and see what's underneath that roof. Okay. We have the, uh, if you remember, the second floor is really the exercise room. That's up. what we wanted, yeah. So it's, a, it's pretty good size. It's about 12 feet by 18 feet. We'll plan to put mirrors along the, and maybe a ballet bar on the back, on the back along wall. Along that solid wall. And uh, on, the, on the front side, the sliding glass doors opening onto a little, little deck. Oh, that'll be wonderful. And I think that this is going to be a nice, bright, sunny exercise room. Mm -hmm. Nice hardwood floor. Yeah, and the mirrors on the back wall will kind of double the size of it. Yeah. What happens in here? Well, this is the, that, the, the, the back end of this room. We're going to put a, a more than just a, a bathroom, Bob. It's going to be really a nice one. We're going to have a sauna in it, maybe six feet by four feet, with mm -hmm. a vanity alongside it on one side of the room. And on the other side of the room here, we'll put a, a, a steam shower and, and the john. And what happens in this little nook here? Well, this is a, a little alcove off the exercise room that would, would have maybe a guest room bed, mm -hmm. something like that. So there would be a full wall along there. That's right. OK. Sounds great. Uh, now, underneath, we'll go downstairs and look at the ground floor. Well, we've got a new wall right there that we didn't have. What's the purpose of that? Well, you remember the, uh, the problem about access to the second floor rental apartment here, Bob. Yeah. This is a uh, new stairway. Uh, coming up to the second floor apartment, eliminating the inside stairway that was uh, interfering with our extended, you know, uh, with our living room. Living room. Yeah. Right. So we're going to restore the original proportions of the living room, and we'll have a new staircase to the apartment through there. Okay, right. tell us about the kitchen space itself. Okay, well, the kitchen here, we have the, the uh, against this wall now, the new stairway wall, we'll put the uh, uh, big counter with uh, maybe the refrigerator and a sink in it, and mm -hmm. it's a nice wall cabinet. And then a, out from that is a nice, a nice... Island unit. Yeah, with maybe a stove in it. Okay, but there will be no separation between the old kitchen space and the new and sunroom the, space. No, we'll open right up onto this sunroom space where we'll put a nice breakfast table or something like okay. that in it with plants growing, be a, again, and it, a nice sunny bright room. It will connect with the formal dining room. Yes, you right can see we'll, we'll cut, cut a new opening into the 
to the... Excellent. Very good plan. Now, tell me, tell me about the entrance to this okay. whole area. We have a, we'll have a door right here, the back door, which will, which will have a little coat closet, a nice little kitchen desk, mm -hmm. and a powder room. All right. So that, that, uh, we can... Will there be any kind of a porch enclosure outside here? Uh, at this point, no. But, you know, you might have a pretty good idea there. Maybe we should think of covering that entry a little bit. Well, I don't know. We'll have to think about it. I'm just thinking that this is the one doorway that will receive a lot of traffic right into the kitchen. Yeah. What about the, the area right outside this and, and, and over here? Will these be sliding doors? Yeah. This I'm just is wondering, the... in terms of the location of the garage, the garage used to be right here where the, where the sunroom is. And is this where you propose to reposition it? Yes. Well, Tom Worth and I are still talking about that, but current thinking is that we have a little backdoor entry terrace patio back here. Yeah. Uh, and on the other side here, off the new sunroom and at sliding glass doors, is almost like an outdoor room, a yeah. more private outdoor room. So we want to separate these two these two areas. You know, and, by and outdoor room, do you mean like a large terrace or maybe a, large a wooden big deck? open deck uh, with a you know? Again, another outdoor eating table. Mm -hmm. And the point is that the, sun. the garage building separates these two areas. Exactly right. I kind of like it, yeah. Right. Well, let's look at the gable end of the okay, L. The end of the L is really, uh, the model maker really got away from me, Bob, here. And the only thing I'd really like to note about this is that we probably want to use the same kind of windows we use in the main house, which is going to be a double-hung window with a storm window on the outside. The of it, original windows, double-hung and six over six panes yes. of glass. Yeah. Now, the, these, the... We'd want to make them smaller than this. Obviously, we got windows to the uh, to, to a bathroom window and a, and a little window above that kitchen desk. So. Yeah, especially one in the bathroom. I think it's way too big. Yeah. We'll have to revise this. I'm not too sure I like that detail either. Okay. And the uh, last elevation here is the is really where the tenant's entry is. And mm -hmm. the change I'd like to make here is really I'd like this to uh, raise this door up so that we can build a stoop on the outside three or four steps up onto that stoop, then in the door and up the stairs. And by What's the advantage of that? Well, by raising this door and building that stoop up, we shorten that long straight run by that many stairs. OK. And these windows that you've located in here, they will also be, uh, again, double hung windows similar to the main house. Super. I like almost all of the ideas. I think the only thing we have to talk about a little bit is the windows back here. Good. Thank you, Jock. I'm about to go find the building movers, who I think are going to be ready to move our garage for us. Wonderful. Take it easy. With us now is Roly Bolio, who's in the business of moving buildings. Hi, Roly. Hi, Bob. Listen, before we start talking about how you're going to move our little garage, do you think we're crazy to even go to the expense of no, moving it? I don't think you're crazy. I think you're doing a good move. How much is it costing us? About a thousand dollars. Yeah. And we looked at that as opposed to the cost of rebuilding something like this, because first of all, we knew we couldn't leave it where it was, because it was right on top of the house on the south side, blocking all the light. And then we knew if we wanted to build something like it, this is all pine trim and cedar clapboards. This corner molding alone costs about $3 a running foot. I don't doubt it. And then, of course, the slate roof on it would be almost impossible to reproduce. And that's a good feature, also. So I think we're doing the right thing, also. Now, what is the first step that you've taken here, just to get it up three feet off the ground? Well, first, we uh, attempted to set our pump jacks on the sill, like we usually do. Your pump jacks? Pump the... jacks, yeah, this uh, unit over here. Yeah. And why didn't you put it under the sill? Well, we found out the sill was all, all rotten. Oh, due to the fact that there wasn't the uh, in been sitting too in the long. sitting in the soil for a too long close time. Close to the ground. See? Yeah. Yes, there's probably been some carpenter ants in there as well. So, since you could not put those jacks under the sill, what did you have to do? Well, we had to nail a big two by eight plank across the door over here. Uh huh. And we used some uh, twenty penny nails to uh, reach that post, which is in here. A uh, 20 penny should... spike, that's about five inches, about five right? Five inches, I would say, yes. So you've got the plank nailed into the corner post of the yes. building. And what's this here? This is to uh, reinforce it, you know, so to give you more power to, to raise. This just more strength, you know. on the plank and then it's up nailed. against the and four by four. Well, this part here, I use 16 penny nails. Uh -huh. Go through there. So I guess what th this is helping to do is to transfer the weight of the roof and of the building out to the plank where you can use the jack Exactly. On it. Good. That's a simple gimmick. OK, then, what type of a jack do we have here? I mean, I thought you'd be using something like a, what do they call it, a hydraulic house jack. But this looks kind of well, different. For this type of work, we use uh, pump jacks all the time. Pump you know? jacks, yeah. Yes, that's what we call them, pump jacks. What's the advantage of that over uh, an old house jack? Well, due to the fact that all you need is about two inches to set, as you can see, there's a toe right over here. Yeah. Right? 
And uh, so you can actually about, start way down at the bottom. Exactly, yes. And once you reach a certain level, which is about uh, 22 inches, then you can set on top of the head over here. You can set this on top of the head, exactly. and that keeps on going up. Yes. Okay. And you use this. This is very much like an old yeah, car we use, jack. Yeah, uh, we use a four-foot bar. The bar and we just put this in sticks the up in there. Position, right? And we keep keep going up. Yep. Just like a car jack. How much do you figure our little garage building weighs? I would say about six tons. And how can you judge that? I mean, well, by the pressure that we use on the on the on the barge, you know. By how much pressure it takes. Yes, to and we move so many of them, so uh, we know. So it's a question of close, yeah, eyeballing six it. Tons. Yeah. Okay, let's let's jump in here a minute and take a look at what you've done so far. This looks like uh, just the way they moved the the big blocks to build the pyramids in Egypt, right? Yes, I would say it's a little old-fashioned, but it's still going strong. Yeah. So what have you got here? Well, we, of course, when we were high enough, we installed these timbers in here. Okay, so that this timber is holding the building at two different points. Yes, this one here and the other one does the same thing. On the back. Yeah, so we're on four-point suspension. All right. See? Then we use these shoes. Which are the shoes? These use timbers? These four-foot shoes. These are planks, really, that has a bevel on the end of them. So yeah, a bevel cut on the end of it. So it's easier to catch your roll as you... As you go forward, see, it'll catch easy because gotcha. on account of that bevel. Gotcha. Otherwise, it would be too blunt and uh, the roller would keep on sliding. Yeah, see? and then you've got the two of them connected with a chain. Yes. What's that called? That's, uh, that's called, a, we call it a bale. A bale. Why don't we go around the outside and take a look at uh, what's going to be occurring there. A little muddy out here today, huh? You know, the, yes. the, the first thing we're going to do is to move the garage out about 10, 10 feet and then in that direction towards where the red truck is. Yes. And it's not going to live there, but it's going to be there temporarily while we excavate out here where the L was and while we build our new foundations and pour concrete. So what's all this, this business out here? Well, of course, you see our tracks. Our tracks are built level. They correspond with that point there. Uh -huh. And we're going to move about 12 feet sideways. Okay. And we have a set of tracks on this side, mm -hmm. on the same centers. Mm -hmm. And we'll... Uh, we'll uh, pull with these, this cable here, which is attached to a, a snag block out there. Okay. And we'll activate. Roger, why don't we start that truck over here, and we're going to start to pull. And and how activate. important is it to, to keep this, this business here level? Well, when you move on, on four-point suspension, it's always better to, to keep it nice and level, because if you don't, it's going to twist. I see. Twist the house. So and if it were a finished house. Even a small house, building, we, use, we do it as the same principle as a big one. See? Okay. So as long as you keep it level, you don't have to worry about racking the building exactly. or anything like that. Exactly, yes. Okay, is he ready to go? We better get out of the way, huh? Okay, Roger. Okay, Rolly, you've got it out 12 feet out this way. Now, how are you going to go about moving it in that direction? Now, we'd have to set our jacks on need these, uh, these timbers. Uh, Roger has a jack now. He's going to demonstrate how it's going to be done. And what's the purpose of the jack Well, there? we have to release these runs and rollers and shoes so we can go into another direction. We're going west. We're going down the hill towards the tree. Okay. So, so the tracks have to be going that way. Right. So by raising it at this point... It releases... Go ahead, uh, Henry. On the other side, on both sides of the timber you're raising It's going it to release these rollers and shoes, which we can utilize to go the other way. Okay. So, now you've got... Okay, that's high enough. Now you've got that timber on the inside raised up enough that you can remove all the rollers and blocks that are underneath right. it. Then now we'll set these tracks to go that way. Good. And we'll do that a section at a time. We'll use this, these two points first, come down onto these rollers again, and then do the same thing on the other side. Rolly, this is a relatively simple job. What about when you're called on to move a big house with plaster all over the place, and finished that, rooms and so forth? Well, uh, we do it the same way. We do it nice and level. You use basically this is the same basically, principle? Basically, we use some bigger timbers. We use some bigger jacks. We have a hydraulic jacks. I'll pick up 400 tons. Really? Yes. That's I mean, a, a series of jacks. I'll pick up that many tons, really. Mm -hmm. 
uh, the building, even a building that size would be nothing to move for like us. Like the main house here would be nothing to move for, you're saying. But what it about would... going down hills and across streets and... Well, if you go a short distance, mm -hmm. uh, we do the same way we're doing here. We build tracks, mm -hmm. and those tracks are built level. Okay, Rolly, the first part of the move is complete, and now you're ready to start the second leg, huh? Yes. Now we have to go another direction, which is that way, of course. And our tracks are built accordingly. And we're all set to go. I notice you've had to shim at every point along here. Is it that important to do that? It is. Yeah, because these, uh, although these are very strong, they'll, they'll spring. If there's any amount of weight, they'll spring on you. So that's what we're, we're trying to avoid that. Even though they're oak, they could spring. We try to keep so. them nice and straight, you know? Yeah. OK. So now you've got your cable tied to the other truck. And, yes. Uh, we're going to use a direct line this time on that little winch. OK. Is he ready to roll? We're ready to roll. Roger. Hold that. Make sure that you don't get tangled up there. Hold that. OK, Rolly, you've extended this base out another eight feet, and we're ready for the final move of the, uh, of the day. OK, Bob. A little bit more. That's good, for now. Right. OK, Rolly, I guess it's uh, just like the old days. Uh, the, the old days, even, yes. Even the pharaohs used to move them this way. The not, same way. Not much trouble. Same way. Well, we'll have a week to build our foundation and so forth, and we'll call you back, and uh, we'll be ready to roll her back onto her new, uh, new position in life. New slab. OK. I'll be ready for you when you are. Thanks very much. We're going to take a minute now. We're going to talk with our energy expert, John Snell. Hi, John. Hi, Bob. I'm glad you could come out. Good to see you. The main thing, of course, that I wanted to talk with you about was our windows here at this old house. Mm -hmm. Whether we're going to be able to make them airtight and good for the winter or whether I'm going to have to order new ones. OK. So what is it you're doing out here at the door? Tell you what we're going to do. We're actually going to put the entire house under pressurization, uh, similar to taking a rubber tire and dunking it under water. We're going to do the same thing with the house and mm. find out where the air leaks are occurring. And we're going to do it with this blower door right here. And this we're is a first blower gonna... door, you're calling it. Right, it's a research tool that people have been using to find out where heat loss occurs in a house. And what we're going to do here is focus on just how efficient your windows are uh, specifically. And why don't I go ahead and fire it up and sure. let's see what's going on. Does it take much time to pressurize the house? Oh, it's just about instantaneous. Basically, we're just sucking in a lot of air from outside into the into the space in here. Exactly. You can see here that we're building up a certain amount of pressure on the house. And obviously, the tighter the house, the higher the needle is going to go. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's not too bad. I've seen houses which have been very tight, and houses where we've been able to build up no pressure at all. So let's go take a look at the windows and see how that's going. How about the living room windows? These windows over here are an interesting problem because they're obviously a tremendous part of the house. They have a lot of architectural character to them. Mm -hmm. And the real question that arises is, can we retain them? Yes, are they without... going to be energy efficient, or am I going to have to order new expensive replacements for Let's them? Let's go ahead and find out. This is a little wisp of smoke that will actually show us where the air infiltration is occurring. And if you see it, right by the window here, you can see it's leaking right outside all over the place. So that's a source of air infiltration. Other areas are up by the rope pulleys, where if you look up here, it's just diving right out. In fact, that's the worst place we've found so far. Wow. You can even see it seeping right in between the storm window and the prime window itself. Yeah. So the other thing you'll notice is that weather stripping is often indicated on a, on a window. And you can see why on this upper window there's a little bit of air infiltration. Yeah, it gets in right between the, the window, the sash itself, and the, and the uh, parting rail. Exactly. And down here, let's see if it's the same story. Down here, it's not quite as bad, so we may not have to weather strip that window. It might be a waste of time. So what I'm going to recommend on these windows is to take a little bit of caulking. This upper window is very rarely used, and uh, depending on how clean you want your windows, you can just put a bead of caulk running all the way down. Right along the parting bead? Right along there. And you can see it's a clear caulk that won't interfere with the window whatsoever. Mm -hmm. uh, down here, we're going to go ahead and leave this alone because it's nice and tight. And for the rope pulley, there's still a sash cord remaining over here. And I'll show you the solution we have to that. 
go ahead and take some air conditioner weather stripping. And this is a solution we found that's worked well. And that's pretty inexpensive stuff. Cheap as can be. Go ahead and pull the sash cord down. Stuff it right in. And let's see if there's any air filtration now. There we go, nothing going out, so we're all set. And the other area that sometimes is a problem are the meeting rails. So that's something that can just be done quickly when you close your storm windows in the fall and then take them back out in the spring. Exactly. Drop that's the a nice storm windows down, throw that up, and you're, you're off and running in about five seconds. The other two concerns are sometimes the meeting rails are a little bit loose, and we'll double check that. Yes, indeed, it's just pouring right out. Well, you haven't locked the sash lock. Wouldn't that make a difference? There we go. That should help out some. And by the way, these locks are tremendous. These clamshell locks are going to pull the window tight, and they're also going to force them apart, mm -hmm. top and bottom. So in many cases, you don't even need weather stripping. Get a nice tight seal. Here you can see there's enough paint that's layered on here, so you might consider either taking the paint off uh, while you're redoing the windows, or go ahead and put some weather stripping. We'll put a piece of weather stripping on the bottom and show how that's done. So we'll take out this. Go ahead and raise the window. And this is a self-adhesive vinyl weather stripping that comes in a number of different brand names. And uh, all you have to do, peel off the back. After you fit it in, formed it into a V right here. And I've already cleaned the bottom here so that there's no dirt and filth. So that it'll stick, yeah. And all you have to do is apply it right to the bottom. and you're off and running. And then you bend it back over itself. That's right. So we should have an effective seal right on the bottom. That sounds very snug. Go ahead and put that lock on, and we'll see if there's any air infiltration now. Tight as a drum. Yeah, that does so, make it tight. There you go. There's going to be a little bit of air leakage in an older house on a window. But my feeling is that you can go ahead and retain these windows. Uh, and leave them as is, do a little bit of weather stripping, a little bit of weatherization in the wintertime. Mm -hmm. So I'd say as far as energy efficiency is concerned, by putting on some high quality storm windows. You would go that route, huh? Because oh, yeah. we do have single glazing on these old windows, mm -hmm. and it's nice handmade glass that, that we were hoping to save. Oh, so you should have no trouble with that whatsoever. And the other thing to keep in mind is that only about 20% of the heat loss are, actually occurs through windows and doors. Uh, only 20%? very small part in the average house, and older homes are no exception. Mm -hmm. And what you'll find is that there's more air leakage occurring through interior wall cavities, uh, through pipe chains and the like. What Let me are some examples? Show you a few quick spots over here. Try this one over here. Let's see how this outlet's doing, the one that says hot. There we go. A little bit of smoke going right through here, and what you find are those cow safety plugs are tremendous. Go ahead and put that up there. The other thing that's recommended are outlet caskets. Uh, we very rarely use those because this is where most of the air leakage is occurring. Right where you plug in the, into the socket. Exactly. So those child safety plugs not only save your children, but uh, are also going to save a little bit of heat loss. And of course, they're all the pipe chases. Look at that. Right into the cold basement. This is the worst source of heat loss we've found yet. And if you can spend a little bit of time filling this up with some stuffing material and some caulk, uh, this will probably be even more cost effective than doing any work with your windows mm -hmm. in many cases. And you'll find this will also occur in interior wall cavities. And on the inside partitions? Oh, no question about that. You wouldn't that. think you'd have to worry about them. There's an outlet right there. We'll double check that. Because what you'll find is that your house is just like Swiss cheese. There are pipes and wires running all over the place. Cavities all over the place leading up to the unheated attics. There we go. This is worse than the outside wall. Remember there's just a little bit going up to that other one. So that's a source of air infiltration. So as far as air infiltration is concerned, we'll go ahead and take care of those windows. And, but don't forget the rest of the house while yeah, you're ongoing. A terrific tip. I think we've learned a little bit from that. So we'll have lots of busy work to do on all of these different oh, points. No but question. the main thing is that we'll be keeping our old windows and putting new uh, storm windows over them. Mm -hmm. John, thanks for coming out. We needed okay. that information. We're running out of time for today. Until next week, when we'll be very busy framing our new well back there, I'm Bob Vila for This Old House. This old house is made possible. Hi, I'm Bob Vila. Welcome to this old house. And we spent a lot of time with Norman looking at the foundations that had just been completed for the new L, the new building that we've put back here. And this time, we're practically done, right? 
The framing crew has managed to go up two stories and get the roof all in place. It looks like we're almost finished. Wrong. Everybody gets a false sense of accomplishment, I think, when you finish all the framing work and you've got all the plywood sheathing in place. And believe me, once that's done, the, a lot of real work has to begin. We've got siding to put on, windows to put in place, and a million other finished details to do, not to mention the roof. And we'll be spending a good deal of time in today's program talking with Norm about all the different problems we've had with this roof. How to tie in two different types of material, the old slate roof with the new asphalt shingle roof that'll be putting, that'll be going on there. We're also going to spend some time showing you how to install a skylight or a roof window. Lots of people are doing that nowadays, trying to get more space, living space, out of their attics and so forth. So Norm is going to give us a few tips on that. And we'll be visiting with Rich Trithui, our plumbing and heating contractor, who's going to look at our heating plant and look at the radiators, more importantly. Because we think we can keep the furnace that's in this house. It's an oil-burning furnace. It's not that old, and we're going to be doing a couple of tests on it to make sure it's burning all right. But the problem is with the radiators. Lots of them look to be really ancient, and we want to look at that with Rich. Before we get started with all of that, I thought we'd jump down in the hole behind me over here. We've been digging out to get a base or a new foundation for our garage building, which we had moved out of the way a couple of weeks ago. And we're getting closer to being able to move it back into place. But we had a few problems. Come on down. You know, you think with all the experience we've had pouring foundations, a small foundation for a garage building like this would be a piece of cake. Well, let me tell you the story behind this one. Before you do any digging on any site, you have to determine what, if any, utilities might be running through underneath. Gas, water, electric, sewage, and so forth. And here we, we were pretty sure that, judging from inside the basement, all, m most of those came in from the front of the house. However, the gas line did seem to come in from the backyard here where we're standing. So we called our local gas company, and they, free of charge, came out to determine where the pipe was. And sure enough, it was running right through the area that we had to ex excavate. They asked us to hand dig a small hole closest to the edge of the property line over here where they would disconnect the gas pipe for us. And what they did was they put in this temporary shutoff valve. And later on, when we're through with our work over here, they'll be able to hook up the gas service again for us. We'll have to dig a separate trench going back to the house. Well, that was problem number one. Then problem number two. We wanted to do this as simply as possible, which meant digging a trench with our backhoe just the width of a bucket, kind of, better than a foot, all around the perimeter, and just leaving the dirt as it was so that we could pour in the concrete, and that would be the foundation. Didn't work that way because of the quality of the soil here. It's kind of a combination of, well, clay and silt and powdery, and the result is that it kept caving in on us and caving in on us, and we couldn't get down as deep as we needed to without it continuing to get wider and wider. So that ruled out the possibility of a simple pour without any form work, which is expensive and which is what we were trying to avoid in the first place. So we had to build a form, but we haven't done the traditional type of form work for pouring concrete, which is two separate walls of plywood that later get removed. We've only built one and the concrete will actually be poured in here and we've left all the soil and materials that were in here in place. We didn't disturb those. So that what we'll do is one continuous pour that will cap off the foundation up to this point as well as continue in through here for the slab, so that in one operation, we'll be able to get our foundation and the slab in place. Of course, we'll have to put reinforcing wires in the slab up here. But next week, when you join me, you'll probably see the building that used to be the garage in its new home and being converted into our workshop. But most of the action today is taking place up there on the roof, and Norm's waiting for me over there. We want to get started with that, uh, that skylight. Let's go join him. Hi, Norman. Hey, Bob. Have I missed any of the action up here yet? Not yet. Good. I guess you're not used to all this new work. Uh, no. New well, construction. It's nice, though. What are you up to? Uh, well, we're getting ready to install this skylight, bef because before I can do any shingling, we want to get this in place. Mm -hmm. Now, this came prepackaged in a cardboard box. It's all one piece. It's huh? all one piece wooden frame. And I've removed the sash from it just to make it easier to install. Sure. And the next step that we have to do is to cut the hole for it through our roof sheathing. And we just 
sheathe over the whole thing to make it easier when we do the roof. And now we'll just cut it out and place the skylight in position. All right, I won't detain you. This is going to be one heck of a view up here. You get a good amount of light in there. All right. And then this just sits right in place. That's right. Like that. Beautiful. Oh, Bob, the next thing I have to do is fasten it to the roof. I've already installed these angle brackets to the skylight frame with three screws. And now what I'll do is first I'll tack it to the roof in these slots. One nail here, and one here, just to hold it so that I can check to make sure that this frame is square. I mean, it could have gotten racked in shipment That's or right. just moving it around. And the way we do that is with a tape by taking diagonal measurements like this. We measure this side. We see it's about 61 and an eighth inches. And then we measure this diagonal from the same point. And we see that that's about... 61 and an eighth, so that's pretty good. That's close to we, it. We can probably slide this just a little bit. Like that. Now that we know we have it square, we'll finish fastening it to the roof with some screws. All right, Bob, now that we've got this good and secure, let's go down to the bottom of the roof and continue with the shingling. All right. I notice you've got a full length of Douglas fir gutter on here. Any trouble installing it? Uh, no, we were fortunate enough we got a nice long 30-footer so that there's no joints, mm -hmm. which always tend to cause a problem. And how come you've got it spaced away from, from our fascia board back there? Well, we did that because we want air to circulate. We want a gap between there all the way around the gutter so that we can have air to circulate so no moisture gets trapped between this gutter and that fascia board. That'll ensure a long life for this, yeah. And then you've already got your... Uh... We've already got the drip edge on, which is a piece of galvanized steel and it serves two purposes. One is to allow the, a place for the water to run into the gutter, and it's rigid enough that it supports this first course of shingles. Mm -hmm. Now tell me about this. This is called the starter course, right? Right, this is the starter course, and all it is is a shingle that we've cut the bottom edge off of about five inches so that this uh, adhesive will be at the edge of the roof. Which means that when you put your first full shingle over it, the adhesive will stick to that shingle as soon as it gets hot in the first That's sunny right. day. And hold these right down. Let's talk about these shingles, because I know there's a couple of different types of asphalt roof shingles. And which kind are we using here? These are fiberglass blocks, or fiberglass mat. Mm -hmm. There's a paper mat and a fiber mat, fiberglass mat. This is a fiberglass mat. Well, what's the difference? Which is impregnated with asphalt. And its advantage is that, unlike paper, it doesn't absorb moisture. All right. Because if a shingle absorbs moisture, it will tend to curl. And once it does that, these granules that are on it will start to pop off. Well, these are mineral granules, like stone chips. That's right. And once those pop off, they're a protection. Yeah. Once they pop off, then the asphalt is exposed to the sun, which will ultimately destroy the That asphalt. ruins the life of the shingle. Talk about life of the shingle. What kind of a guarantee do you get with a fiberglass-backed shingle as opposed to paper? Well, because this does not absorb moisture, you can get about another five to ten years life out of the shingle. That's great. Shall we start tacking on a few? Sure. Got an extra hammer, or should no, I just go and lug another bundle you'll up? You'll have to lug up. All right. Okay, we've nailed down about seven courses of shingles, and now we're ready, Norm, to talk about how we keep this skylight installation watertight. That's right, Bob. We have some flashing pieces here that come with this skylight, and the first piece that goes on is this sill piece which we slip over the shingles mm -hmm. like that. And that comes into this corner. One, one note, this particular skylight requires no caulking or mastic of any kind. Just the metal pieces that come with it. That's right. We nail this to the frame. Always nail to the frame, never... You don't want any holes on the roof. That's yeah. right, never to the roof. Then the next step is to put the first shingle, which goes... Up there. Up 
Also, we don't want to nail through this flashing. Through the metal, yeah. Through the metal. Now the next step is to use step flashings, which are simply pieces of metal that are bent at a 90 degree angle. Yeah. And we put that over this part of the shingle, just above that adhesive line, so that when we put the next course of shingles down, they'll stick to each other, just like everywhere else, that's rather than just the metal. Yeah, that's a good point to remember. So we put the flashing in place again, put a small nail in the side, and then our next, like that. So the whole process is simply repeating the same step thing over flashing and over. shingle, step flashing shingle all the way up. And you only need one shingle on each piece of, I mean, one nail on each piece of uh, step flashing. That's right. All the way up until we get to this head piece, which is the last piece of flashing to go on. And that goes on top of our last piece of step flashing. Okay. And when, with the rest of the trim on the window, and it's totally waterproof. Excellent, and you don't need any kind of roofing cement or caulking. None whatsoever. Okay, Norm, while we're up here on the roof, let's talk about a couple of other special items. The old building that was here had a roof on it that was rather low. In fact, the ridge of it came underneath this overhang. So there was never a question of a problem between this roof and the old roof here. Now, we've raised the building so that we get headroom on the second floor. And that presents a special situation. That's right, because we ended up going over this, the old slate roof. Yeah. So what we had to do is remove these slates so that the framework could be done. Tied onto the, to the house, yeah. Right, and then after the framing was done, the first thing that happened is this copper valley was made up and installed. And then the slate was cut so that it ran along the valley line, top to bottom, nice, nice and straight. And it also gives us a flashing on this side to bring our asphalt shingles over so that we'll be in a, applying our shingles in a similar fashion to what the slate is. Mm -hmm. And from down below, you know, it's going to look very similar. That's right. Of course, the main thing is that we decided not to spend the extra money on using slates on this roof. Would have been very expensive. Yeah. The other thing we decided had to do with this section of roof, which is really, we're only talking about 12 feet. We decided not to put a wooden gutter there for a number of reasons, but we don't have any entrances down below, and we've got such a nice overhang anyway, it's over two feet here, that we're assured of not having the rainwater splashing down the sidewall or on the windows. But you also wanted to have the illusion of a gutter. Yes, from down, yeah. down below. So what we did to give you that is took a crown molding, a large crown molding, which is also applied over another piece of molding, so that from the ground you really get the look that there is a gutter here. Mm -hmm. But when we did that, we also created a problem, and that was that the face of this crown molding sticks out too far out beyond the slates by about three inches so we fabricated a piece of copper flashing that slips underneath these slates up to about here mm -hmm. and what that does is allows the water that comes off the slates to just be shed off of our roof line and the copper will last forever well at least 50 years i guess <laughs> all right thanks norm i'm going to go find rich grithui and talk about how we're going to heat this old house Hi, Richard. Hi, Bob. How are you? Well, what do you think of this old house? It's quite a, quite a collection of rooms here. Yeah, I've got enough to heat, too. Yeah. I well, thought we'd take a walk around the place and look at uh, the type of equipment that's already here. Let's take a peek at it. Come on in here. You know, one of my concerns is the size of these old clunkers, these old radiators, and whether we should hold on to them or whether they should be chucked out. Well, this house, its first heating system was a coal-fired heating system, which, mm -hmm. with coal, you always want to get the biggest radiators you could because Coal was such a slow and steady heat that the bigger the radio, the more, bet, the more terrific the heat was in the building. Yeah, well, this is why I was thinking maybe, for example, in this next room, we'd get rid of the radiator altogether. This is going to be the dining room, and, and I kind of see a round table in the middle, and mm -hmm. we're planning on French doors behind me here. Okay. I thought maybe the best thing would be to have modern baseboard heat in here. Well, I see a bit of a problem with that. If you're only going to have this much open wall here and just that wall there, mm -hmm. there really doesn't seem to be enough available wall space for a baseboard to heat this room. You also have this very low windowsill in these great windows that would make it 
a little tough to detail that baseboard. Mm. Radiators are not terrible in a nice big dining room well, like this. Well, it's also a room that you're only going to want to have heated when you're having dinner in it, but I thought it'd be easier to control that with new baseboard heat in it. Well, that's something that now with the technology that's available in heating, we could make this radiator controllable. We How do you make do that? Every radiator in this building its own zone. Um, if we mounted a radiator valve such as this on, this senses the temperature in the room and shuts this valve off according to the temperature in the room. You could leave here, shut it right down to zero and have no heat and get the heat where you want it in the rest of the building. And then just turn it up when you're making dinner. Right. Now this would mount right in there. This would come out and that's what it would look like. Mm -hmm. Not too obtrusive at all. Well, what kind of money are we talking about when we're Well, a valve, a valve this size would be probably uh, $50 for the valve plus what it took to install it. Certainly a better alternative in terms of dollars than baseboard. That would still be cheaper, wouldn't sure. it? Well, okay, so then you'd basically recommend we keep that radiator right. in this room. But what about back here in, in the library? Because I didn't really explain. This, this room is going to be a library with shelves basically along all the walls, floor to ceiling. And this would really be in my way. Well, you've got two choices, I would think. If you can afford to lose the space that the radiator would take, you could build the radiator into the opening. You lose a little bit of heat that way when you build it in. Or you could try and put some baseboard across the front edge. Along of, the perimeter. Uh, yes. And you want to put that baseboard whenever you can along the perimeter to get the heat loss with the, on the outside wall. You want, to, you want to heat it on the outside wall. If you're taking notes, write down that we'll put baseboard heat in here. Okay. And this, is, this is called your library. The library. And I just okay. don't like the idea of having a big radiator there and shelves up above it and so forth. Okay. Okay? You'd have to remember that this would also, this baseboard would, would, would require a thermostatic valve also. The same kind of control. Sure. What about, this is just the front hall. You're mm -hmm. never going to sit in it. But look at the size of the radiator in here. How terrific to have a nice big oversized radiator it is. Really? This is, this is where you open the door all the time. It's where all the cold air comes. Better to have a nice big radiator to be there when you need it. Have an, a thermostatic valve to come on as you need it, but always have a nice big one in reserve. I'd say to keep this right here. Richard, these valves have to be put on every single radiator in the house? That's the important thing. You, but you will get to balance in every room and the heat where you want it. Now, this is our living room. And this one, for example, the radiator doesn't, I, I mean, I was also thinking about maybe baseboard heating in here, but mm -hmm. this radiator doesn't bother me. Somehow it, it looks like it fits in this Seems room. Seems to fit, sure. And it's also in a location where the door will kind of hide yeah, it most of the, the time. The door would hide it. It fits the period of the house. You know, around the 1920s, you'd have the same problem with baseboard with the low windowsill. I don't mm. see any reason not to keep that right there. No, what do you think of that one over there, though? That's the problem. This was put in after the fact. You can tell by the new style radiator versus the other ones in the building. Uh-huh. Um, you know, I... Do you suppose this is from the 40s or the 1950s? Well, probably between that, around that period, yeah. I would love to have, ideally, the heat at one end, a radiator at one end, and a radiator here at the other end. Well, I can't do that, because once I tear out this wall, mm -hmm. uh, the room will be all the way to that back wall, but I'm having this as a media center. There's uh -huh. going to be a projection TV screen and hi-fi equipment and storage okay. units, and I can't put a, a radiator back there. Well, maybe out of necessity, we'll have to put it there, but we can, I can get you a, a low style radiator to match that one, and we put a thermostatic valve on it. You can get one, a salvage one, you mean? Well, you could get a used one, sure. They're pulling them out quite often. And believe me, Bob, when the, the room's empty like this, they look like, they stick out like a sore thumb. Sore thumb, right. But once you decorate, get some furniture in, you really will blend it right into the room. That usually is the case. Yeah. Let's go upstairs a minute. I've okay. got some other spaces to show you. You know, Richard, I imagine this house was really miserable, cold and drafty on the ground floor, and all the heat would collect on the second floor here, and you'd be boiling, and yeah. no way to control it. It really would be stifling, uh, but that's something we're going to correct with balancing the system. Uh, I certainly hope so. about, sure. Yeah. This area in here used to be two separate bedrooms, Richard. Mm -hmm. And what we're doing is calling it all the master bedroom suite. We will put a wall back in this area so that we can locate a bed up against it, okay. and then the bureau and a table and so forth in mm -hmm. this area. Um, through here, we'll have a passageway connecting with my dressing room and my bathroom. And the problem is right here. Uh, this this uh -huh. is going to be a bumper. Okay. So what do you suggest we do? Uh, you've got two options as I see it. One is to, to relocate this, to take it and relocate it perhaps over here, out of sight, you know. Um, behind the door? Behind the door, out of sight, there when you need it for some heat. And the other option is to put baseboard here around the perimeter. Well, what would you suggest? 
there's often a complaint about putting the baseboard because it's impossible to put the bureau in tight against the wall. And you drop everything over right. the back of it. And, and so also, the bedroom is uh, a room that you really don't want all that much heat in. Sometimes you'll want to keep it a little cooler. I guess more and more people are going towards a cool bedroom at night. Sure, yeah? sure. So the cheapest thing for us to do then is to move the radiator into the so. corner. I but what, ab what about back here? Um, what do you me, think? Let me explain how mm -hmm. this gets divided. There basically is a wall that goes up down the middle of it. Okay. So the area over here is just uninteresting. Okay. Close storage and, and inside, dressing area. Inside space, yeah. But over on this side of the wall, I'll mm -hmm. have the, the lavatory, the toilet, and the bathtub. Okay. And nothing goes up against the outside so wall. So this is all open. We'll insulate as well as we can. Okay. But I don't really want to see an old old-fashioned radiator in here. Well, you probably, where all this is open, this outside wall is open and you don't have the low sills as you do on the first floor, mm -hmm. baseboard might make a lot of sense here with its own thermostatic valve to control it but, and then coat this perimeter and keep the bathroom a little warmer than, mm -hmm. you know, than the other rooms. Give the heat that you need when you need it. Is it possible to put baseboard on one end of the space and a radiator mm -hmm. at the other? With a balance system with valves on each piece of radiation, there's no problem. Okay. Well, that's probably the way to go. Besides, mm -hmm. there won't be any furniture in here to be yep. kept away from the walls. For sure. Let's take a look at the, the new L. Okay. Rich, I wish you could have seen this space before, before we tore it down and rebuilt it. This is just what we wanted, but the, the ceilings used to be down here. Huh. This is going to be our exercise room, mm -hmm. and at this far end of it, we're, we're going to have a sauna bath, a steam shower, and a full bathroom. Terrific. And then there, there will be a wall going up right along here okay. to separate the exercise room from the staircase that we're building, Coming up there. which goes up to the apartment. Uh -huh. And then over here, picture this all in sliding glass doors opening Beautiful. onto a four foot wide terrace going the whole width of the building. So I'm really excited about it. I can just see, you know, tumbling mats, exercise machine, all sorts of now we gadgets have, in here. Now we have to heat it? Yeah, we got to heat it. Well, I see, I noticed that first off, you've built it real well with the two by sixes, so I would assume that you're going to fill that in with as much insulation as you can. Six inches of insulation, yes. And again up there. As much as we can, probably 12 inches. Okay, this, this sort of window doesn't scare me. I assume it will be a thermal, a thermal window. Insulated glass, yes. That, you know, we will get even some solar gain out of it. We're getting some heat from below, and mm -hmm. we're getting some sun coming in through this exposure. So what do you We don't recommend? really have that much heat loss in here. We, we have, the other thing I noticed is we don't have that much wall space of outside wall available for baseboard. Maybe huh. an old radiator would be relocated I, here. I don't like the idea of putting an old radiator in this brand new sleek space. Okay. Or you can go with a steel radiator, or a wall-mounted steel radiator that looked very attractive and they, they give good heat. One of those very modern looking yeah. ones. All right, that's the, thing, the, okay. one, the one thing to keep in mind, and this would probably be the one room to do it in. Okay, we can do again in the back bathroom here too. Okay, let's take a look at, at the apartment since okay. we just mentioned it. Now Richard, this used to be a kitchen here. And with our new entry up the staircase, we really thought it was a bad idea to keep the kitchen right here. It was pretty crummy to begin with. Mm -hmm. and, and we've left this for you and your fellows uh -huh. to deal with because there's such a bit of archaeology of plumbing here, I thought you ought to take a look at it. A little cast iron, galvanized, copper, plastic, a little bit of everything. Would have been a problem anyway. <laughs> yes. So now we'll enter into a nice living area or sitting mm -hmm. area, whatever you want to call it. We removed the wall that was dividing these mm -hmm. two rooms. And we haven't designed it yet, but we will be installing a small kitchen area okay. here at the southwest corner. Mm -hmm. Now, what do you think about heat? First off, I notice you've got a couple of radiators here. I guess you used to have two rooms, so you'd have two radiators mm -hmm. on the inside wall, which is a terrible place to have any sort of heat. You want it, as I've said before, on the outside That's wall. That's the wrong place for the source of heat, isn't the it? The reason is obvious. Laziness. They wanted to come up through this open chase, and it was very easy to put those, pipe these radiators right up, right up in here. As far as new heat, we can do a couple of things. One is to take these radiators and put them on the outside wall. Mm -hmm. I don't know. It's, a, it's an awful small space to be using up with these big radiators. Maybe it would make a lot of sense to go around the perimeter here with baseboard. Well, the least expensive alternative would be to move them. Yes. But I see your point. They are kind of yeah. big for yeah. a small space. The added advantage of that baseboard here is that we could go with a separate flow and return line down to the boiler. What would that do for me? Well, it would give us the advantage that in the future we could set them up with a separate boiler or a BTU meter of some sort to monitor the heat so that they would, the tenants, the future tenants would be responsible for their own heat. I like that. Yeah. Yes. So what do we do with the, uh, the cast iron if we're not going to use it? Can well, we salvage, uh, sell it to a salvage yard or something? There's a very little salvage value left in, in cast iron radiators. You can either try and, you know, get them out with uh, brute labor or in one can, piece. Yeah, or you can smash them up uh, with a sledge and go out a window and... And just toss them in the dumpster. Sure. 
No, There's very little no salvage there. value left, huh? They used to be, not anymore. Okay, well, let's plan mm -hmm. on getting rid of them and putting in baseboard heat for the whole perimeter. Okay. Come on down to the kitchen. That's the last stop I want to make. Okay. Okay, Richard, you can go into the kitchen area either through the back hall here mm -hmm. or through my French doors, which obviously are not in place yet. Let me give you a quick rundown of the space. I think it's the best room in the whole house. This will be the eating area mm -hmm. where will be a table. Okay. Fantastic floor in here, and this will all be glass behind me. Okay, great. And then above me, a bank of skylights. Mm -hmm. So that it's going to be a very sun-filled room. Mm -hmm. Then on the other end of it, up here, we'll have a whole wall of cabinets. This will be the wet wall. Okay. And all the appliances except for the stove. I, I think we're going to build an island unit here okay. to house the stove. Then on the north end of the kitchen, incidentally, it's about 24 feet from one end to the other. I've got enough space. room to frame a wall right here, put in a toilet and a washstand, uh, a lavatory. Mm -hmm. And then this section in here will become the office for the kitchen. Okay. Telephone shelves, a little yep. desk, and so forth. Incidentally, this is not a doorway. We just have left it open so that we can come in and out with materials, but there'll be a good-sized window here. Okay, and the final item is the, the kitchen door, which is Going through this mudroom. Okay, correct. So it's, it's a very versatile space. What do you think about it, uh, heating it? Again, you've got that great two-by-six new construction, nice and tight, and you've left available to me this all this exposed north wall that I think baseball would do the trick in this area mm -hmm. right here. Mm -hmm. We do have to still get some heat over well, this way. You've got another solid so wall along here. There won't yep. be, we haven't finished framing it, but this will be yeah. all closed in. About eight feet, maybe. Yeah. About eight feet. Again, this is mm -hmm. the north, so we didn't want a window yep. there. Yep. And then just what's left in the corner. Okay. Well, I think with a kitchen like this, with so many variables, you've got all this glass, you've got solar gain, you've got some loss going out, all the kitchen appliances giving off heat. Uh, I think I should go back to the office and do a heat loss computation before I say, the baseboard's going to do it here. We it, might have to go into some wall radiators or something like that. It could. It is the trickiest one to figure yeah, out. Yeah, I think so. Okay. Well, get to work, because I want to see the fellas getting started here okay. pretty soon. Talk to you soon. Thanks for coming out, Richard. We've run out of time to do the oil check on the furnace, and we'll do that next week. And we're also going to take a field trip next week to a salvage yard, where we're hoping to find the new floor for the kitchen. It's of summer, right. but we have made a lot of progress around here in the last couple of weeks. As you can see, the newly rebuilt L on the house is all sheathed. The roofing is underway. We'll have gutters on it before too long, and we're expecting delivery of the new sliding doors and skylights that go in there. And we've made some further progress with our old garage building, which has been moved to a new location on a new foundation, and structurally, at least, is in good shape. We'll be cutting out a window in here, and this will become a workshop. We've got a problem with paint everywhere we look here at this old house. Here it's peeling rather easily, and uh, we don't have that much time before it gets too cold to do outside work. So we've been considering what to do with the garage building and the main house, whether we should sandblast it or not. And before we make that decision, we're going to be looking at a few other alternatives to paint removal. We'll talk about that later. I want to get started in here. Norm's in there finishing off strapping the ceiling. And we've got a number of considerations to make, one of them being the flooring material in there. Norm, can you take a break? Hi, Bob. How are we doing in here? Oh, pretty good. We've got our ceiling all strapped. and our interior partitions up mm -hmm. and over in this area we've got our four skylights all framed out okay for our sunroom and they're coming and this week right? that's right they're coming this week and now we're in a position that we can bring our plumber and electrician in to do rough wiring and rough plumbing and in about a week or so we can insulate and then we'll be ready for blue board and plaster maybe in two weeks I'm glad you've got I almost tripped on this but you've got this detail just the way I wanted it you frame this down lower by what, two inches? By about two inches. Okay. The idea here is that we wanted to use a quarry tile, which is not a very regular standard flat tile. It's a, it's a concave tile, and it needs to be put down in cement. In and mud. you'll have a good mortar bed here to get the floor nice and even. Exactly. But I want tile just in this area where it's going to be sunlit all day. And back in here, in this part of the kitchen, I want, I want a wooden floor. I'm just not convinced what the best material will be. Well, you have uh, a couple choices. You could go to a parquet or an oak floor. I think a parquet or a, an oak floor, like the ones we've used in the past in other houses, is maybe a little bit too slick to be contrasted with the quarry tile I've got in mind. I want something more rustic. Yeah, more rustic and natural, maybe a little wider. Well, a little while ago, we did a job in Boston where the owner found old timbers, yellow pine timbers. Timber floor? No, he take the timbers and he had them re-sawn so that they were made into flooring. 
tongue and groove and made into flooring. And it looks really nice. Sounds neat. Could we ever take a look at that? Sure, we can look at it right now if you'd like. Let's go for a drive. Okay. Well, Norm, where are we? Well, we're on the Boston waterfront. And this is an old warehouse that was converted into condominiums about three years ago. Beautiful space, huh? Yeah, it is. I did a lot of the finish work in here, and you wanted to see yellow pine. Well, I have plenty to show you here. I'm seeing it. I'm seeing it. First of all, these doors are all solid yellow pine and uh, all handmade. Custom job. They're and, yeah, beautiful. And they're really beautiful. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, one of the things about yellow pine that's so good about it is it's very stable. Well, what do you mean by stable? Well, by stable, I mean it tends not to cup like regular pine does or twist. Mm, and what is it in the wood that, that does that? Well, the thing that does that is that it has a very tight grain and the level of pitch in it that dictates it's very stable. That'll do it. This is beautiful. Yeah, isn't it? Yeah. Even the cabinet doors. Up here you can see they're all yellow pine and nice panels. And inside, everything's yellow pine. How have they finished it? Uh, it's like an oil, probably a tongue oil. Just a very thin oil, yeah. And it really leaves that natural look. Is that and yellow it, pine on that countertop behind That's right. You? This is yellow pine. It's a little bit thicker, almost an inch and a half thick. And you can see it's about four boards wide. And, you know, this just proves its stability. Look how well it's held yeah, up. Yeah, there hasn't been any shrinkage or anything. Nice and tight. Well, we came to look at floors, and these are really beautiful floors, Norm. Sure are. What I like about them is the width of all these of all these planks. You know, these are about nine or ten inches wide, and it really shows the characteristics of the wood. We have this real tight grain along both of the edges, and then in the middle we kind of have an interesting wider grain. Yeah, look at the pattern over here where there's a, a knot, and then it just kind of darkens up and carries through in two directions. Right. Now you might think that's a knot, but what that is is a, a giveaway that this was from a beam, formerly from a beam, re -sawn. and what was probably there was some kind of a rod or a bolt. And so we just put a plug in it to cover up that Terrific. Hole. Well, it's, it's not, uh, you know, it doesn't glare out at you. It looks good. How do you go about laying a floor like this? Is it complicated to install? It's not a very complicated process. What we did here, Bob, is we drilled holes through the yellow pine boards uh, to accept some screws. And we screwed the floor to the plywood subfloor. Mm -hmm. And then after that, we made plugs from exactly the same material and put those in to cover the screws. And, and you leave them stick up a little bit and when the floor is sanded, they come out nice and even. Mm, I'm really sold on this stuff. I think it'd look great in our kitchen, but how do you go about getting it? I'm, I've heard that you can get one by three yellow pine, but to get nice boards like that. That's right. The only way you can get that is, is from old timbers. And you know, out here, there used to be a lot of warehouses that were torn down, and that's exactly what they were framed with, this big yellow pine Yellow pine timbers. 12 by 12 timbers. Over on the other side of Boston Harbor, there's uh, an old salvage yard that is saved all these beams, and, and they'll also cut them into planks for you. That's the place to get them, huh? Hey, I'm on my way. Okay, I'll give you the address. Good morning. Yes, sir. This is the wrecking company, right? Yes, it is. Kind of looks like a bank. Uh, is this for sale? Everything is for sale. That right must price. be, looks like it's Onyx. Where did you get this? This came from Hull back in the 30s. It was in a gambling casino that never opened. It was the bar of the casino and my grandfather got the uh, contract to strip it. And you've had it here ever since, huh? It's been here as long as I can remember. Boy, it would make, do you sell it in sections maybe? I mean, it's a little bit too no, big for a house bar. Someday it'll probably go, but the whole thing will go at once. Yeah. Well, actually, I, 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 I'm not looking for marble. I was told that you had the best stock of hard pine, yellow pine, and I'm looking to put in a yellow pine floor in my kitchen. We got a pile of it. Could we take a look at it? Sure. Great. Whereabouts is it? Down back. Is this for sale also, or is this stuff? Uh... No, that's what we keep records in. Uh -huh. Very little money. Very little <laughs> money? Uh, is this salvage doll? This is oak. Uh, it came from a high school. It's, uh, was, there was two of them in every room of the high school. And they, what happened to the high school? They, they stripped just... it and uh, remodeled it. This is all nice oak with brass hardware on it. Something it's like a... that for sale? Yeah, this particular one, I sold 40 of them. You sold 40 of them. What do you get for something like this? This is a, an old uh, bathroom sink, probably out of the early 1900s, right? Something like that. Vermont marble? I think so, yeah. Uh, how much? Uh, what are you offering? 25? Come up, come up. Let me think about it. This is all salvage stuff, right? Yeah. yeah. That looks like an old gas fixture. 
You got the globe for it? No, that's the way it is. Two dollars? Five bucks. Five. Well, I could spend an hour here before we get to the wood. This is, gee, this looks a lot like some of the radiator valves my plumber's offering me for about $50 a piece. Well, they go both three, four, five dollars a piece. Oh, yeah? Have you got a lot of them? No, there's only a couple in there. Oh. Ha! Huh. This is super. That's from St. John's in Roxbury. The church got torn down? Yeah, they had a fire in the school, and then the church, there was no more parishioners, so they tore the church down. It's a real pretty piece of stained glass, it's but... About, it's about 100 years old. But it does need a lot of tender, love, and care. It's been around for 100 years, but not anybody touching it. $25? They're $100 a piece. $100 a piece? Well, I, I'm getting uh, off the track here. Mm. Uh, yellow pine is what I really well, wanted to look at. And this is what you're probably looking for a floor. Do you sell it like this? is two boards that you've got here. Yeah, they're about 13 inches, but the normal stuff we're cutting now is around 12 inches. <coughs> Do you sell it already no, dressed like this? With, when we cut it, it's cut, rough cut. Uh, so this you is have just to a mock-up you've you got have to here. edge it. This is just a mock-up to show what it looks like when it's finished. It's where, do you, a, where do you get it? I mean, you don't rip out boards. No, do you? this is cut from timbers that we take out of old buildings. We salvage the timbers and then we bring them down. Certain timbers you can cut and certain timbers you can't cut. Uh, about one out of three you can cut. So yeah. the wood's already pretty old before... Uh, well, these are a hundred years old before we even started. Before you cut up the They're a hundred years in a building. Well, close to a hundred years. It was 1887 on Atlantic, uh, well, the waterfront in Boston. Yeah. Next to the Coast Guard station. What do we pay for it? Dollar and a half. Dollar and a half a board foot? Right, dollar and a half a board foot. Could we take a look at the operation? Right out here? Sure. <laughs> Your girl will take care of you in a minute. Boy, you've got a little bit of everything here, but <clears throat> used aluminum windows and shutters. That's... Well, anything comes out of a building, we've got it. But who wa who'd want to buy an old shutter? Where you can... Hey, anybody who wants a shutter. What do you get for this? Two, three dollars a piece. Depends on the size and the well, shape that they're in. It's, it's solid, yeah. And if you went out and bought a replacement or one of those plastic ones, you paid right. 15 or 20. But wow, you could practically build a house with all the junk you've got. Oh, excuse Many. me, materials you've got here. Many people have built houses here. What do you get for a window like this? Oh, 30 dollars. 30 bucks. Okay. It's single glass. Hey, if you go out and buy it in a new place, a new uh, lumberyard, see what you pay for it. Yeah, a couple of hundred dollars for a double setup like this. That is a beautiful mantle over here. Do you always leave that out in the weather like that? No, somebody brought that out, probably wanted to buy it, and then they haven't brought it back in yet. How much? Hundred and a half. Hundred and fifty dollars. Looks like it's oak. It is oak. Wow. Order number 933 from Irving and Casson, East Cambridge, 1880-something. That's an old, old company. They're still in existence, I think. Mm-hmm. Look at the thickness of this oak plank on the top for the shelf. Very, and very nice, and $150 seems like an absolute bargain. I don't think I need one today, but I'll keep it in mind. That's, that's, that's older, that's, that's old. That's an antique. Yeah. Probably around 1820, something like that, 30s, 1830s. How can you tell when you look at an old door? I mean, it's well, a beautiful, it's, simple door, no moldings or anything. But well, what, what? It's modest in the thickness of the door. The thickness of the door is one of the yeah. one of the giveaways. It's only about an the inch. The old type of latch that was on it. Mm -hmm. This could be stripped down to natural pine. And yeah. How much? Oh, $40. There's another bargain. Seems to me like the older materials are nicely priced around here. Well, you have to sell them. Yeah. Now, these these are all relatively new materials, but are these uh, fire-rated doors? Or? Well, they're metal doors. Ah. People want them for security. That's the main reason they'd want to buy them. Right. What do you get for a steel door like this? Oh, 40 to $50. Well, you know how much you pay for the hinges new? Probably 35 That's right. Excellent. But all these piles of old sash, you mean some fellow will come in here and pay for this? Well, if you've got a broken window in your house and it is and uh, you have to buy one, you're gonna pay uh, 11 to $15, you're gonna go down here and pay three. Yeah, just buy a couple of new panes of glass. Spend a little time looking for the right size, that's all. And the sinks, it looks like you've got half of the sinks in the city and collected them over here. Well, every house has got a sink. Yeah. Or two or three. What does an old kitchen sink like this sell for? Uh, $30. 30 bucks, cast iron. These look like that's they're soapstone thing. over here. Those have come from a laboratory. They're soapstone or a man-made. But they're chemical resistant. Yeah, and they still hold water. I think those come out of the Mass General. I'm not they're sure. They're really heavy. How much? Oh, about $30 again. 
All you got to do is pick it up and cart it away. Seems like everything is thirty dollars, but that's the way it is. That green door looks a lot like the doors I've got in the house I'm fixing up right now. It's not as old as the white one we were just looking at. Would you say about 1870 or thereabouts? Uh, maybe a little bit uh, newer than that. But brass hinges around that area. Yeah, there's brass under there. How much? Oh, 40 bucks. It's got a cracked panel. All right, so 35. I'm not going to argue with you. Okay, we're getting closer to the lumber, I guess. Huh? That is, uh, that's pretty impressive. That you got the whole entryway out of a building someplace. Yeah, I come from the back bay. Uh, one yeah. of the schools is remodeling. We got that out of there. It's going to San Antonio, Texas. What? To Texas? That's where it's going. The fellow's coming at the end of the month to pick it up. Gonna truck it down there. Beautiful brass hardware. What kind of wood is it? Mahogany. All he's got to do is strip all this gray paint That's off it. of it, and he's got the original glass on here. It's beveled. What did you sell it to him for? Five hundred. Seems like a seems like a pretty fair deal. Well, he wants it. Yeah, you got to figure in the trucking, but you couldn't reproduce that at a mill today. For... Oh, it would take you a while. Look at the beadwork. Yeah. Right? yeah, it's beautiful. Well, you certainly got a lot of timbers back well. here. <clears throat> These came out of a church. Most all of this pile and the big pile down further is all out of the from the waterfront in Boston. It's all yellow pine? It's all yellow pine in these piles. Boy, it, are they easy to come by? Are they still tearing down lots uh, of these buildings? They're not, they're not tearing down as much as they used to before. They finally get to realize that a lot of them, they're remodeling, and they're, uh, they're worth... The structurally, they're still sound, so they're remodeling. And them. they're worth preserving these them, yeah. These happen to be that the, the government wanted these down for the Coast Guard Station. Uh -huh. And some of this building was, you can see on the end of the beams, it's kind of rotted. This is a 12 by 12 pulling down there. We'll cut that one up. 12 inches squared. You mean you're going to you're gonna cut all of these up for flooring? I mean, is that 12 by 12, 12 by 14? Not all of them. Be, there's only about one out of uh, three that you can cut up for flooring. You mean because some of them are just too badly cracked and checked? Uh, checked, wrong, wrong uh, slash grain. They look like they've had 10 coats of paint put on them. Well, yeah. they've been in been the building for uh, 80 years or more. Uh-huh. How heavy is it? About four pounds to a foot. Four so pounds per board yeah, foot? Per board foot. That's where yellow pine runs. So here you've got about 12 board feet. So a running uh, foot of this would be... That's, that's a little bit more. That's 14 by 14. So it would be about 50 pounds to a running foot. Every foot of this timber would weigh about 50 pounds. So we've right. got about a 500-pound timber. Right. A little bit better, maybe. And then you've got a little sawmill operation we can take yeah. a look at? Yeah. We can show you how they cut them. All right. Where did you get the idea to first start uh, ripping these timbers down into floorboards? Well, we did it about 20 years ago. We started it, but uh, it really didn't go big till a few years back. My uncle uh, decided he wanted the floors in his house made out of it, down in Hingham. <laughs> so uh, when he put them down, they looked so good, and people saw it, and they wanted it. And then a lot of people down near Tuckett and Martha's Vineyard in the old uh, sailing house, the captain's sailing houses, yeah. They replaced the floors down there, and they liked it so well that now it's uh, can't get enough of it. Tell me about the process here. Well, let uh, let Benny explain to you. This is Ben. Will you? Hi. Hi. How are you? Good. Good. What Let's do you have you. to do with these old timbers before you can saw them? Well, we, we have to look them over real carefully, and I'll get all the nails and any iron this and there might be in there. Just and, to uh, save your blades. Yeah, and to make. Uh, make can it. we can we take a look in here? Oh, sure. What's uh, what's this called? This is a carrying chair. You uh, put the timbers on it and it pulls it into it the saw. Looks like an antique. Oh no, it's not. It's uh, it's about thirty. How do you actually get that five hundred pound timber sitting on top of the? Uh... Well, I'll show you. Okay. We got uh, a couple of peavies. I mean, that kind of looks like a traditional logger's tool. <laughs> yeah, this is this is handy and it's uh, not too hard to roll a timber. Then you have to dog it down to make sure that the timber don't go running around. Uh-huh. Dog it down, huh? Yeah. Beautiful. And then she's just going to roll over in this direction. Right. What kind of a blade is that that you use? Oh, that's a four-foot uh, circular saw. It's got inserted teeth you can see there and it's uh 
You can, uh, if you hit a nail or a piece of iron, you can always put new teeth in it. They okay. can be, so and you, you can file them too a long If you time ruin now. one of the teeth, you can replace it without having to replace the whole wheel. Sure. What's this do right here? Well, it's a spreader. Sometimes the lumber will come together when you start cutting it, you know, and it'll, uh, it'll keep it apart so the saw don't gum up and it can keep pretty good, uh, keep cutting right along. Can we see it running? Yeah. See, look, we get out of the way so nobody gets hurt here. Yeah. Fine. You sound like you probably grew up the same place that the uh, yellow timbers grew up. Yeah, I did. A lot of them come from right down in Georgia. Yeah, down near Savannah. Where do you start it? <laughs> it's a switch here. And then there's a switch up here. It takes all the sawdust out. Good-looking stuff. You can't get this uh, out of your average lumber yard. No, nope, you now, can't. You can't this, buy it. Is this the way you sell it? You don't plane it? No, you'd have to have to take it someplace else to have it planed. Another mill, if you can find another mill to plane. The only thing uh, you'd have to do is uh, edge it. But this is exactly the way we sell it. Yeah, OK. All we'd have to do then is cut the edges, rip it down so that it's all square. Just to square your edges uh, and uh, make sure the width is exactly right when you put it down. Is, is the, the quality of this yellow pine such that you have to plane it, or could I just put it down on the floor well, and run a sand Some run? people plane one side of it and put it down uh, uh, just to verify the thickness of it, but you can put it down just the way it is after it's edged, yep. and then you screw it to the floor, bring it up, to, wedge it up tight, screw it to the floor, and then bung it or peg it on the top. Then you bring in a sander and just sand it down to finish and then Terrific. finish it off afterwards. Super. I'm going to need about 200 board feet of it. Can no we put problem. an order in for me? No problem. Okay. Thanks very much. Hey, my pleasure. Norm, Hi, I've ordered the kitchen floor. Great. Oh, it's going to be beautiful. And you should see all the incredible stuff they've got at the salvage yard. I could have stayed there all day. Well, now, uh, a few weeks ago, we looked at a sandblasting operation, removing tons of paint off of old clabbers. And today, we're going to look at some alternatives to that, because pretty soon we've got to decide whether we're going to sandblast it or not. So what right. have you got to show us here, Norm? Well, first, to remove the paint from the clapboards, we have, first of all, we have scrapers, which are probably the simplest tool. And you have to carry one of these files around all yeah. the time to sharpen this, this blade, which is just a piece of hardened steel. Yeah. Now, this is a large one, which you can try. And I'll try this smaller one. <laughs> Well, Norm, this, this gets the soft stuff, I mean the loose stuff, right off, but this really built up alligator kind of paint doesn't come off very That's easily. That's right, it doesn't come off, and if we paint over this, it's just going to peel again, and it's going to loosen up the same way. And our goal here is to strip this right back to the wood so that we can use a stain. Yeah. Because a stain will, will hold better and... Uh, hold up to the weather much better. Yeah, we know the clabbards themselves are in pretty good shape. That's there's right. just tons of paint on it. So this, this takes a lot of muscle, but it can be done. Well, it's certainly a good tool for all the loose stuff. That's right. The next tool is a heat paint remover. Looks like a curling iron. It's just a simple heating element on a, on a pad. And let me see, I'll put it right here. 
And we use that along with this Whoops. putty knife just to scrape away the paint after it's loosened up. What I'm thinking is that this thing is about uh, the size of a three by five card, and the house is about 40 by 25. I could be here for two or three years. It would take an awful long time to do it with that, but you know, this is a good tool if you might want to do the front door or a small the window area, for sashes example. or something like that. It works, that's it works nice. pretty well. Yeah, that's real nice. So it's something really worth considering for a smaller job. That's right. Or even furniture refinishing mm -hmm. or something like that. Okay. Now the next tool we have is this rotary disc and That looks sander. serious, yeah. It's a good heavy-duty tool, and you could rent one of these at the local rental shop. You'd have to purchase the disc, which are just a coarse grit sandpaper, and they run about 75 cents a piece. And stripping paint, they tend to get gummed up rather fast, mm -hmm. but let's give that a try and see what it does. We need a particle That's mask, right. I think. And a, and a pair of goggles. Yeah. Well, you could spend quite a few days and quite a few 75 cents buying pads for this. And you see a lot of lines in the wood. It does kind of put in these circular marks into the wood that make it look almost like old sawdust or something. I, I'm not sure that this is that much of an improvement over the, the effect of sandblasting, which is to somewhat open the grain or raise the grain. Of course, it is a, a nice tool to rent if you're just doing a small area or doing it yourself. That's right. I'm leaning a lot towards sandblasting, but I'm really concerned about this all the window trim. Well, one of the things you have to be careful, Bob, is I don't think we should let the sandblast touch this area because by sandblasting this, it's gonna, we're going to lose the detail of exactly. these moldings. Exactly. It's already lost under all the built-up paint. But... but what we can do is, if we, being that you would sandblast it, have him protect these moldings while he does the clapboard. Cover up the whole window cavity. That's yeah. right. Then we can have the painter come in, and I'll show you something that he might use to clean those up. It would be a combination of things. One would be this sort of hair dryer looking thing that is just a heat gun mm -hmm. that blows hot air. And we would use with that a variety of scraping tools of different shapes to conform to different moldings. Now, if you didn't have a molding that shape, the shape was different, you could always grind this down to make it work. Mm -hmm. Now, once you heat up a section right here, and okay. the combination of these things, you could use this scraper by itself, but you have to put a lot of pressure and you take a chance of putting gouges in the wood. Yeah. But what that heat gun does is softens up the paint just enough to make it sort of the texture of putty. And you see it kind of peels right off. And you don't get those gouges in the wood. So with this, I think this will do the job. It'll take a little bit of time. Let me go up here. Yeah. It works really nice. Yeah, it leaves the wood uh, looking like brand new. Oh, that's the way to go, Norm. That's the key. Yeah, this tool could become uh, relatively addictive. Two speeds. Okay, I think we ought to rent a couple of these or borrow a couple and get started on it. We're running out of time for today. Next week, we're going to be visiting a window mill where pine comes in one end and comes out the other end looking like sash. And in a few of, a few of these openings, we'll have replacement sash. Till then, I'm Bob Vila for this. Hey, a lot of progress. This is our eighth episode, and there's lots to show you. One of the things we'll be talking about today has to do with all the old sash here at this old house. We had to make some decisions whether to keep the old ones or to put new ones in. Come on inside. Well, we've got about 15 windows here at this old house, and a dozen of them are in this condition. Norm and I were looking at them, and they've got serious problems, such as loose rails, and we're not even sure we, we could fix something like that. And I don't know how you go about replacing a mutton that's been broken off and in this condition. 
but we figured it would take at least three or four hours of a carpenter's time. And we're not even sure what kind of an end result we'd have, but we know that would cost about 30 or $40. Well, we lucked out. There's a sash company in our vicinity that still manufactures the same exact size window. It's beautifully made. It's the same construction, same size muttons and everything else, except that it's new, and it only costs about $30 per sash. So the decision was easy to make. Last week, I went out and visited the plant where they make them, and we spoke with Louis Lemire, who runs it. Let's take a look. This is a wooden sash bob like they've been making for about 100 years. Typical, yeah. In order to make this sash, you have to mill nine parts. Hmm. You have your sash heights, your sash bars, your mutton, meeting rails, bottom rails. The bottom rail is one of the most complex pieces, isn't it? Yes, it is. Well, it looks like a lot of work. They all have to fit with precision. Where does the whole process get started? That begins over here, Bob. With a lumber pile. What kind of lumber are you using? This is ponderosa pine. Why ponderosa pine? It's a soft pine, and it adheres to our milling. Is it inexpensive? It's one of the lower prices. I would think that piece would be a giveaway. I mean, uh, is this typical of the quality lumber that you buy? Well, we cut the defects out of it and save the good pieces. And you end up with, well, how do you, how do, you do that? Well, that begins over here. What she's doing, she's cutting the defects out. She's cut this out and this out. And then you're going to end up with little Drunk pieces blocks. of blocks to make the window parts up. OK? Go ahead. Is this a it complicated takes, job? Does, does she really have to know a lot about the different types of knots? It takes six months to train a person for this really? job. Why so long? Because it's different grades, different cuts. Yeah. You have to. Uh, you have certain boards where you have certain knots in it. Certain defects are allowable. Okay. Now what happens next with all these short little pieces of wood? That begins over here. Okay. In order to make windows out of these small blocks, we have to put them back together against a reasonable length. Sure. This is how we do that, with a finger joint machine. Every single short block of wood is joined together like this. Huh? Yes. Pretty complicated looking process. How it does is that actually happen? This is how it's done. The wood is put on the belt and it's hit by a trim saw, which uses a square edge. Then it goes to the finger joint ahead where the grooves are put in it. From that point, the glue is put on it. What kind of glue? A waterproof glue. When, after the glue is put on, it goes to the clamp press uh -huh. and it's set for 30 seconds. Then it is cut to size and it's the finished product. And you could actually make up any length you wanted, right? Yes. Right now we make up to 12 foot. Uh-huh. These are about three and a half footers. Now, how strong is it? It's as strong as a one-piece wood. What's the next step? It goes, next process, it goes to the molder. Mm -hmm. Now, what have you got over here? After it's molded, it looks like this. See how tight the joint is? Joint. Yeah. Wonderful. Let's see the rest of the operation. Now we go to the molder. OK. Well, Bob, to continue the process, we have to go to this impressive machine to make window sills. This stock is not finger jointed. It's clear stock. Uh huh. What we do, we put it through the molder, and we make this. This is a window sill. Your typical window sill, yeah. This would be the top of it. Can we see it running? Sure, Steve.
well. What goes on over here? This is a single uh, sash tenoner. Tenoner, as in mortise and tenon joint. Yes. What okay. it does is take sash plugs like this with the clear stock, uh -huh. and it does the end detail work on it. Same cut on both ends. Can yes. we see it running? Sure. Keep it. How many of those will it put out every hour? We put hundreds of them out per hour, and they're all exactly the same. Yeah, you mean there's no variation in any of these different pieces? None at all. All right. The series of copes and tendons, so when the other sash rod meets, it's tight and with them. Right in there. So, all right, what's the next step? Next we go to the sash molder. And let's find out what the sash molder does. Well, the last machine did the end work. A sash molder will do the lengthwise. Okay. All of this cutting on the top. It looks like there's, I mean, there's a curved surface, a flat surface, and then another sure. groove in here, like this a is, rabbit. These are the rabbit for the glass. Right. Can we see that one working? Jamie. different cutting blades in that machine. Yes. This piece is all set to go downstairs now. All right, let's go see what's happening downstairs. That's the sash assembly. Oh, boy. A lot of wood down here. This is where we store all the component parts for a numerous number of sash. Mm -hmm. We can make any size anybody wants down here. So you've got everything in bins and you just pull them up and assemble them in as, order. as needed. Well, what's what's the first step going on okay, over here? Okay, Marie's on a modest sash heights for us on this drill press. The sash heights are the side pieces of, yes. the, of, the, of the window of the sash. And she will mortise them. That means she's taking a square chisel with a drill in it. Uh-huh. Let's see how it works. Not much to it. And of course, each individual piece has to be mortised like that so you can fit in the, the mutton. All right. Can we see one? That's yeah, a, it makes a square yeah, mortise. Yeah, it's a square hole, kind of. And very neatly done in one operation. That's nice. So where do we go from here? We go to the sash assembly, which is over here. Lead the way. Oops. Nancy so will show us how to assemble a sash. All right, the other piece goes right into the, the, mortise. the mortise hole that was just cut. Doesn't she have to glue them, though? No, the precision milling is so good that it's a tight fit. It's such a tight fit that there's no glue no required? No glue at all. She's making a 12 light bottom sash. A 12 light bottom sash. 12 light means the number of panes. pieces of glass or yeah. glass panes going into the window. It's a colonial light. Uh -huh. She's applying the meeting rail now. Then she'll put the muttons in. The muttons. Those, those, those are the, are those little, those short are the, the little short pieces. You see the sash pop? Wow, you can bend it like that without, without having to worry about anything, huh? No. Take a lot of practice to. Uh... It takes about two months training to be able to get all the parts together. Pick your own parts out. Mm -hmm. What about quality control at this level? Does it? She's looking at each piece and she's puts automatically it in, doing it. Then she throws it out if it's bad. All right. From that point, we go to the pinning press. The pinning press. You mean instead of nailing them together, you're. you're... Yeah. She squares the sash and tightens them up and pins the four corners and all the sash bars. The sash bars run north to south, and the muttons run east to west. 
and they have to be pinned at each point. Each point. And now you've got a wind uh, sash that's ready for glazing. Not, not, not yet. We go to the complete weather stripping station and the priming. Uh huh. Which okay. Is this way. Let's see that. And what kind of weather stripping do you use? We use the flexible PVC weather stripping. So plastic. Yes. And what she's doing now is putting it on the meeting rail. That's where the top sash and the bottom sash come together. Right. Is that the only place it's? No, she does it on the top of the top rail where it meets the head jam. Neat. It just goes into a saw curve. Yeah, it has a flexible bob that holds it in place. And then it has just enough give that when that shuts against the top of the header, you don't get any air infiltration. None at all. Is that something that you started doing as, as a result of the energy crisis? Or? No. It's, we've done it before it became fashionable. No, oh, just we've as a matter, of course, it. to make a tighter window. Tighter window. Okay. Right now she's doing the bottom of the bottom rail, mm -hmm. which sits upon the sill. So the two, the three points where infiltration would be likely oh. are yes. weather strip. Now are we ready to put some glass in them? No, now we're ready to paint the sash, ah. which is done here. Ah. Okay, let's take a look. Notice you're rolling them. Wouldn't it make more sense just to dip them or spray them? Well, the trend is now where the people want to stain the inside of the sash, and if you dip them, you won't be able to stain them. Uh huh. So you want to, a lot of people want to have the natural wood or the stained product on the inside. Yeah. And we also offer an unprimed on you the do? outside. Right now we're just doing the outside, the weather side of the sash. Mm -hmm. Do you use a, a latex or a? It's an oil-based paint. Oil-based. And then they go through a drying process there. Yes. So what's the next step? Uh, cutting the glass for the sash. Oh boy, this is great. Now do you buy glass in all different sizes or? We buy various size big sheets. We have some of it over here. Uh huh. It's single strength glass. So you start off with that size. Yes. And then this? We cut into strips one way. Yeah. And we turn it around and cut it again into little panes, which he's doing now. Beautiful machine. How many? Right now he has four cutters on, which are at the Each base. one of those is, what, a little diamond wheel a little or little diamond a carbide wheel. tip? Yes, a uh, diamond wheel. It's a diamond wheel. Let's see us, show us one going through, if you would. And all it does is score the outside of the glass. Yeah, just like a hand uh, cutting tool would. Yes, it's the same type of wheel. I smell a lot of... Uh, what is it, gasoline or that's, kerosene? That's kerosene, and what it does, it lubricates the wheel and keeps the glass chips from collecting on the wheel, mm -hmm. causing it to skip. Mm -hmm. So all you've done, really, is to score a thin line on there, and now what do you do next? He, picks, he snaps the glass, snaps it, so you have little pains. Takes a stack of He's eight gonna to ten. take the whole, wow. Just snaps it. Oh, excellent. I wouldn't mind trying that myself, but we'd probably end up with a lot of waste. Or little cuts on your hand. You oh, little cuts yeah. on your hand. That's why he has too. gloves. Do you have to calculate the, the, the sizes you're using in order to It's avoid... pretty much determined through the years. Mm -hmm. We know what sizes we are most popular mm -hmm. and what sizes are coming up to so be popular. So you can really minimize the amount of wasted glass, right? Yes. Because there's no way of recycling the glass once you've... Uh... No, there's a chemical inside the property of the glass that makes it unnecessary. Un I'm making them possible to Difficult recycle. to recycle. Yeah. Okay. So, we've got glass cut. Now we're ready to see where you that's actually install it, yes. it, right? That's done over here. Okay. The bedding station. Well, why do you call it the bedding this station? Is, well, this is where they apply the bedding compound to the sash groove. So that what's coming out of that little gun is a, yeah. uh, is it like a, uh, a joint compound or a glazing compound? It's an adhesive compound. Oh, so it actually helps to glue the glass onto the It does help a little bit. Frame. It gives it a cushion so it doesn't snap when you put the points in. Boy, everything goes really fast at this stage, huh? It's exciting. All right, what's, what's being done now is... is uh, diamond uh, points or glacier points are being put on. So that just regular points like you would buy at a hardware store. But here they come in a stack all stapled together. And with this little gun, you just uh, shoot them out at high velocity there. Boing. Excellent. Okay get out of her way here. What what goes on next? Next we go to the glazing compound. Oh, okay. So this is the final stage in making yeah. a sash. This is where the glazing compound is applied to the window sash. Mm -hmm. To be a glazier takes a year's apprenticeship. Is that right? It's a very skilled job. 
Well, she makes it look so simple, you'd think there was not much to it. Oh, what, is she, what is she using there? Is it a special type of no, laser it's a regular combo? window putty. For Good old-fashioned putty like it's laser. always been used? Do you give lessons? No, I don't. Oh, would you make an exception? You know, I've, yeah, I've, I've, I've fixed, I've fixed a few in my day, but I've never tried one from scratch. Sure. You make it look so easy. What, give me a couple of pointers. All right, we take just the putty, a little bit in hand. Good old Keep tool. it loose. Yeah. I know you do this much with yes, it. Yes, uh-huh. And you hold your knife? Yes, I hold my knife. I hold... Put your thumb right up to the top. Right at the top there. Yes. And then uh, follow that line across with very little putty. All right. So you you, you do that. this one and let me watch. Okay. You give the, oh, wow. The um, less you use, the better off you are. Do you lo do a lot of baking at home as well? well Cake no, decorating I'm and stuff like a, that? No. No? Just a good plain cook. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to try this one. I noticed okay. you tried it. You kind of rolled it. Yeah. Now just a little putty. Just a little putty. That's all you use. Yeah. No. Oh, what a, this is very, very embarrassing. Do it. it does you know? take a year to learn how to do it. Can't do it overnight. <laughs> and that's too thick a bead, isn't it? Yes, uh-huh. Okay, because you want to keep it down like that. Right. That's closer to what you're talking about. Fine. That's not yeah. too disreputable. No. A couple of bad spots there. Yes. All right. Thank you. Okay. Listen, thanks for the tour. I think we've learned a lot about how you make sashes, and we've got a couple of other things to talk about. I think I'm going to hang around here for a couple of minutes, get a little more practice. We'll try, Bob. Yeah. Well, it's a good thing I don't make my living uh, puttying windows or we'd all be in trouble. Hey, remember last week we were talking about our kitchen area here and what we wanted to do for the floor. We've decided to have some old yellow pine beams ripped down into boards that will go on this section of kitchen over here. On the other section, it's kind of more of a greenhouse feeling and we wanted to have a more durable and waterproof material. So I went on a little shopping expedition to look at different types of floor tile and met with a fellow named Frank Maselli who runs quite a big showroom. Let's take a look at that. Pretty impressive place you got here. Thanks, Bob. I really like the idea that everything is laid out so that you can get an idea of how the tiles would look in your home. That's what we've tried to do Even in this place in the showroom. Ceramic tile wood burning Yeah, soap? isn't that interesting? It's from the Scandinavian countries and it uh, works efficiently as a heater. Behind you, the, the for a kitchen, this is really stunning. Where are these tiles from? These tiles are culinarios from Brazil. Culinarios. Culinarios. Oh, as in culinary. Right. Okay, exactly. gotcha. Exactly. What do you pay for one of these? Decorative tiles are approximately five dollars a tile. The uh, blanks with the corners run around two fifty, three dollars a tile. Uh, we've used on the display here a lot of the decorative ones. When people do it in their own home, generally speaking, they use more of the use blanks. a lot of the blanks. Yeah, and, and then a few inserts. A few dotted inserts. Right. Yeah, it's a good-looking tile. It is a beautiful tile. This is all, this is terrific over here, this rounded wall, you can put these, what are they, about three by one and a half? Approximately, and it's a beautiful tile for an accent wall, backsplash countertop, mm -hmm. and very strong and serviceable. The it's product good is... Good looking uh, glaze. It is, it's very, uh, very strong, and it's a tile from Japan. It is? How much? About $7.95 a square foot. Mm, so it's not too inexpensive. No, it isn't. Wow, this is the... the Roman Colosseum over here, this Yeah, this is a fancy marble tub. That's really uh, nice made of light Roman travertine. 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 It's 12 by 12 tiles. Uh, we've cut them to fit around. So, but it's natural. It's real marble. It's, it's real, natural yeah, it's marble, real that's, marble that's okay. cut into these 12 yeah. inch squares. And the beauty of the product is you don't need any particular trim. You can polish the edges of all the material so you don't have to worry about uh, finishing it off and having it look proper. How much? About $9 a square foot. Mm, you could get into a lot of money you sure doing a custom yeah. installation like this. But it's, it's beautiful, it's, and it's it forever. Beautiful. I mean, it, it's, it does last forever. It's forever. What about this over here? Pedestal sink pedestal with all sink, sorts uh, of uh, Yeah, it's flowers, a hand-painted hand pedestal sink from Italy. Mm -hmm. uh, the the hand painting has been done, and then the tile or the sink glaze. So you don't have to worry about cleaning it or anything. So this, this is it. all ceramic. It's cast in one piece. They come, and they paint it by hand, and then they bake it in an oven. That's right? correct. Work, right? you, you can scrub it, and you don't have to worry yeah, about losing the... No, there's no problem at all cleaning yeah. it. Yeah. All you have to do is worry about the price, price. tag, $955. It's not bad. Th this, this is great over here. Now, is this meant to be kind of in a powder room application? Uh, yeah, it would look good in that situation. In a half bath? It's again, a hand-painted 8 by 8 Italian tile from Italy, and... It's a very interesting looking tile. Beautiful, beautiful color combination with the, the beige yeah, and the, the deep beige blue. And, the browns. and I like this, putting the mirror on the sides of it. Uh, well, it would save you some money on tile for one yeah, thing. Yeah, it would do that. Wouldn't it? And this is a good idea, too, because you just basically put them on the front to box the sink in. 
Very, very nice. It's a nice display. What, uh, what application would you make of this? Kind this of for a shower? A, a shower application would be fine. Of course, it would have to be a little bit larger than this, as you can tell by stepping mm -hmm. into it. Uh, again, it's sheet goods from Japan. Sheet goods simply means that they come on a paper backing and you put exactly. down the hole. Exactly. Yeah, they're about a square foot in size. And they go in quite easily. Are they pricey? Uh, not bad at all. Three ninety-five. Oh, okay. Now we're looking at the bargain end. This is beautiful. This looks like almost like velour or carpeting or something in, in this Feel cobalt it. blue. Yeah, it yeah. does. It has a yeah. lot of texture to it. It's it has a, got a very regular it. texture. Right. Italian also? It's Italian also uh, on the contemporary line, and it's around five dollars and forty-five mm -hmm. cents a foot. Mm -hmm. Well, no, no, nothing that we've seen yet is what I've got in mind, but uh, it's really fascinating to look at all the different possibilities with ceramic tile. What, what do you call this? It's a mural, obviously. This, yeah, it's a mural. It's just another way of showing how tile can be used in the home or even in an office building. It's uh, hand-painted by local artists and fired. This is American? Yeah, it's American. Well, it's Italian tile. American people painted the design on it, mm -hmm. fired it, and we set it up. And it's, you know, it's a number of different things that you can do with it. You could, all types of designs are possible. Yeah. It's, you know, sort of create your own. almost any room right. in the house. Cost? Something like this would probably go for around $2,000. Oh, boy. I'm intrigued by this, this uh, display behind you over here. The, uh, the tub's kind of been set in a boxed area, and I, I yeah. love the use of, uh, is this redwood? Yes, it is redwood. Yeah, yeah we use this uh, to cut down on the amount of trim that we would have had to make and angles we would have had to make yeah, you to avoid do it, and it makes it a lot easier to You don't install. have to buy bullnoses no, or any kind of no. special pieces, and you just and it put works well. that it one band of, uh, band of redwood all around the place yeah. and just use flat tiles. It's a very good idea. There's a little bit of everything here, but this, this, this one area over here uh, in the maroon is really catching my attention. I vaguely remember a bathroom when I was a little kid that was maroon and gray, just like this. Well, that's right, because back in the 40s and 50s, maroon and gray was a big color, and mm -hmm. it seems that it's on its 30-year cycle and it's back again. 30-year cycle? You mean that's, yeah, yeah, people's it's, taste every 30 years, they hit the same it point? seems to be doing something like that. This is, it's a beautiful tile, it and is, again, you've nice got the, the decorative tiles to go with it, perfectly coordinated. Yeah, so it all works together well, and it looks good, it's not, it's not expensive. How much, how much is it a square foot? Uh, $3.35 a square foot. Is for it an water. American product? No, again, it's Italian. Hmm. Well, that's something I've kind of noticed recently, is that you you've not only uh, do you seem to be having a revival in the use of, of ceramic tile, but also really, really interesting tiles are becoming available now. Right. As you find right now there's a lot of solid color pastels that are coming out. Mm -hmm. And strong colors. And strong colors, definitely. This is... Uh, well, it's too small to be a swimming pool, I guess. <laughs> no, this is a personal spa, uh, jacuzzi, whirlpool, whatever you want to make it to be. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, again, it's with Japanese sheet good tile. This is Japanese? Yes, it is. It's a beautiful emerald green. Yeah. Again, sheet goods, you said? Sheet goods, square foot sheets, approximately. Three, four dollars a... Uh, in the low three dollar range. But you've got a lot of them here. Yeah. What would you ballpark an installation like this? Not just a ceramic uh, tile, but doing a custom... Probably with the plumbing, the electrical, yeah. uh, the whirlpool jets, and everything else that has to go into it, it would probably be somewhere in the vicinity of four to five thousand dollars, I would imagine. Well, let's look at floors, all right? Okay. <laughs> that Let is me, nice. All right. Let me take you over here, and we'll show you some of the Mexican floors. Okay. Now we're talking. This this is the kind of uh, natural-looking floor that I've been thinking about for our kitchen at this old house. Right. This is the uh, unglazed Mexican terracotta tile. So when you put it down, it's a raw clay. It's raw clay, yeah. There's nothing done to it. These mm -hmm. tiles, once they're installed, are then sealed, waxed, and uh, ready for use. Mm -hmm. It's available, as you can see, in different shade colorings for different types of terracotta and also in different patterns and styles. Mm -hmm. There's also a chocolate one for someone that wants a real dark brown okay. type tile. Again, it's unglazed, needs to be waxed, Probably, what, once a month or so? Uh, once a month, yeah. All right. What are those on the other side of your uh, Over here, we have here. more of the same tiles that we've been showing on the floor and walking on, in, again, in a darker, with a darker stain on them, mm -hmm. and in different shapes. I'm getting confused now. What would you recommend for us at this old house? Well, let's go over here, and I'll show you what I can recommend. There are three types of terracotta. This is one of them right here. Mm -hmm. As you can see, it's about an eight and a half inch square. It's set on the diagonal. 
the color tones run yellow, orange, and slight bit of brown. Mm -hmm. On the lower level over here... How has this been finished, though? Is this, this just... This has uh, been finished with a sealer, a stain, and a wax. A little complicated. Well, yeah, not too bad, actually. This is pretty interesting. Uh, a lot of variation in this floor. Yes, again, this is a 10-inch terracotta unglazed. The coloring mm -hmm. is a little bit more red and brown. The finishing procedure on this tile is... Uh, a matter of linseed oil and wax. Mm -hmm. So repeated applications, I presume? Yeah, the, mo the more you wax it, the higher the luster it will appear. Sure. And it just is, you know, it's easy to maintain. So it ages, almost like a piece yeah, of wood it, would it age. Yeah, it does, exactly. The older it gets, the better it looks. And I presume that's the third this one? This is the third one, right. You can see in this one that the color range is very, very similar. There is not a wide variance in color. Uh, also, by walking on it, you can feel that there is a different texture to the tile. It has more of a dome surface. Dome, do you mean it's not perfectly it's flat? It's not perfectly yeah. flat, right. no. This is a piece of the material prior to This is the same as this? Same thing, except for the shape. Uh, it's an unglazed piece of tile. It requires four to five coats of sealer, grout it, and then a coat of wax. Mm -hmm. And periodic waxing will maintain it and keep the luster that you see on it. Mm -hmm. It looks almost like... Uh fine-tooled leather, kind of. It really does. It, it resembles it a leather. Attractive tile. Well, I'm, I'm glad you've shown me all the different uh, alternatives, but I also remain pretty confused. Maybe I should just ask my wife to help me out with it. I'd be a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's about all the time we have today. Join us again next week when we'll be talking about a color scheme for this old house, electrical wiring, and a new waterproofing material for outside decks. So then, I'm Bob Vila for This Old House. This Old House is made possible by a grant from Owens Corning Fiberglass Corporation. Manufacturers... We're also spending a good deal of time talking about how to electrically wire our master bedroom. Old work and new work, that should be fun. And we'll have a visit from Judy Selwyn, our paint historian, who's going to give us a few tips on what color combination to put on our facade. Let's go inside and get started. Well, we're in the second floor of our new wing, directly over the kitchen, in the room that will become our exercise room. And in this area here, we will have a whole 12-foot section of sliding glass doors opening onto a balcony. Now, behind me, what you see is just a temporary shelter. The weather's been kind of bad for the last few days, so we put up some polyethylene to keep the rain out. We've built this balcony the length of the whole room, which is almost 30 feet, and it's about three and a half feet wide. It pitches off in this direction so that all the rainwater can be collected in this end of it where we've had a drain installed. But it is, you have to remember, a flat area directly over my kitchen downstairs. So the main consideration, the big concern is how to make it as waterproof as possible. We've gone along and put down a marine plywood deck, very neatly fitted, and it's been screwed every eight inches. And we've called in John Schwartz, and Jim Hobbs, who are uh, waterproofing experts, basically, to give hi, us Bob. a few ideas about how best to do this. Hi, John. Hi, John. Why don't you give us a little bit of an explanation of the type of system that's going down here? Well, we have basically a, a urethane uh, deck system. Uh, the advantages of this particular system are that it can withstand the effects of sunlight. It will not become brittle or crack as many other uh, systems that have been used for this purpose in the past. It will also withstand uh, traffic very well, mm -hmm. and it will give you the kind of waterproofing membrane that you're looking for to protect that kitchen underneath. All right. What are the first steps in installing it? The, the first steps in installing it are first to have a, an excellently applied deck such as this so that uh, there is no deflection in the plywood. It has to be well secured as this is. Uh, secondly, we would uh, apply a cat strip uh, like this. Uh, the purpose of the cat strip is to allow us when we flash using this rubber material to make a transition from the deck surface up the uh, vertical wall. And the can strip would fit in uh, simply like that. Why do you need such a, a transition with flashing at the vertical, at the joint of the vertical and the horizontal? Um, it, it just makes it easier to apply and the since we're working with a contact adhesive, we want to minimize the uh, possibilities of error the first time around. And by using a can strip, this allows us to do it a little easier. Mm -hmm. And we're also talking about a place where there could be movement between that vertical wall and the floor itself. Yes, exactly. And that's the prime function of this particular uh, neoprene rubber flashing material. It will withstand that kind of movement. 
and will bond very tenaciously to the wood. This is what we're talking about, right? Yes, that's it. The blue, uh, the blue backing is simply there to uh, keep to it clean. Keep, to keep it clean, right? Mm -hmm. But the piece you've got over there, John, is black. What have you put on it? Well, we've put a, a contact adhesive on this. You'll see the, black, the blue backing is on the other side. Um, we've applied a black contact adhesive uh, to the rubber as well as to the wood surface. And uh, Jim, if you'll give me a hand here, um, we'll apply um, this flashing rubber to the, uh, to the deck. We've already uh, lined it up with the uh, rest of the flashing, which is here. Now you have to be extremely careful when you're doing this because once it's once it touches you can't move it around anymore right right you have to be extremely careful in making contact at, the, at just the right spot um, and we want to eliminate any air bubbles trapped underneath it because once this is down it will be virtually impossible to to pull back off okay very good now we can peel this backer off And uh, Jim will, if you can grab that roller, it's right, right beside over there. you there. Uh, we're gonna roll the rubber in with this roller. And what that does is it, it ensures that we get all the air out from underneath the rubber. And it will also ensure that we get intimate contact between the two surfaces. Okay, well, why don't we let Jim finish that off and we'll talk about the rest of the application. I know you've been doing it in stages just for ease of explanation here. Yes. What, what was the next stage? What we've done up to this point is we have applied the first coating. Um, we're ready now to apply the second coating, and uh, why don't we just go ahead and do that. The material is basically the same in all three coats. There are three coats involved here. Uh, we have used different colors so that there is a contrast. Excuse me, Jim. And so the contrast allows us to see where we're applying the material. And also, 10 years down the road, if this surface wears a little bit, the fact that you see the alternate color underneath it will be a quick indication of- That it's wearing out. That it is wearing. And simply at that point, you apply another coat over top of it. Very, very easily done. Okay, is there some, there's some sort of chemical reaction that occurs between this gray coat that you're now putting on and the green coat that was already applied? Yes, it's, it's extremely important that in all of these steps, each coating that goes on is bonded very well to the coating underneath it. We don't want any loosening up of any of the individual coatings. Is there a lot of drying time or curing time involved between the application of the different steps? The, the curing time or drying time uh, is really a function of temperature. If, uh, if you're working at warmer temperatures around 70 degrees or so, you can expect a fairly rapid drying time. Uh, it's important that each coat dry very well before a subsequent coat is applied. All right. All right, let's just leave that for now. Uh, is, this obviously, way, is this the way the finished uh, material would look? Well, we've kind of uh, cut this process up a little bit in order to accommodate your viewing audience. Mm -hmm. uh, we've, uh, normally, we would have applied the first coat that you see back here to the entire surface yes. and then applied the second coat again to the entire surface. Uh, so basically, we're just cutting it up a little bit for, for purposes of explanation. Now, we've applied the second coat. The next step is to uh, add to it walnut shell granules. Is that what we've got here? These are very fine ground up walnut shells. Now, what's the purpose of this? <clears throat> the walnut shells are uh, two, they provide two purposes, really. One is to um, give the deck a non-skid surface. And the other is to allow the deck to wear a little better. So, um, uh, and actually there is a third purpose to it. It, it does tend to bind the uh, second coat into which this is going to be broadcast with the top coat, which will eventually go over top of the granules. So you're just gonna be throwing so a we're just gonna, pinch of that over there. We're just gonna broadcast this in here excessively. And what we'll do after this coating is dry is to vacuum off any of the excess granules which have not stuck. Um, and then we'll be ready to apply the third coat. And that, once the third coat is applied, uh, we would allow at least a couple of days without any traffic on it mm -hmm. uh, before uh, we open it up. And then we've, after that, we've got a surface with what, a 10-year guarantee? 
These, uh, these decks have lasted at least uh, 10 years in many cases. A lot of it depends on the weathering uh, factor mm -hmm. and uh, how much traffic it gets. But yeah. in any case, uh, I would say 8 or 10 years. John, and, uh, what about cost? Uh, the materials generally vary with the amount of flashing involved, but basically we're talking about $2 a square foot for material. Just for the material. And, right. And the cost of labor will vary. That's right. Okay, thanks very much. We'll be back to take a look at it. Right now I want to talk a little bit about electricity over in the master bedroom. Hi, Ron. Hi, Ron. With us now is Ron Baker, our electrician here at this old house, and we're in the master bedroom suite. Let's talk about what some of the requirements are. When we're going to rewire a room like this, what do we have to look for? Well, we have to look for 12 linear feet, first of all, in between each receptacle by state code. You mean it's a requirement that you have to have a plug every 12 feet? Every 12 feet, yes. Why is that? Well, in the olden days, you remember, Bob, they used to have extension cords running all over the place. and. Uh, okay, so that's the main logic. Is that's that the main as logic. As long as you've got right. that many plugs, you avoid the use of extension cords that's and the cool. fire hazard and so right. forth. Okay, let's look at two things. One, how you go about installing an electrical box and wiring it in an existing wall. Mm -hmm. And then after that, you can tell us a little bit about a simple installation on a new stud okay. wall. How do you get a wire into the wall over here, and how do you figure out where you locate the box and so forth? Well, first we'll start with how high you want it from. Is there a code requirement as far as the height? No, there is not. So I can put it anywhere I want to? Yes, you can. I think we had specified 16 inches okay. off, the, off the floor. We'll make it 16 inches. That's the center. All right, this is a regular lath and plaster wall. It's one of our old ones. That's right. It has wood lath. Yeah. So, so we have to get in between the wood lath. We put the box on 16 inches, and we draw the box out. Now, this is the important part. In between the wood lath, I hit a wood lath, I hit a wood lath, I haven't hit the middle yet. Now, you just went through. I'm in between two. Yeah. Being in the center of the box, we have to find out, make sure we don't hit any studs here now. None there. None there. So we're you, want, you want to make sure that you're not going to have a stud along either side right. of where the box right. is going. Because it would impede the box going in. From going in. OK. All right. So now you've established that. We've we'll established that. We make a little hole here to find out. Now, the box is put on the middle of this piece of wood so we can attach the screws, make sure we hit one left. Okay. So we go in the center. So the only thing that you're going to support the box on is the old wood left that remains there. Yes. Now we have to redraw. Now, we chip, being very careful. Okay, now you've got all the plaster carefully taken out of your way. What's next? Next, Bob, is to get this lab out of your way so you can put the box in. Okay, and you're using a standard... And I use a simple keyhole saw. Keyhole saw, yes. Do it. Stop right there, Bob. You don't want to go all, all the way through that side because when I start on this side, then the you lab will go. You might plaster might come down. Good point. Go very carefully. It helps to have a nice brand new saw. Also. Yes, it does, and this happens to be a brand new one. Yeah. You've got to be extra careful when you're doing it on 100-year-old plaster that you don't yes, want to replace. Yes, we do. Now, they're your only 
cutting through half of a piece of lath, right? Yes, yeah. because we need the other half to screw it into the it. box. Yeah. And you just broke it off with your saw. That's fine, but I think that's the easy part. What about getting getting the wire to the box? That's what I'm. Well, that's we have to go up to the top of the ceiling. Now we have to make a few holes up there oh. to bring the wire down. Okay. Okay. So the first step is we've got a hole where eventually we'll be positioning our box. Yes. Now you say you have to have another hole up there. We have here? to have another hole up there to bring, the, up. to bring the wire down. Well, what's this process called? Fishing. This is a fishing story. Yes, it is. Okay. <laughs> okay, so we'll go up top. Directly above the box, Bob. Because you know when you're in, in between a... Yeah. We go directly above the box. And here you don't have to worry about it too much because we've got wallpaper with stripes on it and you know that's going to guide you. And we start cutting. Hole should be just about big enough for the wire. You don't have to go overboard. What if I want to save that plaster ceiling and not damage it? Uh, it requires patching then, Bob. You, there's no choice. You gotta there is no choice. You have make to the patch. hole up there. Okay. Again, we hit the wood lath. Did you saw? Yes. Thank there you, Joe. And again, we have to get rid of it. <laughs> oh, now that we have the holes done, Bob, I think it's about time we put the wire in. How do you do that? Well, we use this little thing right here called a snake. Also a fish wire. So now very, we're ready. Very flexible. Ready to go fishing, yeah. And yeah. on the end of it, you've got a hook. I have a little small hook there because you have to stay at the other end and catch me. And use the small one to... Uh... And when that hole gets there, you catch like that. Okay. Let's try it. Okay. We'll do it. Got any funny fish stories? Oh, I once put a snake in a wall park. I tried to go four feet and it took me four hours. Yeah? Yeah, well... And you charge yeah, by the hour, huh? very sharp, I mean, you could... I think after about one hour, I changed my mind about having the plug there. <laughs> yeah, that you have a whole lot of holes in the wall. Yeah. Okay, hold it. You have it, Bob? Yeah, it's right. It's, all, it's outside. You know how good that is? Sometimes this takes three hours to do that. Well, magic of video here. Huh? Now, you pull a little bit further. Pull it all the way down? No, you just pull it so I can... Okay, that's good. Now we tie the wire on. To the other end of it, sure. To the other end. You strip. Slow down. Let's take a look at how you strip that wire. All right, we're going to strip the wire. Just stripping the insulation off here. And will you be tying the... Uh... We'll tie all three under the snake. All three of them? Yes. Trust your pliers out. We come down to the hook, and we wrap. Oh, and you twist them around. We twist them around. In easier instances, Bob, we just fold it back. Yeah. But since we have to go in between strap and then lath, and we bring out a little tape, and we tape it. And that'll help it to run smoothly through their nuggets. Run smoothly, so the wires don't get obstacles. caught on anything. Yeah. Okay, we're ready, Bob. Okay, I'll just uh... give a little tug. There we go. There we go. Now you pull long enough to get right down to our receptacle there, Bob. Okay. That'll do it. All the way to the floor. Yeah. Need a little more here. Okay. Yeah. Here we go. Now, since we've already made the hole up there, we just take the other end of the snake and shove it down the hole. But I think in this instance, we'll go up. You're going to go up. up from... We will go up from the plug to the hole. Okay. So the snake is disposable. You just cut away what was Probably, tied on I there. only cut three quarters of an inch off. Yeah, three quarters of an inch, but you, don't have, to, you don't have to undo all of that. Yeah. No. Okay. Now I'm going to attempt to come up. I'm going to attempt to come up to that hole. 
Should I try to meet you with the small piece of snake? When I get up there, Bob, you can do the same thing you did before. Yeah, hold it. No, we're not up there yet, Bob. No, no, the shadow. Tell you what, why don't you come up here and try to find it, and I'll okay. push it for you, because I can't, okay. I can't feel it. You just keep it. Yeah. You just keep it. Just so, so you can feel the end of it, Bob. Yeah. You see it? I see it, Bob. All right, once you pull down now. All right, let me have it. Pull down some more. Oh, oh. too much. Okay, pull down, Bob. Slowly? No. There you go. Almost there. A little more. Give it a little twist, Bob. Push it up a little bit and twist it. All right, now pull it down. Is it coming down? No, it seems to be snagged on something. I push it up a little bit and twist it. I'll give it one little half twist. There you go, now. All right, pull it down now. Now let me have it, Bob. Okay. We did it. Ah. Oh. Well, that's a little bit of a fish story. It snagged bit. there a couple yeah, of times. Yeah. We do the same thing we did over the other side. We tie it on again. Hooks open a little bit here. We'll close the hook a little. And we'll wrap as we did before. Okay, Bob. You can go ahead and pull it down now. I can go ahead and pull it out. That's All good, right. Bob. That's Got good. It. With this little excess, we just... And then that just gets tucked in. That gets tucked in up there. In between the lab. In between the lab. And we'll patch the hole. And you patch the hole. Now we get to the final step. Actually putting the receptacle in. Since these wires are a little too short here now. Mm -hmm. Have to have eight inches of wire here. You have to have eight inches of wire sticking out? Yes, that goes in the box. That yes. goes in the box, okay. Explain to our viewers which, which the wires are and what they're doing and so forth. This is a ground wire, the spare, this spare copper one. Yeah. This is a wire called a neutral. The white one. The white one. And this is the hot wire. Now, we pick up the box. Knock out the knock up top knock out. Turn it around here so that we can see. Oh. Okay. There you go. And we put the wire in. And we tighten the little clamp that's inside there. Now we're ready to put it in. That clamp in the back of the box holds the wire. Yes. Now we fit it where we want. The last step is to screw it in. But what about new work when you've got a brand new stud okay. wall such as this? Okay. We use a box. Quite different from the old work box. It has no ears. It has two nails. It's very, very easy to install. And it's plastic, so it's probably it's a lot plastic. cheaper. Yes, it is. Okay. How do you get the wire in there? Well, we have a little knockout right up top here. Oh. And we knock out. Very thin plastic there. Very you can thin almost plastic. Do it with your finger. Right. Okay. Go ahead Why and put it out. Why don't we install one? All right. We'll put it right like so. You're letting it project beyond the stud. I'm, because because of the sheetrock that has to go on. Exactly. And so I don't it, want the box, box back too far. Right. You won't have a clamp on the inside of this we'll box clamp. To, to secure the... Uh... This is what the staple does. Oh, I this see. This staple holds the wire in place so it cannot move. Much easier operation, yeah. Much easier, yes. Okay, Ron, thanks for the lesson in wiring 101 here. We're going to go off and find Judy Selwyn, our paint expert. Hi, Judy. Oh, 
hi, Bob. Listen, I'm really happy you could take the time to uh, study our huh. old house here, because although it looks ridiculous to even be thinking about paint, with all the problems we've got, we've only got about three weeks left before it gets too cold. That's right. We have a very short painting season in New England, and we mm -hmm. have to get on with it. Now, tell me, what have you found out for us so far? Well, the microscopic research has revealed that this house has mainly been white or off-white, except for the coat of paint on the clabberts right under the top coat. Really? What was it? Well, it was a yellow. I'm glad to hear that, because the idea of painting it all white again doesn't appeal to me too much. What kind of a yellow? Well, um... It was sort of a, um, a grade yellow, to be exact, and not, in fact, inappropriate to the original period. Mm -hmm. um, I've brought with me some other things about period colors that um, will give us some idea of what colors of the period look like. Um, there's a very good book that's just been published, which covers houses from 1820 to 1920, mm -hmm. and would include houses like this of the second quarter that's, of the 19th that's century. That's good to know, because not everybody can uh, put the paint chip under the microscope. That's right. And another thing to look at, in addition to these books, if you really would like a period scheme in your house, is house museums. Mm -hmm. um, there are houses open as museums in many communities, and uh, you can go in and ask the curator if the color has been researched and use that as a piece of information, and then decide what you like and exactly. appropriate. Exactly, yeah. get ideas um, from looking at other In houses. here, as a matter of fact, we see a lot of houses with these light-off yellows, and what I've done is paint out a couple of um, yellows so we can look and see what we might like on this house. Good. I put down some which I don't like because I think they're either too Victorian or too early. Well. And or too brassy. Yeah. This one is certainly too brassy for a house paint. I don't, it looks more like a lemon to me than a... Yeah, and I feel the one under it is probably appropriate to an earlier house. This ochre well, would be better that's what you call ochre. Georgian house. Right, okay. What I'd like to recommend that you use is a, sort of a grade yellow, like this one, which would be a period color. Houses like this, you would see stony kinds of colors. Stony tans, stony grays stony yellows, almost purpley stony colors. To Aiming to make the house look as if it were a masonry house instead of a wooden house. Well, and also to blend in with nature. Yeah. To look the grays of mosses, the grays of stone. So not to stand out like a bright white house. Mm -hmm. In fact, most of the early colors under here are not a bright white like this. They're rather creamy like this. Even the earliest paints are creamy and not bright white. What I'd like to recommend to you is, in fact, that you go with um, sort of a grayish, dull yellow on your clabbers, and then take your trim in not a, a white, but rather sort of this tanny off-white. And remember, your trim, this house was not painted properly last time, because the trim includes the whole casing and includes these little consoles under the window. These little pieces that are kind of lost to the eye. Yeah. Right. Your trim also includes your water table. Which is the thick board that meets the foundation stone. It includes your soffit and your freeze up there. Yep. So you're suggesting this tan or beige color to go on all the window trim and all the other trim right. on the house. What would this color be for? This color I've suggested for your shutters. Ah, but we um, don't have any, you know? You did. Um, obviously, this house originally had shutters because we have early shutter hardware here. Mm -hmm. And I understand that you might like to replace We've the shutters. We've been talking about having shutters made, at least for the front facade. I think we'll be able to cough up the money for that. Well, if your budget can stand shutters made of an appropriate material and an appropriately sized, and when I say appropriately sized, you have very large windows here, and your shutters should be sufficiently big that if it were folded over and closed, it would meet in the middle and sure, cover the window. They were meant to be fun right. functional, yes. But again, I think that's something of an extra. If you can afford it, it would be good. In but the appropriate material, yeah. That's right. A good quality shutter. Judy, I like this color combination, but we're going to have to take a vote on it. Thanks for coming by. I'm anxious to see this paint job completed, Bob. You will, don't worry. Folks, we're running out of time for today. Join me next week when we'll be talking about illuminating this old house, lighting plans for the interior and for the grounds. Till then, I'm Bob Vila for This Old House. This old house is made possible by a grant from Owens Corning Fiberglass Corporation, manufacturers of residential building products. Along with that valuable new employee. Got a job? Get a grad on Target Youth Employment. Weeknights at 7, the week of June 18th on Detroit Public Television.
Channel 56, WTVS Detroit. We're working for you. This old house is made possible by a grant from Owens Corning Fiberglass Corporation, manufacturers of residential building products. Hi, I'm Bob Vila. Welcome to this old house. Before I tell you about today's show, let me give you a little bit of a progress report. We've got all the framing completed inside the house and the rough wiring and rough plumbing. As a matter of fact, the plumbing was just tested this morning. So we'll be able to start hanging our gypsum wallboard throughout the house and plastering next week. We've also completed a lot of the clearing work on the grounds and we're ready to start serious work on the landscaping and some of the construction that's going on out there. Well, today we're going to be talking with Norm Abram before we get started with anything else about how to install replacement window sash. We're going to be doing that in the living room. We'll also be showing you a tour I made about a week ago with Dick Metcher, our lighting consultant. And he gave us some very good ideas about how best to place lighting fixtures and what type of fixtures to use in different situations. And we'll also be showing you a few ideas on laying out your kitchen cabinets, how best to do it. I've got a friend coming over who helped us a year ago designing our kitchens uh, in the Bigelow house, and we'll be talking with him. Let's get started with Norm in the living room. Hi, Norm. Hi, Bob. How are the windows coming? Great. And boy, am I glad you got these new sashes. Because They're nice, aren't they? It saved us a lot of uh, time and aggravation trying to fix those old ones up. Yeah, they were too far gone, and for $30 a piece, I just couldn't see not you doing it. can't beat that. So, why don't you describe to us how we install them? All right, well, the first thing we have to do is prepare the old window frame to accept our new sash. Mm -hmm. And the first thing I did was took these, uh, the old pulleys out, which were in these pockets. As in, and as you can see, I've stuffed some insulation up in there, because down behind here, where the weights were, there's a big cavity in there, about four inches wide and about two and a half inches deep, and that's where a lot of air gets in through these old windows. It's a real source of heat. So yeah. once we took these weights out, which, by the way, really have no salvage value. They're, they're cast iron. The cast iron. These are about eight pounds. There's a lot of them around. If it was a 20-pound weight, we might have saved it mm -hmm. for something special. And then I took insulation, put pieces up in that pocket, and using a stick, just kind of stuffed it up in there. I've almost got it full. You don't want to get it all compressed, though. No, if you're going to tack it in there too tight, you might as well not put it in there at all, because insulation is meant to be loosely packed in. So that it's full of little air pockets. That's yeah. right. So now that we've got this completed, we'll put this little block of wood, which is just sort of a access, used to be the access to the weights. Yeah, that was the way you, ever, you used to tie the weights back together. That's right. And all we really need is a couple little brads to hold it in place. All right. Now we're ready to put our new sashes in. And one thing that we're using here is this balance system, which is a aluminum, piece of aluminum, and it's called a spring balance because it has these springs on the back side which take the place of the weights and the cords. So just this replaces all the old paraphernalia that was in there, the That's weights right. and cords and pulleys. And the other advantage to this balance is that it's, it acts as a guide for the window. The window slides in this channel, and because it is aluminum and flexible, it fits the window relatively tightly mm -hmm. so that we stop all those drafts that would sneak around the side Keeps of the, the window. the two sash together better, yeah. That's right. Now, in order to install the sash, what we do is we assemble it on the floor. We would put this down on the floor, like that, and then... So you have to kind of prefab everything before you that's right. put it if in you place. Could, I should turn this around the other way. It's a little bit easier to handle. Give me the top sash which goes on the outside, like that. Now, if you'd hand me the bottom sash, mm -hmm. we set that one into the track, like that. Now, the next thing I have to do is 
pull these sashes down so that we engage these little plastic tabs, which actually catch on the bottom of the sash, and that's what makes gives that spring the tension for it to work as the window goes down. So we pull both of those down about three inches or so, so that the sash is below the top of this balance. And that gives a little tension to the springs. And then we put the top piece on. Now, if you notice, these new sash have a groove that runs all the way the length of the window. And what that is, is that's to accommodate this channel where the spring is. Sure, they're designed to operate with this type of a balance. Right. And these are really only made to be used with new replacement sashes. Mm -hmm. uh, they're the right width. The old sashes sometimes are too wide to use these, these aluminum balances. Now what you have to do is give that a little push towards me. All right, now we I'll have the top and the bottom about equal. And the next step is basically a one-man operation. And what I have to do is constantly keep tension on the sides. Because you're sandwiching everything together. That's right. And if, if you let it go, the springs would slip off the side of the windows. OK. You... So it wouldn't be too hard with a normal sized window, but these are oversized sash. These are extra large. Yeah, even though they're standard stock items, we didn't have to custom make them or anything. Now you guide the sash so that it's in the uh, opening, and then so they just easily push it in to that frame. Now, the reason I kept, I wanted these windows down was so they wouldn't hit this. The header. Because as you can see, these balances only have about an eighth of an inch to clear that frame. Yeah, now it's in place. Excellent. Now, the next thing we have to do once we put it in is check to see how well it fits, or how square the window is, how square the frame is. So we push the top sash up and as you can see that's really good that's just one more indication that this old house is pretty solid yeah it's in really good condition nothing's out of square there nothing's out of square here now now we would push the bottom sash down and see how well they meet between the upper sash and the bottom sash to see if they're even now this one's this one is pretty good now, if it was a case where this was real high, like that, first thing I'd do is make sure that there's not too much of a buildup of paint right here. Mm -hmm. In a lot of old houses, there's about an eighth of an inch of paint, and if you just simply scrape that down, then you can get the windows to meet. If even after doing that, it didn't quite meet, then you could always plane a little bit off this surface to make the two meet, to even but it not up. more than let's say, an eighth of an inch. Mm -hmm. But it's really necessary to have them be perfectly flush so that when you put your hardware on there, it locks properly. It properly right? locks it, right. OK. Well, you make it look really simple. And then all you have to do with, with the balances is nail them into we the old frame. Put a couple frame, nails right? to hold it into the frame. And uh, later on, we put the rest of the trim work around the window. How long does it normally take to do one window from start to, to finish? Uh, with conditions as we had here, where the frames are good, it takes about 45 minutes to re take all the old sashes out, prepare the opening, and put the new sashes in. Terrific. Well, we're looking good. Thanks, Norm. Okay, well. Earlier this week, I had uh, my friend Dick Metcher come out and help me with the lighting design for this old house. Let's take a look. Well, Dick, this will be the kitchen. Boy, it sure is big. It's a good-sized space. Yeah. Let me give you a brief description of what it's going to look good. like. Good, good. The uh, ceilings, of course, will be quite plaster ceilings. Mm-hmm. There'll be a combination of flooring materials. This section that we're standing in right now is all going to be a hardwood floor, these beautiful wide planks of pine, real rich. And then that section behind you is all going to be done in a terracotta tile that comes out of very natural earth tone brown. Then we'll have a whole wall of cabinets all along here and an island unit in the middle here for food preparation. And the sink will be in another cabinet that gets installed here. We're planning right now on putting, uh, making all these cabinets out of wood and possibly the overhead cabinets would have wooden frame doors with glass inserts. Well, the, 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 between the cabinets and the floor, they're very dark and they're going to absorb an awful lot of light. So we've got to be very careful on getting enough general illumination and specific area illumination in the room. Why don't you give me a tour of the sure. kitchen? I'll explain to you how it, how it works. If we were coming in with groceries and so forth and 
We'd probably be entering through this door. This is a little mudroom. There'll be a door with a glass pane here and a second door here, kind of creating an airlock. So we're calling this a little mudroom. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that I'd probably wind up putting a uh, recess fixture in the ceiling here, either recessed or a surface fixture to light up this area. Something okay. very, very unobtrusive. Independent of anything else yep. that goes on. Mm -hmm. All right. When you, when you walk into this space, Dick, over here you've got basically a... A What's this, Bob? What's well, this? I'm sorry, this is a pantry, a uh, food pantry. Okay. Uh, we got to have a light inside of there, and uh, I would suggest a recess light up in the ceiling with maybe an automatic door switch on it, so when we open the door, the light automatically comes on. When we close the door, it automatically shuts the light off. We can just put one of those porcelain sockets in there with a bare bottom. Well, you used to be able to do, Bob, but uh, no longer. They've changed the law, and they require now, inside of a closet, a recessed lighting fixture or a fluorescent fixture. Why is that? Well, in the past, what has happened is sometimes people have left the light burning on in the closet and they've either touched a tissue paper or some kind of paper that's been left on a shelf and it started a fire. So, so the underwriters now method. just say it's for safety purposes, so we've got to put, put a recess fixture or a, or a fluorescent fixture. All right, we'll plan on that. This area here is our home office, or kitchen office space. And of course, it'll have a big window right there. And nothing much goes on here except telephoning and, you know... What's that behind you? Oh, this is, this is just a powder room. Uh, okay. Yeah, half bath. All right, well, I don't think I'd suggest any overhead lighting in here. There's going to be a desk here. I'd just suggest a lamp over there, either a floor or a table lamp sitting there to illuminate this area. I okay. think that's plenty. You don't think we need anything I don't overhead. think you need anything at all. All right. Why don't we talk briefly about the workings of the kitchen, how the, how the activity or the pattern will mm -hmm. take place. We'll have the kitchen sink right here so that you can imagine the dishwasher action and a lot of... So it's, it's a specific area we need specific this light is for. a work area. Right. Okay. And this is the second work area. This is a good size island, about three by six feet. Mm -hmm. And I imagine a lot of, you know, cake preparation, bed, bread making, chopping up stuff and so forth will take place here. And then behind me, I'll have a stove and countertop on either side and the refrigerator right around here. Okay. So generally all the activity of making dinner takes place in this little area here. All right, I think my suggestion would be to use recess lights over the work area here and also over the sink area. We have set two fixtures up in the ceiling here and one over the sink area that would take up to 150 watts. You could put less light in if, light, if you wanted to, but mm -hmm. uh, it, it takes a maximum of 150 watts. Now, would that be enough lighting for all That's this area? That's enough lighting for the sink and this area here, those two specific areas. Oh, just specifically Now for we that. have to talk about underneath the cabinets. Uh -huh. uh, you have a hood over the range here, yes. so that will have a light in it. That'll illuminate that area. Mm -hmm. But you're going to have cabinets here that you're going to have to need lighting under those cabinets. So if you're here working with a cookbook, or preparing some kind of food, the light is in front of you, tucked up underneath the kitchen cabinet, and hidden. Um, so those would be fluorescent strips those also? Would be, well, they could be fluorescent. They could have an incandescent strip, too. There's, a, there's incandescent bulbs that are made that could fit under there. I would probably recommend for a fluorescent just from an energy saving standpoint. Okay. Um, you might want to, if you have cabinets on this side over here, yes. and there'd be cabinet lights under here. Mm -hmm. Now, the only area that we have, and we've covered the specific lighting in the area, but what we need now is some general illumination to see into those cabinets which are above these counters. And what I'd suggest in here is probably a couple of surface mounted uh, fluorescent fixtures that would take four bulbs each and they'd be about two feet wide by four feet long and you'd run them in this direction. One on this side and then you'd come over here and you'd run another one on this side. So you'd be flanking either side of my work island. Right. This would give you, now you've got the option of either having just the two fluorescents on to have general illumination, or you can have uh, just the uh, recess lights d down lighting here and the sink area. All right. So the trick, of course, is in switching them on differently so that you can either just have the fluorescent. Well, on. I think that I probably have a switch on the island just to control these two lights here. And we have a switch over here to control the sink light. The under cabinet lights, you want to be controlled over here. So when you're working in this area, you can turn the lights on and off. On and off, okay. The two lights that you want, or the lights that you want on to be able to switch from two different locations, either coming into the room from this angle or coming into the room from that angle, would be to switch on these two surface fixtures, which give you the general illumination in the room. So we'd have a set of three-way switches, one here and one over here. Yeah. So then you could turn your lights on from either, either side. Well, that, we haven't addressed my, the eating area of the kitchen, which is really a good, good sized space. This is about 12, 20 by 12, I believe. What would you recommend for in here? Well, you know, this is an ideal room to put a piece of track lighting in. We you think could, so? We could take a piece of track lighting and we could put it right up there on the beam that would illuminate this whole area in here. 
Um, I'm sure you're familiar with the track lighting. Here's a piece of track right here. Yes. Now, what I'd uh, suggest doing is uh, instead of having all your lights, I'd suggest using a two-circuit piece of track. A two-circuit piece of a track. A two-circuit piece of track. Is that something new? It's felt relatively new in the market. But rather than having all your lights come on all at once, I'm sure you've had uh, instances where they flip the switch on and all of a sudden you Ten have lights all at once. Ten yeah. lights all at once. And what I'd like to be able to do is to be able to switch that so half the lights could come on or, and half the lights stay off. Or we can have both on and both on dimmers so that we can vary the intensity of the light. So if you want to light the breakfast area with one set of, or the eating area with one set of lights, you could also set another set of lights on something over in that corner mm -hmm. or something on this wall here. Okay, clear. Now this would give you plenty of illumination. Now, where you want to mount that track lighting is you want to mount it up high enough so that when you're in the kitchen area here and you're looking out, that you don't want to see anything protruding below the ceiling bothering your line of sight. How close together should they be put? If you're putting, uh, say, an eight-foot length of this track we lighting. We generally suggest about four lights on an eight-foot eight length. One but every can, two feet. But you can put as many as you want to really on this. It has a capacity to handle probably 10 or 12 fixtures. Super. Let's go take a look at the library. Fine. Dick, when we're finished, this back hall will have a new staircase leading down to a wine cellar down there. But come on through here. I want to show you the room that is uh, going to be our library. It's not, a, it's not a very big room, and let me explain briefly what the plan is. We, on this wall and this wall, we'll have floor-to-ceiling bookshelves, tons of books. And then in this area, more bookshelves, and I envision kind of a desk over here and a couple of easy chairs to read. What do you think about some track lighting in here? Oh, no, Bob, no. Yeah. Uh, track lighting, what that would do is be throw a spot on the books. And you don't want to throw spots on the books. What you want to do is you want to have an even wash ah. on the books. So how do you do that? Well, what I would do is use a recessed wall washer up in the ceiling. Now, a wall washer, what that does, it has a reflector on the back of the fixture, and it reflects the light in an angle towards the wall. Mm -hmm. So what I would do in these three locations you're talking about would be to put a the recessed fixture out approximately two feet out from the ceiling. Now, how far down did you say the bookcase was? Uh, well, they won't reach to the actual ceiling. Come about a foot below. About a foot. And I'd come out about two feet from the bookcases, and I'd come out right at this corner right here, and would just wash the books very nicely down so the wall. So you can read titles Much all the way better down than the track lighting. Let's go talk about our media room. Fine. Now, this is our media room, and it's also the living room. You know, it's the, the main large entertaining space. And shall I give you a brief description? Yes, please, Bob. At, at one end of it over here, when we remove part of this wall, we're going to have entertainment equipment. We'll, ha we'll have a seating arrangement right here to enjoy the entertainment equipment. And at the other end of it, we'll probably have enough room for a separate seating arrangement, maybe a card table with four chairs, something like that. What do you think of the room, though? It has lots of nice period detail. Well, the first thing I noticed when I looked in is a lighting person. I looked up and I saw that there's an old gas fitting that... Uh, has been electrified, and I'm sure they had a chandelier at some point hanging down probably over a table over here. Over a table, I would imagine, yeah. We're not going to do that. No. So we... I don't want to see any lighting in this room. First of all, you don't want to have a chandelier down here because you might hit it on your head coming into the room. And you don't want to use track lighting or something I don't, like that? I don't want to see any of my lights in the room at all. I want the lights all to be built in. I need really two types of lighting in this, in this room. Like you say, it's the, both a media center and a living room. Mm -hmm. You should have both general lighting and specific lighting. Okay. Now, what I would suggest for the general lighting in the room is to use recess lights. And I think looking at the ceiling, that probably uh, six recess lights would be perfect. Uh, I would mount them. I would start here, and I would mount one between the center here and the wall, one in here, one right opposite here. So you'd have two in this area. And down in this part of the room, we would have another one here and another one here, matching in the same line that those are. All lined up all like lined a grid. Up. And then down here, two more. So this would give you a nice general illumination in the whole How room. How would you control those? I would control them. Well, is, is there two entrances there into the room? There will be a back entrance and the, one, the door that we just used. All right. There should be switches at both sides. It would be called a three-way switch. And what we would do is put dimmers in those locations so that you're able to dim the lighting fixtures. You could either have them all dimmed at once, or you could have these two dimmed, these two dimmed, and those two dimmed. So that you could have, you could vary your light levels in the room. Mm -hmm. It's also the kind of the room that will probably have older furniture, antique furniture, maybe table lamps. And well, so forth. those table and floor lamps should complement the, the period of the furniture that you have in the room. Mm -hmm. Let me explain a little bit about the media concept, the entertainment center back here. We will be removing most of this wall. I'm going to leave a section of it about two and a half, three feet over here. 
And behind that, I'll have plenty of storage for stereo equipment, the uh, video recording equipment, the video disc, all these things that are coming out now, as well as storing records and cassettes and so forth. Mm -hmm. But against that far wall behind me, there'll be about a five-foot square screen. And we'll have the projection TV system, which is really a console out here on the floor, projecting the image right onto there. And then when it's not in use, the, the idea is to have a painting that slides over it and hides the screen. Well, that'd be nice. I got just the fixture for you, too. It's called a recess framing projector. It's and what light. this is, it's a light. And what it does, it recesses into the ceiling, and it has like a projector lens that comes out on a 45-degree angle. Now, it has shutters inside there that you can manipulate back and forth so that you can actually frame a painting on the wall here so that no light will spill off the sides. It'll completely frame the painting, whatever size you might have here. Sounds terrific. Sounds oh, expensive. It sounds expensive, but it's why, terrific. Why don't you bring one out next time you come so we can take a look at it? I'd be glad you know, to. One other thing that's been running through my mind has to do with the landscaping. Tom Worth has really gone out of his way to provide us with some really nice designs, and I think it'd be good if we started thinking about lighting it. Well, now's the time to do your outside lighting. Before you've finished your grading and your uh, all your work outside, you want to put all your, your uh, wires in and think about your overall plan at this point. Okay, well, I'll make sure the two of you get together. Thanks a lot, Dick. Okay, Bob. Well, you might think it's premature to be talking about kitchen cabinets since we haven't even plastered the walls yet, but they're custom cabinets. They take a few weeks to get made. With us now is Jack Cronin, our cabinet maker, who's going to help us lay out these cabinets. Hi, Bob. Hi. Let's talk first about this area right in front of me. This is, I've built this wall here to kind of have the disposer, uh, the dishwasher and the sink nestle in here. And what would you suggest we do in, in okay, terms Bob, of the Okay, Bob, we should keep the uh, dishwasher in relation to the to the eating area and the dish storage which is area, which is here, on so. the right-hand side. So you'd want to so locate should, it here. Yes, we should locate the dishwasher on the right-hand side. We should allow three inches for a style. Style? What do you mean yes. a style? The style, Bob, is, is, a, is the same type of wood coming up on the side of your dishwasher, so your dishwasher doesn't have to go tight against the plastic wall. Okay, so you kind of frame it, it in the wood. Mm -hmm. Then we allow you 24 inches, Bob, and you've got... That's a standard size for a dishwasher. Yes, it is. And you've got about 40 inches left over for your sink, Bob. Which means I can get a good size 30-inch sink. Yes, you get a 30-inch sink with a drain board on the right-hand side. It'd be nice to have the drain board, yeah. Over the top of the dishwasher. Okay. That's definite. Let's talk about an island. I threw down this 4 by 8 sheet of plywood earlier because I do want to locate a working island in this area, but I think this Bob, is a little bit too big. obviously too big. Yeah. So tell me, what's, okay. what are some of the considerations in Bob, determining have, the size? First of all, we have, you should allow 48 inches here on, uh, on the front of, your, front of your dishwasher, which would bring us out to about this area. That's so that you can open the door on the dishwasher? Yes, yeah, so your door, when your door is down, you still have room for passageway through there. All right. On this other end, I'm entering the kitchen right through okay. here, and yeah. I probably need a good, what? Well, you have plenty of room here, Bob, so I would say if you have six feet, you'd have plenty That'd of room. That'd be to comfortable? Comfortable. So if we come at six feet, that allows you... Uh, that still gives us a very, very generous that island. That allows us about, a, about a, an 80-inch island, Bob. All right. Four feet seems very wide, though. What, yes, it is. How would you go about determining how much space I can take up in this direction? Okay, we have uh, uh, cabinets on this wall which come out 25 inches, which is a fixed, fixed amount. Standard, yeah. Standard. And then we should come out about 42 inches, Bob, on this side. Is that more or less a minimum? Yes, that would be the standard for the industry. So you can have two people walking through yes. there in between the island and the... Now, to determine the other side, Bob, what do we have over well, that side? Well, yeah, this is, a, this is the eating area of the kitchen. We'll have a, a, probably a round table or a large table here. It's also a different flooring material. This is all terracotta and over here it's all yellow pine. But what, what happens here is that the same people that just walked in are going to want to walk in this direction to get out the back door. So I can't, you know, okay, between a table here and the island here, okay. I got to be careful. We should allow about 36 inches there, Bob. You think that's adequate? Yes, that would be adequate. And if we come over 36 inches, Bob, that gives you a that gives you an island of about 36 by 80. Let me borrow that chalk. I just yep. want to visualize it a little bit better. Oops, I ran over it. Okay, that's still a very good size island. That's a good size island, Bob. Now, are you, uh, are you going to have a, a snack bar on this side, Bob? No, no, no. Since, since we're going to have a table here, I, I don't feel the need for stools and a, and a snack bar there. Okay, that gives us all storage in this bar then, uh, uh, Bob. How would you arrange the storage? Uh, I would say we should try to get two drawers on this side. Now, there was a drawer on this end with a door under it for the uh, silverware for your dining room table. Mm -hmm. And then a drawer on this end with a door under it 
Again, for napkins and this type of thing, two drawers and a drawer and uh, two drawers in the middle for storage. Okay, but they wouldn't go all the way through, no. right? No, on the back side, we'd, we'd have the two drawers that would pull in on this side with your four doors across the bottom, which would give you plenty of storage for your kitchen side. Terrific. So we basically split the island down the yes. middle on the inside. Yes. Let's talk about the back wall. Here are my requirements. I want to have a pantry closet in the corner, refrigerator and a stove along this wall. Okay, Bob, we should, we should center the stove on this, on this island. So if we go into this island here, we'd have the stove centered on this wall, which looks like we have about six feet left over here for plenty of storage for top cabinets and base cabinets. Okay, well, how do you recommend we use up this space? Well, we have all this space here. We could put a bank of drawers in here. We could have two doors and roll out shelves in the bottom. Great. So you don't have to stand in there. Then your top cabinets come over. They step up over your hood. Come over here, and we have a, a top cabinet on this side with a, with a uh, storage unit down below. All right, so they're all kind of... Hangs Ties together, together yes. and closes up over there. Very good. Let's talk a little bit about the style of these cabinets, all right? Okay, Bob, you asked about some raised panel doors. Yes. And uh, this is one we used, uh, we've used before. It's mm -hmm. a solid oak door, natural finish. It's really this beautiful. This here is a, a solid oak door with a, with a stain finish on it. Mm -hmm. uh, and to be just a little different on the style, we have one here that's made out of butternut, a cross section of a door. Butternut wood. Is that a hardwood? or? No, it's a medium saw. Yeah. I like the way this is made with the kind of a scotia there on the corner, which gives it a little bit more of a highlight. Let me tell you what my problem is with all three of these. The natural grain is going to clash in this kitchen with my floor that I mentioned a couple of minutes ago. You know what yellow pine looks like. Yes. It's got strong variations in the grain, and it's going to be a natural finish on it. And I really like the look of it, but I'm realizing that if I try to put any kind of finish like that on top of it, going to really look out of place. Okay, Bob, this would be a chance where we could use a painted surface. Uh, on this, painted wooden cabinet? Yes, we've done quite a lot of them. Uh, this, this, using this style of door, we use a natural birch, which is a very hard surface, to uh, apply our sprayed painted surface to. Why do you want a harder wood to, well, if you're going to spray paint it? Well, just that it will take the uh, denting and abrasion uh, that the, you'll get the, around the kitchen. The birch is a very hard surface, and it gives you a good surface for a paint surface. Mm -hmm. So I'd, I'd probably want to think about an off-white or something like that. Yes, We're going to have to make a decision on that pretty soon. But yeah. I think that's the way I might, I'm going to want to go. Okay. Let's talk a minute about overhead okay, doors. You, you had also talked about uh, possibly glass doors. I yes. brought a sample of a leaded glass door with, the, with an antique glass in it. My first reaction is that it's kind of Tudor English country home kind of thing. Uh, yes, I think so. And yeah. here I am in a 120-year-old uh, American house, and I... I want something a little bit uh, less contrived, if, if you can think of what I mean. Okay, like maybe Bob. plain glass. Can okay. you do plain glass yes, in the door? Yes, uh, we could use a safety glass, plain glass in here. The only thing we'd have to do is, is a little difference in the painted surface inside. That's the way we're going to want to go. Jack, I'm going to want to visit your shop in the next couple of weeks and take Fine. a look at these cabinets being built. Love to have you out Thanks there, Thanks for Bob. being with us. We're running out of time. Join us next week when we'll get on a plane and go to the island of Nantucket. <laughs> Local broadcast of the Victory Garden is brought to you by Frank's Nursery and Crafts, where beautiful things begin. Over 60,000 contributors have worked with us to keep quality programs on Channel 56 during the last 12 months. If you're one of them, thank you. There are just a couple of days left in this fiscal year, and with a little more help from you, we can raise the last $55,000 to meet our goal. Please join us in the partnership that keeps Channel 56 on the air. The Unpledge Period, an idea we thought you'd like. Mail your check today to Channel 56, Box 56, Detroit, 48202. The Nightly Business Report returns to its 7 p.m. time slot Monday, July 2nd. In the meantime, get all the latest business news weeknights at 11, repeated weekday mornings at 8.30. That's the Nightly Business Report here on WTVS Detroit, where we're working for you. This old house is made possible by a grant from Owens Corning Fiberglass Corporation, manufacturers of residential building products.
Hi, I'm Bob Vila. Welcome to this old house. I guess it looks kind of like a nuclear blast zone around here. We've had to dig a, a whole new trench to put in a new gas pipe. The old gas pipe was no good. But believe it or not, right on top of this mound of rubble and dirt, which will be leveled off, we're going to be installing our hot tub and outdoor deck area. Earlier this summer, we went out to Nantucket Island with Jock Gifford, our designer, and we took a look at a project that he did about a year ago. Let's look in. This spot is absolutely magnificent, Jock. Tell me something now. The original house stopped where, and where did you start the addition? Yeah, right, right. Well, this is the, the addition all on this side, what you see, Bob. It's uh, two, basically two guest rooms on the second floor. Mm -hmm. uh, where the land cuts away here, we've got a, a nice basement health facility, which is really <laughs> what we're doing down here. Yeah. But first, let me show you the, the location, the deck. This is the main living level deck. And uh, it's like being it's, on shipboard. Yeah. What it's, material did you use for the, for the deck floor here? This is all vertical grain fur on the deck, and we have some two by redwood on the, on the benches. Yeah, two by eights. How does this dock hold up right next to the ocean? Wonderfully. Does very well. We put a little preservative on it. 30, 40 year life, no problem? No problem. But Bob, listen, we're here to see this basement, so let's uh, we'll lead the way. Okay. We'll uh, come back in here through the little breakfast room and into the, into the new addition and uh, down the stairs. Oh, it's neat. Yeah. Okay, so this is where the addition began, right. and we've got all contemporary detailing here. What kind of wood is this? That's cypress, Bob. Unfinished. I really like the way it's been applied. All flush, even the baseboard is flush with the siding and then mitered on the corner. And then you've carried it all the way down here. Right. Terrific. All right, Bob, you're going to love this room. Yeah. This is nice. Yeah. First thing to notice is the floor. This is the... The same wood that we used outside on the deck, uh, only it's been obviously sanded it's and finished. The, the same straight green fur. It really gives it a gymnasium feeling, though. Right. Well, that's exactly what we were trying to do. The owner here is a dancer, modern dance, ballet, that kind of exercise. Mm, okay, light yeah, exercise. So we have the, uh, the floor-to-ceiling mirrors and the ballet bar. Very authentic, yeah. yeah. Is that how high it normally would be? Yeah. Looks yeah, kind of absolutely. difficult. Absolutely. Tell me one thing. Isn't it awfully expensive to uh, mirror a whole wall, floor-to-ceiling? Well, it's more expensive than, you know, the traditional finishes, sure. Password. It's probably about five dollars a square foot in five or six a square uh, foot, yeah. But the effect, it doubles the uh, the size of the room. Yeah, no, it's it's magnificent. It really and the light that it uh, bounces off around the room. And then she, she's got an extra cycle here. What yeah. else is now, going Bob, on? Now, Bob, after space? you've after the, you've been dancing greenhouse. for a while. How about a hot tub, Bob? Not bad. In a greenhouse. This is uh this I is love fantastic. It. This is about a six foot diameter tub. That's a big one, isn't it? Yeah, it is a big one. It's about four feet deep, all made out of wood. What kind of wood? This is redwood. Now, does this come already assembled like this, one big tub, or do you have to put it all together? Oh, this, yeah, this comes as a, absolutely as a kit. You can buy these kits. They come in different sizes. They come with different options. This installation has, comes with a, a filter, a pump, a heater, and a whirlpool unit. Mm -hmm. And I notice we've, we've come up about two and a half feet higher than the... Uh, and the other floor is. What's the construction detail? Is this sitting on the ground down there, or a bed of sand? Or yeah, what? no, we've got. A, it's sitting on a big concrete slab, uh -huh. but only under the only under the tub. Around that is just gravel and 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 rocks. So anytime you're splashing out, it goes right through the deck, mm -hmm. and water will run right down. So if you're, yeah. you're splashing in the tub or watering the plants, uh, it. It's not a problem at all. What about maintenance, though? Is, does it get to be a lot of work when you have a hot tub like this? Is, is it the same as having a swimming pool? It is. It is, in fact, a small swimming pool, yes. It, you have to maintain the pH with, with chlorine, and you have to clean the filters regularly. Okay. okay. But it still is awfully nice to have, especially yeah. after you've been working at it at the ballet. It sure. Turn it on. Yeah, this is... Uh... Oh, that's neat. Yeah. Isn't that wonderful? Doesn't it make you want to get right in? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> The okay. temperature is probably about 95 or 100 degrees. What's okay. this thing over here in the corner? Oh, this is a this is an early hot tub, Bob. Just it's just an antique with a little little place down here where they used to, I guess, put uh, put some hot coals to warm the water up. Neat. Now, Bob, after you've had your hot tub, you might want to have a drink. So we can we can accommodate you. We have a an ice maker, a refrigerator, a sink. We What's have a, in here? A, closet that yeah. just holds the stereo system and obviously some towels. Okay, now, Jock, I've done my exercises. I've soaked in the hot tub. I've gotten a glass of orange juice. What about if I want to take a shower and stuff? Well, let's 
I'm glad you asked. That's, that's, that's what we've got over here, hidden away. We have a, a real bathroom. Mm, this is very nice. Okay, so there's a toilet in that enclosure in there. Right. And this is that man-made marble material right. with the recessed sink all one piece. Yeah, and then you've got a shower well. stall right here. Well, it's not just any kind of a shower stall, Bob. This is a, uh, this is a regular shower stall, only we've added a steam head here so that you can have a steam bath. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and we've kept some eucalyptus leaves here to give the, that scent that, that makes it smell so wonderful. Terrific. But it's so that, can also, be, that can also be used as a regular shower, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the controls are over here. Yeah. Now over here, we have the, that other kind of heat, a sauna. That very hot, very dry heat. Terrific. No exercise room should be with that one. What they have all over Finland, right? Right, exactly. Mm -hmm. Now this looks like it's quite a production because this is all redwood boards and so forth. This must have taken a good deal of effort to build Well, this comes here. as a kit. The, uh, just like the hot tub, there are a lot of kits available for, for these, uh, these sauna baths. And uh, they come in many different sizes, many different shapes. They're com the walls come completely built. So you just, it's a prefab panels practice. Absolutely. It's a very simple erection process. This is a pretty large one. This is about five feet by... Eight? Eight feet, something mm -hmm. like that, yeah. And the, the, the source of the heat is what? This is a, an electrical one. It, uh, the electric unit heats up rocks. They get very hot. Yeah. These kind of they look like lava, kind of. Yeah. And so the rocks get hot, and they provide you with a nice dry heat. That's right. You might want to scent those rocks from time to time with a little uh, oh, again, eucalyptus, eucalyptus again. Yeah. Makes it smell so wonderful. It's a nice touch. But, uh, well, if you buy this as a kit, heater and all, what are you paying for it? Any idea? It's probably about the same as a hot tub, which would be between $2,100, $2,500, something like that. Over $2,000. Over $2,000. Nice thing to have. You know, I'm curious okay. to take a, a look at the outside of that greenhouse. And, of course, there's lots to still comment on here. This ceramic tile floor you put in here is really nice. They're about, what, 12-inch squares? Absolutely, yeah. Can we go outside now? Sure, sure. Okay. Let's... What, what's starting to hit home is that you must have had have had half the population of the whole area working on this place because it's so there's so many details and the, the cypress and the floor and everything else it's really beautiful well it does it takes a lot of trades it's a, it isn't expensive to have everything to have everything but of course anybody out there can just have one portion of it that's right let's go outside it really looks very unobtrusive but my first question is how much of this is custom work and how much of it can be obtained in a kit well it's a good question the Triangular windows in the roof really are, are custom. The, those are made to measure sizes. But the bottom half, the casement windows, uh, uh, which are aluminum clad, and the aluminum pieces in between, really come as part of a, a kit, mm -hmm. Bob, that you, you, uh, you basically give the company the, the outside dimensions, and they supply it. You give it. them the order. Now, what, what about the roof? Well, that, that's, uh, that's an insulating plastic. It's sort not of, glass. No, it isn't. It's two layers of plastic that are structurally separated. And it's, uh, it's working very well. It's a great... And uh, the whole thing is battened and, and riveted down, kind of. Right. Well, listen, somebody said something about a cool drink a little while ago. I'd like to take him up on it. Okay. How about a hot tub as well? <laughs> I'm really glad we took that trip out there, because we got some very interesting ideas, and some of them will be shown right here at this old house. In the last couple of days, we've had our facade sandblasted. Let's talk with Norm Abram about what, uh, what he's discovered here. Hi, Norm. Hi, Bob. What do you think of the job? It looks real good. We have a few minor repairs to do to clapboards like this, but otherwise mm -hmm. it's in real good condition. Yeah, some of them are not in very good shape. Now, we found out, though, after it was sandblasted, that there's been some changes made here, and that is shown by these clapboards, which are a different color, these being cedar, and these, the original pine, they go all the way around this door opening, and that led us to believe that at some time there was an enclosure over this front entry, maybe a, a small roof area and a wooden porch that came out and I suspect that these big granite steps were out maybe about six feet. That's interesting. That's an interesting bit of archaeology. And what so they, you what, imagine it rotted away and they just tore it down. They decided to tear it down rather than replace it. And then they moved these steps back towards the house. But they did a pretty lousy job installing them. Uh, as you can see, they held them, they put them right up against this wood. They let them have a space here and in some cases they filled it with mortar like this mm -hmm. but that still lets all the water run down inside well you should never place masonry right up against wood like that. that's right and as you can see there you know they're loose they're real loose huh? and this top step pitches out this way 
and this bottom step is going in like this, so water is going to sit in there, and in the wintertime, that's going to turn into ice and be kind of a hat. What do you propose we do about it? Well, we've got a backhoe coming in in another day or so to fill our trenches in. Yeah. So I think we should, with his aid, remove these steps, dig down a new uh, base and put some good gravel in there, remove all this old rotten wood, and set these steps up as close to the... Uh, to the masonry the, foundation. The ...foundation as possible and uh, then do a proper trim detail around here so that the water cannot get behind it. That seems like a good solution, and we'll get to save our granite. Yes, what right. else have you discovered? Well, over on the other side, on this side, we found a situation where we have a rotten window sill. Ah, that's bad news. Well, not really. I think we can save it. We could see what happened here is about 20 years ago, they put aluminum storm windows on this house mm -hmm. and they have little weep holes in the bottom which are, which allow the water that comes in through the screen to run out and what evidently happened is those weep holes got filled Clogged up. filled up with paint or dirt and the water sat in here and now it's eventually rotted its way so that it's about two inches almost deep all the way through the sill astonishing so could now, you patch that up with some sort of putty yeah we could use some kind of a filler in here even like an automotive filler mm -hmm. but it's constantly going to be a maintenance problem mm -hmm. and we happen to have a sill just like this that I saved. We just happen to have a sill just that's, like this? That's, that's right. right. This one right here which was from the window around the corner. Well, we now so this is original that's from right. one of the windows that we're turning into a French door that's over right. here. And that's about 12 inches wide and 3 inches thick. That's super. That really points to the lesson that you never throw anything out when you're renovating an old house. That's right. Even when you're done, things like this should always be saved. That's right. Well, no. how are you going to get the old one out of there? Well, the first thing that I'll have to do is make a couple cuts through this sill. Okay. While you're doing that, let's take a look at a little tour that took place here about a week ago with Dick Metcher, our lighting consultant, and Tom Worth, our landscape architect, who was taking his final tour of the grounds planning outdoor lighting. Dick, probably one of the best ways we can talk about the landscape and the lighting and how we can coordinate the two is to start with a plan. Fine, Tom. So I thought what I'd do is to walk you quickly through the, the design, which... Uh, is developed, I think, quite nicely here on the site. We would uh, we moved the driveway over here to this part of the site where a visitor would drive in and park right here. We're standing here, by the way, right now. Uh, you get out of your car and walk up these series of steps, this path, to a gazebo or a kind of garden pavilion right here, okay? Uh, and then across this level terrace, there'd be a perennial garden on each side. Uh, you turn the corner and go up this flight of steps, four feet, to the front door. Now. Let's go to the back side of the house and see what we do over there. Now, this is the prime outdoor living area, which has been developed kind of nicely with a series of, of decks and a trellis on this side mm -hmm. and a series of little garden areas, almost like with wood pads that kind of go through them. And then this is a deck around a hot tub or a spa on this side of the workshop, which we've re it's the old garage that we've moved over to here. So this is a very sort of tricky area that we, we should discuss. And then this is a gravel kind of service area that walks sort of walks out in this direction to uh, another deck here for the tenant and then up this flight of steps to the street. Now, if we took that same plan and went in the reverse direction, this is a night scheme here. Now, what I've attempted to show here is basically a concept drawing of how the lighting would work. Now, if we came down these steps, I think we, we definitely need some kind of lighting there. This big, beautiful tree here and the stone wall that runs around it, so I'd like to do something to to get that area mm -hmm. illuminated so you have a clear shot to the doorway here to the tenant's house and to the uh, owner's uh, back door right here. And then here's this tricky area that I think we really have to discuss up there, but we should do something under the trellis, uh, something against the wall, something against the, the workshop area and the planning in this area, and maybe something back here against the spa. Now going to the front yard, we have to do something here on to uh, illuminate the front door, and again, steps, to the, something at the gazebo, more steps, and down to the front uh, entry area. Now, this is really an abstract plan, Dick. I think we ought to definitely go and walk the site right now and see how we can make it work. Fine, Tom. Sounds like an exciting plan. I'm glad that you're doing uh, some of the thinking out the lighting now because so many people wait until the landscaping is all in and then they decide to do a lighting plan. Well, I think it's really good to integrate the two, and I think if we can work together on that, it's really to the benefit of, uh, of everybody. Good. This is a very busy thoroughfare, as you can see. We're going to put fencing up here, but I'd like to make this entry very, very prominent and, uh, and definite. How are we going to handle that? Well, I think you need a, a post light right here. 
Mm -hmm. uh, the post light would do two things. Uh, number one, it would welcome the people to the house, and also the light would be up high enough so it would throw a light into the parking lot area here so people would know where to park and could see the whole area. Mm -hmm. Good. Maybe we can work that in with a fence or at least with the same kind of, of wood and the... Uh, you could put the number on the so post. Forth. That would be nice, right. yes. Now, as someone pulls in here and parks, they would first uh, they would want to know where to go. So I think we, uh, we want to take them up these steps, which I've sort of roughed out uh, with limestone here the way up. This would be a set of steps. Now, how would, we, uh, how would you suggest we light these? Well, Tom, this is a safety area. We've got to get light on the steps so that someone doesn't get hurt. Now, what I'd like to do is use, here we have a, a mushroom right light, we call it. And it has a solid top so that you don't get any glare of the light in your eyes, mm -hmm. but yet the light will shine out to the sides and illuminate the steps and also illuminate any landscaping that you have in the area. I like that. It's, it's relatively inconspicuous, and yet it gives us how Very many watts would there be in that, uh, in oh, that picture? It'll take up to a 75-watt bulb, but we probably would use only 60 mm -hmm. watts. That'd be very nice. Now, what I've done is curved this path. I've changed the design here since I'd like it to kind of come up along side of this dogwood that we've exposed. Uh, would we use some more of those fixtures? How many do you think we should use Oh, I think here? that we probably should use one more about here, Tom. That's enough, That'd I think, great. and that would delineate okay. the path. Okay, then we have another little series of steps coming up right here. Mm -hmm. And then this is where the gazebo would be, Dick, right here. As a matter of fact, the view that we would have from this position is up in this direction. You can see the, the, uh, the workshop back here in the house. And in fact, I've made a little elevation I'd like to show you Okay. right here. Um, shows the house and the uh, workshop, we're going to put a Palladian window in here with an arch top, and we're going to put a trellis across the back side of this with a screen fence in here to give a little privacy to this garden area, and then a, a privacy screen fence on this side to, to screen the, the view to the spa, or this, the, uh, the hot tub in this area. Now, um, we are actually standing right here in the place that the gazebo would be built, which is this structure over here. Now, it's about eight foot square. It's a really, it's a little garden pavilion. Uh, with some lattice work and a roof, and it's, it's, a, it's a place to really enjoy the out of doors and to actually pass through. Now, um, I would like this to be a very subtle kind of, yes. have a nice subtle effect. What would you suggest? You need some this? real subtle lighting and no direct lighting. And what I would suggest doing is, a, is taking and putting a balance of lighting around the soffit. Now, I have a lighting fixture here, which is relatively brand new to the market, and this can be run all the way around all four sides of the uh, gazebo and we could have it just so it's barely washing the light inside. It probably gives about the equivalent of, say, about a 100-watt light bulb. It's just oh, very, 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 very soft nice. light. And it's a very a sparkly kind of uh, Well, it's a brand-new product mm -hmm. on the market, and the lamp will last for over 50 years, and its wattage, its, its energy consumption uh, is only, uh, cost you 62 cents a foot a year to operate if you operate it continuously mm -hmm. all day mm -hmm. long. So I guess if we if we had we see we have about 30 feet of this if we put it all the way around the inside would that cost a year? Well, about, it'll cost uh, you about 18 dollars a year. Hmm, not bad, but uh, that's a lot of light bulbs. Well, <laughs> won't okay. burn much wattage. <laughs> it's, I think the effect would be wonderful. Let's uh, take the path through the. We're going to have a perennial garden right here on each side of the path, mm -hmm. leading to the front door, and you can see you can sit in the gazebo and view out in this direction. Now, when you get to this point, you make the turn and climb up the steps to the front door. Now. Uh, we're going up here about four feet or so, Dick, and I'm going to build the steps out of redwood, uh, somewhat to match the granite steps that are up front. And what I'd like to do is to, is to just give the... Don't you think we should do something to light well, these? Well, I really don't want to see any lighting fixture here, but we have to light these steps, especially down at the bottom area, mm -hmm. because the lights from the front door just will not illuminate down here. So I'd like to use what we call an aisle light. It's a light that you sometimes see in the movie theaters, uh, lighting the uh, aisleway, and yeah. all this does is it just recesses into the wall, and all you see is just this faceplate on the front. And these louvers and, cast, and the, louvers the, light cast down. the light uh -huh. down. And I think all you'd need would just be one on these bottom steps, because there'd be mm -hmm. enough light to wash it across. Good. Well, I, I'll have to incorporate that into the design, and uh, I, I hope I'll be able to. But uh, we, we definitely should do something here to light these steps. Let's climb up to the front door here and uh, talk about this a second. Uh, there's this is a beautiful. Uh, doorway here, as you can see, we've got to reset these granite steps. But what can we do to, 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 you know, to make this an appropriate kind of entry place in terms of lighting? You can see this is just terrible. What's here now? Well, first of all, the fixture is too close here. You've got to take the fixture and you've got to mount it out to the side. And I would suggest one on either side, and a fixture keeping with the period of the house. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it needs to be a fixture that's vertical in nature because the doorway and everything else has vertical lines to it. And I would like to sort of tie the fixtures on the front door in with what we're using for a post light down there. That'd be there. very nice. So when you pull in, you'll see a glimpse of the, right, so uh, the doorway. So we can sort of tie the lighting all together.
Okay, well, we have lots more to talk about in the backyard, Dick. Let's walk around there and take a look. Fine, Tom. Dick, I'm delighted that you're not uh, recommending any of those uh, awful spotlights that usually shine down from the eaves into your eyes. Well, Tom, those basically are security lighting fixtures that we use. But if you do a proper job on your landscape lighting, you don't need those fixtures to do That's your great. proper well, landscape I'm happy lighting. we're not going to have right. to use them. Now, here we have this little uh, sort of wood deck outside of the tenant's uh, door, which is elevated right here. We'll have a platform with some steps and this 14 by 16 foot wood deck. What do you... Uh, how should we handle this? I just use a wall bracket by the side of the door that would illuminate the deck and the step area. Good. That's plenty Good. of lighting. That's great. Okay. Now, how do we get here? We're coming down these steps from the, uh, from the street up here. Why don't we walk up and, and see what it is that we're going to have to do to handle these. Now, we're building a series of steps that will come down from the sidewalk and lead to a platform just about where you're standing, in fact. All right. And uh, right here, then, we will sort of turn the corner and come back down right here. So we really have two flights of stairs to illuminate. Well, I think all we need is, uh, again, a mushroom light that we used out front. This would be a low-level light to light the step area for safety reasons. And I would use it over here, be, and rather on this side, because this is a drop-off down here, and this is the more dangerous area. But again, there'd be no glare shining in your eyes, and the light would be shining out to the sides, illuminating the That'd steps. That'd be great. So we'd have another one here, uh, would you say? Oh, I don't think so. I think that's probably enough light probably to enough light this, this whole area. area. Okay. Now, as you know, here we have this uh, recessed sort of gravel area, and there'll be a stone wall that comes around this nice, smooth sort of curve in this direction. Now, what I'm wondering is, uh, how we can get a nice, soft, ambient light in this area, just this, a glow, sort of. Well, Tom, you could use the same mushroom light if you want to down here and carry the same theme along. Across the top of the wall, let's say. Right, so. that's one way of doing mm -hmm. it, but you still see the lighting you fixture. What, yeah. what I would like to do is have you see the plantings here and not lighting fixtures. And my recommendation on something like this would be to, say, put a uh, conduit up the side of this tree, probably on this side, you wouldn't totally. see. Hide and then bed. put okay. some floodlights up in the tree in like a cone light that sort of hides the, the bulb and shine it down on the plantings. So you wouldn't area. see the glare, let's say, from the house or from the street. When you looked out from glow. the house or from the street, you'd see the Gee, plantings that'd be great. and not the lighting. That'd be pictures. wonderful. I hope we can do that. Now, uh, we have an awful lot to talk about in this little area behind the house. Let's run over there a second. Okay. Dick, there's a, a gate that walks right into uh, this little redwood deck space right here. Okay, Tom. Sitting space, which will have a trellis connecting across with a a screen, six foot high screen fence that comes across like this, a very private little sitting area. And over here we'll have two little planting areas with wood sort of bridges across, if you will. This will be one with a beautiful tree sitting right in here that you'll look out of the window at. Maybe some herbs in this little garden right over there. Then a six foot wide wood path that comes from the, this 12 foot wide window looking out in this direction. And a perennial garden right here. There'll be a hedge across the back, you know, against which these uh, perennials will be contrasted. And then there'll be another deck area. Pardon this pile of sand here right now. Another deck area right in here uh, for sitting. And then here's where the hot tub will be, right here in this corner. And again, a six foot high screen fence around the back. Now that's quite a challenge. How are we going to light that? Well, Tom, you have a lot of different areas here to light. And again, I do not want to see any of the lighting fixtures. You want to see the objects and not the lighting fixtures themselves. And starting with the back here, I think one of the things I'd do is maybe put a can light, cylinder light, uh, and mounted on the fence area here, shining down. What this does is two things. No light shines into your eyes, and also from looking out from the house, it gives you great depth reception. You really look at the back of the property it's line. It's almost like a background, it. in a way. So yeah. I put maybe, oh, two or three of these lights along the back here. One here, one here, and maybe one more well, up here. We have three fence sections, so I think so three might three be very be nice. So. perfect. Now, how about the hot tub itself? Can we do anything with that? Well, the hot tub, I think, I would like to see it lit from below where you put a light in the bottom of the hot tub and the light just oh, sort of nice. filters up through and the water on top will just glow. That would be wonderful. Now coming over here, flowers, they're awfully hard to light individually. Can we get, uh, can we get a nice effect here somehow? Well, again, most people would take and put floodlights on the house and floodlight the area. And again, it creates glare and it just is a poor lighting job. What I'd like to see do here is be to take a lighting fixture like this particular fixture, which is a floodlight, but we take it and we mount it on the underside of that overhang, the light mm. is shielded from your eyes here, and we bounce the light off the wall mm. down onto in the light. In indirect lighting, so that no light's mm -hmm. in your eyes, but your eye eyes, again, go towards the It'd flowers. Be very nice, particularly nice at night looking out from inside. And wonderful. I think I would probably put one here, 
and one over here on the other side. It sort of offset mm -hmm. this doorway here. Mm -hmm. That would give a nice feeling to this whole area at nighttime, just with those lights on themselves. Yes, and if you're sitting out here, there'd be no glare in your eyes. Mm -hmm. Now, over here, we have uh, this, this uh, gorgeous specimen tree that I'm telling you about. Wait till you see when we plant it. Uh, how can we really use that to advantage here in the lighting scheme? Well, here we have a well light, and this is what I'd like to, to use here. This is a light that would be completely sunk into the ground. The only thing that would be resting atop of the ground would just be this grill here. It's a completely waterproof fixture that can, it can be immersed in water, and the light will come directly up, filtering through the tree. So as mm -hmm. you're sitting in the house or sitting out here, you'll have no direct light in your eyes. So from any nice. area you look at it, be no glare in your eyes mm -hmm. at all. Well, that's great, Dick. Uh, well, tell me, when can we turn on the juice? Well, Tom, we have to... We have to dig a few trenches yeah. first. We'll dig the trenches, lay our wires, put all the fixtures in that we have to right now, and then we'll come back at a later time and see you landscaping all Well, good. We look done. forward to seeing you soon, then. Okay, Thanks fine for coming. Time. Okay. Ah, there we go, Bob. Yeah, it would not have that. made any sense to try to fill this up, I don't think. No. Let's and after all, it's only taken about 15 or 20 minutes for you right. to get this thing out. That's right. Let's try this other sill that we saved. It should fit perfect because all these windows were probably made at the same place by the same person using the same slide uh, tape measure. We just beautiful. It fits beautiful. How now, are you going to fasten it now, though? Okay, all I'm going to do is take some finished nails and toenail them into this side jam from the top of the sill, like that. That's all that has That's to be done. That's all that has to be done. Terrific. Okay, well, let's get it in place. We're running out of time for today. Won't you join us again next week when we'll be showing you how to install a Whirlpool tub. We'll be talking about installing a steel door with Norm's help. And we'll also be taking a little tour of a home improvement center not far from here. Till then, I'm Bob Vila for This Old House. This Old House is made possible by a grant from Owens Corning Fiberglass Corporation, manufacturers of residential building products. Attention gardeners, you have very little space. Well, learn how to grow more in less space with less work anywhere. In the country or the city, in backyards, on patios, on rooftops and in window boxes. Watch Square Foot Gardening Saturday afternoons at 1 o'clock. Repeated Wednesdays at noon here on WTVS. Sunday on public TV. They may look alike, but zebra stripes are as individual as fingerprints. How do these stripes help them survive a deadly gauntlet of lions and other predators? Find out on Living Wild Sunday. Then on Masterpiece Theater, a battle-scarred soldier fights for recovery and begins life anew as a gifted teacher in a private boys' school. To serve them all my days, right after Living Wild Sunday. Monday, Public TV visits Quitman, Mississippi, where for the first time, black citizens were poised to take over the powerful Board of Supervisors. Power and Prejudice in America, Monday. Then it's Thomas Mann's story of a dynasty that spanned four generations. Sir John Gielgud hosts Budenbrooks, right after Power and Prejudice in America, Monday. Tuesday on Nova, it's the true story of handicapped patients who rebelled against their keepers. Captives of Care on Nova, Tuesday. Then on American Playhouse. They can't do this to me. Oppenheimer fights to regain his security clearance. If he accepts this without protest, it's tantamount to a confession of guilt. The conclusion of Oppenheimer, right after Nova, Tuesday. During June, look for special programs on employment issues here on Channel 56, WTVS Detroit. We're working for you.
Local broadcast of Sneak Previews is brought to you by Crowley's with 10 locations throughout the metropolitan area.